Social media can act as a window for your products and services. Social media marketing can have a great impact on growing your brand. Hi guys, welcome to this complete social media marketing tutorial by Simply Learn. In this video, we'll be covering some of the most important topics related to social media marketing. Now let's have a look at them. Our instructor Rob will take you through how you can start with social media marketing, Facebook advertising, some of the tips and strategies that you can employ, how to rank YouTube videos, how to increase YouTube subscribers, how to increase Twitter followers, how to increase Instagram followers, and some popular social media marketing tools that you can use. Imagine it's the year 2004. This is Phil. Phil's looking to release a book and set up a blog. He's sure that it'd be successful, but he's only worried about one thing. He doesn't know how to ensure that his book reaches the right target audience who could enjoy his book. During that period of time, however, there were only a few forms of advertisement available, like print ads, billboards, radio, direct mail, direct sales, and the television. All of these options were pretty expensive. Their effectiveness couldn't be accurately determined, and they didn't let him advertise his content to the appropriate audience. Phil's book would never find the audience it deserved. Now, let's have a look at the same scenario in the present day. Alongside traditional forms of advertising, Phil would have access to digital marketing, a form of marketing that's a lot more lucrative, inexpensive, and configurable. Marketing that would enable marketers to advertise their audience digitally using channels like search engines, websites, social media platforms, emails, etc. Among these types, social media marketing caught Phil's eye. Social media marketing would give Phil the opportunity to take advantage of social media platforms to advertise his content to a highly targeted audience. It would help more people learn about his book increase the interaction with his audience. It's relatively inexpensive, unless he goes into advertising, and will help him get marketplace insights that might help in understanding his audience preferences better. Phil started by taking up a certification to learn about social media marketing. Since he was already familiar with the concept of social media marketing, his next step was to learn about the different types of content he could post on social media. Some of the most common forms of content that Phil could post would be images, text posts, polls, and videos. But over time, Phil began to notice that not a lot of people were being exposed to his content. Phil needed to advertise his content. For that, he would need to use the advertising options provided by the social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Most advertising platforms offer users with a number of different options like image ads, these ads involve the use of single or multiple images that are attractive and have the optimal amount of text. They also have a call to action that encourages user interaction. Phil could use images from his book, advertise websites that sell his book, and more. Then there are text and post ads. These ads could advertise posts or excerpts from Phil's blog or his book, further garnering interest from an interesting audience. He could also use video ads. Phil could use video ads that feature favorable reviews and customer testimonials to advertise his books. Phil could also use lead ads, through which he could collect information from users who are interested in a weekly newsletter or regular updates from his blog. But that wasn't the only thing Phil could do with social media platforms. He could create a brand for himself and drive audience interest to it. Engage with them, create an identity, engage with content, finding content that works for him. Social media platforms also allowed him the opportunity to target audiences based on demographics like their age, location, gender, and much more. And in time, Phil began to see an increase in the number of viewers coming to his social media page and by extension, his blog. He also saw an increase in the number of people who bought his book, greatly increasing his audience. Here are some things he learned. One, to set goals that were quantitative, smart, and follow a constant deadline. Two, to understand his audience by engaging and connecting with them. Three, to set up a social media calendar to plan competitions, polls, surveys, videos, and more. Four, using tools like BuzzSumo, IFTTT, Buffer, and more for lead generation, creating email lists, setting buyer personas, and more. Five, to perform visual storytelling with the help of images and videos. But how did Phil get so good at social media marketing? Phil had taken up Simply Learn's digital marketing course. It was thanks to this course that Phil had the skills and training to get good at social media marketing. And now, you can too. 
by clicking on the top right corner. And with that, we've given you an introduction to all the major concepts of social media marketing. The world we live in now, it's a highly digital place, but that wasn't always the case until a few years ago. So if we rewind, letting people know about your products was a little harder then. So even if you go back, say, five or ten years, promoting your products wasn't as easy as it is today. I mean, people had to resort to, you know, good old-fashioned newspapers, putting in an ad, or those big, thick books called the yellow pages that usually sat in your closet and wait a ton. I mean, those were the ways to get your product and message out there. A lot of advertising in those yellow pages. Then you have billboards, you know, driving down the highway. You see that billboard on the side of the road. You wonder who are those people that are actually advertising this stuff? Of course, you have television that's been around for decades. A good source of advertising, but costly. And then fax, fax ads, uncommonly known way to advertise. By the way, who has faxes now? But people did advertise via fax just a, a few decades ago. So th these were all the ways in which people had to get their product and service out there. It seems like so archaic looking at it now, but back then that was legitimate. That was the way to do it. And then one thing made our lives a lot easier. So if you're a marketer, you're thinking to yourself, man, I'm glad I'm a marketer in today's day and age because it's social media marketing. Social media marketing has made everyone's lives better from the company that's selling the product or service to the marketer promoting the product and service to the end user who wants to see that product or service and engage with that product or service. So social media is a good source of getting your product and service out there and it just makes everybody's lives a heck of a lot easier. So we're gonna answer that million dollar question. And what's that million dollar question? It's how can you rise above the rest? And so today's session is gonna be how to start with social media marketing. So you can rise above the rest, leveraging this great platform that we all take advantage of today. So let's start by asking the question, what is social media marketing? Social media marketing involves increasing website traffic, it centers around engagement. It offers you the ability to increase your brand awareness and it has other marketing goals. You know, so you can create various forms of content for different social media platforms. So that's really in a nutshell what social media marketing is. So again, if we want to increase our traffic or we want to increase our engagement like likes or comments, then look no further than social media marketing. If we want to engage with our users, our customers, our potential and prospective customers, we can really put a personalized experience in place using social media marketing. If we want to create different forms of content like videos and blogs and infographics and other types of graphics with the potential to actually go viral. And what we mean by viral is spreading like wildfire, one user sending it to another as rapidly as can be. And before you know it, you get you know millions of views and millions of likes. I mean, that's the power of social media marketing. So why do we want to do social media marketing? And I think we just answered some of those questions, but let's dig a little bit deeper. We mentioned in our definition of social media marketing that we have the opportunity to really build our brand awareness. And that is no more truthful than with social media marketing. More so than any other digital marketing channel, social media marketing allows us to really put our brand in a good light in a good position in front of the right eyeballs. So it allows us to really improve our brand by pushing out the appropriate content in front of the appropriate people. Social media is a great channel for that. We can look to conversion rates. So if we are pushing a product and service in front of the right eyeballs and we are building up a funnel of prospective customers who then turn into customers, who then turn into loyal customers, who then turn into lifetime customers. We can see at every step in the process that our conversion rates may increase. We can certainly leverage social media marketing for SEO, for search engine rankings. It's about off-page SEO, it's about posting content on social media platforms to build up some link juice. Okay, so there is some inherent benefits to working SEO and social media side by side. It's cost effective. Well, if you're posting content on Twitter or Facebook, 
It doesn't cost you anything. It just takes a little bit of time and creativity. Now, if you want to go ahead and do some advertising on these platforms, yes, it's gonna cost you, but you'd be surprised. It's not gonna be as costly as say, other search platforms like say Google or Bing, where you're actually paying for keywords and paying per click for those keywords. So social media marketing can be very cost effective and then increase top funnel traffic. So it goes all the way back to brand experience and brand awareness. If you're putting yourself in position to get seen by your target audience, okay, your target audience goes from seeing your brand for the first time to getting to know your brand a little bit more, to maybe buying a product or service from your brand, then returning to buy another product and service, and then continuing to buy that product or service. I mean, that's increasing the top funnel traffic, and not just the traffic, but the conversions. So at every step in the process, social media allows you to build that funnel, depending on where somebody is, whether they're seeing your brand for the first time, or actually returning to purchase the product or service again. So that's the inherent benefit. These are the inherent benefits of social media marketing. Now, we talk about social media marketing. What are the channels used for social media marketing? How can we use them? It's really social media marketing is a channel in itself. So let's take a look at the platforms involved with social media marketing. Now, there are some really popular platforms. So if you can't tell, just buy these logos, then you probably have not used social media marketing or, or social media platforms before or taken part in social media at all. But you know, one would like to think that the majority of your users out there today know what Facebook is, what the logo looks like, what it does. Same with Instagram, which is owned by Facebook, LinkedIn, B2B platform, it's YouTube, great, very popular, video sharing platform, and then Twitter, which is considered microblogging, but still social media. So these are the most popular, popular platforms out there, but there are hundreds of social media platforms. In fact, when we talk about social media marketing, it can be anything from microblogging to video sharing like YouTube to B2B networks like LinkedIn to say bookmarking sites like stumbled upon, content sharing sites like Reddit, Q&A sites like Quora. So there's plenty of different types of social media platforms out there. In fact, if you folks have any popular or you think valid social media platforms that these listeners here should really get to know and understand and use, then go ahead and put that in the comment section underneath this video. I'm always interested in knowing what social media platforms are out there and what people are using, how platforms are trending, what's popular, what's not, and ideally, as a digital marketer, where my target audience is. So these are the most common, but there are hundreds out there, hundreds. So let's talk about the most popular social media platform, and that's Facebook. So Facebook has an average of 2.27 billion monthly active users. Now that number is fluctuating because we're talking about billions, billions, billions of monthly active users, and that number is probably trending up. 88% of all users are on mobile. So what does that tell you? That tells you that Facebook has an app and the app is very popular. In fact, I tend to use the app more than I use the web page for Facebook. Okay, so I don't necessarily log on via the internet on my laptop. I go right to the app. It's just easier, easier to disseminate information, easier to add friends, comment, respond, etc. So it's no surprise that 88% of all users use mobile. Now, 66% of mobile monthly users use Facebook daily. So a lot of recurring users going back on a day day-to-day -day basis, two thirds. So it's an addiction more than it is anything else because what Facebook is, is really you're getting information from the people you trust, care about, like, work with, share a group with, share common interest with, partake in the same organization, maybe have the same running group, same passions. I mean, that's what Facebook is. It's a commonality amongst people. And if you build up a network of that commonality, it's gonna be addicting to take part 
confirming that. You know, the closest network you can ever get to is your family. So if your family's on Facebook, then likely you're going to be on Facebook communicating with your family via this platform. Especially if you don't live close to your family or especially if you don't live close to your friends. I know in the United States, you know, people move a lot for work or people travel a lot for work. And so Facebook bridges that gap between distance and you, you know, you do feel like you're part of somebody's life on a daily basis being on Facebook. So that's what makes it the addictive part. So if you think about it from an end user's perspective, it makes total sense. Now, if you wear your digital marketing hat and you're thinking, hey, two thirds of monthly users are using it daily and there's billions of active users, then whoever I'm targeting has to be on Facebook. Now, if we look closer at the demographics, we could see that a lot more seniors age 65 plus are using Facebook. So 60 plus percent of seniors are using Facebook. So Facebook is trending older. However, 35% of the audience is below the age of 25. So it's not just trending up, it's also trending down. So a lot of young people are still using Facebook. And then Facebook, you know, is pretty evenly matched between males and females. Now, if I'm either slewing old, skewing older or skewing younger on my target audience and half female, half is male, then I know somewhere in there, whoever I'm targeting is going to be on Facebook just based on these numbers here. So your demographic is likely going to be on Facebook. Again, depending on your industry, depending on your product or service, but considering the number of people and how it's skewing older and younger and everybody in between, Facebook has something for everyone. Now, Facebook allows for video content. So you could post videos all day long. So if you have YouTube videos, you can share those YouTube videos on Facebook. In fact, video, just like on most platforms, tends to provide better engagement. And the industries that can really capitalize on Facebook tend to be food and beverage, news and media, and e-commerce, meaning you're selling a product. Facebook has, you know, plugins and it, that allow you to really accentuate what you're trying to sell. And when I say that, accentuate, I mean really incorporate an opportunity for people to use the Facebook platform to not only just engage, not only to share, but to buy, taking that process a step further. So if you're selling a product, you can more or less set up a, a Facebook shop, if you will, and sell your product there. So that's why it benefits those that are, are in the e-commerce industry selling a particular product or in the food and beverage industry. Now, some of the most liked pages on Facebook spans across many, many brands, but let's just take a look at Coca-Cola, for example. And Coca-Cola just pretty much pinpoints everything great about what you could do on Facebook. I mean, you could see here, they have their opening page is a video and so you can see they're posting different content about you know this is about a grant how they're helping the city of atlanta you know they're talking about recycling so to me these are community-based posts so they're not necessarily just pushing out their product per se they're trying to use facebook to build up brand awareness so a huge fortune 500 company like coca-cola is not necessarily just using Facebook just to push e-commerce or push a product. They're out there, you know, pushing what they're doing for the community. So this is a good example of, you know, how you can really leverage Facebook, taking advantage of everything Facebook has to offer. And that means brand awareness, community building, you know, sharing, you know, updated information, not only about the company, but in this case, Coca-Cola is situated in Atlanta, Georgia, in the United States. So, you know, what are they doing with the community? Okay, so this is a good example. Of course, it's a big example because Coca-Cola is a big company, they're worldwide, but the great thing about Facebook is you can always take a peek at what other companies are doing. Whether you have a million plus people liking your page or a hundred plus people liking your page, you can always get ideas as to how they're leveraging Facebook. Now, if you do have a company, you can create a Facebook page for your business, just like Coca-Cola. 
So you want to be able to separate out your business from your personal page. And like everything you do, whether that's writing a blog or creating a video, you want to have original content that's relevant to your audience. You want to use Facebook for some promotion, but every post doesn't necessarily need to be promoting your product or service. You saw what we just witnessed on the Coca-Cola page, it was about what they were doing to, you know, benefit the earth with recycling or what they're doing in conjunction with the with the city of Atlanta. So they're more community based posts. And so to me, that's original content, positive content that isn't necessarily pushing their product per se. Now, you could argue, hey, it's Coca-Cola. They have the biggest brand in the world, and that's true. But just think about your product and service. Think about your brand. If you're trying to build brand awareness, what does your brand stand for? And if your brand stands for, say, the, the globe, the ecosystem, the environment, then you probably want to be pushing out posts in that direction. If that's what you stand for as a brand, then you want people to know that because like-minded people are on Facebook and those like-minded people are going to be the ones who like your page, who engage with your content and tell other people about it. So you always want to go original. You always want to be true to yourself and true to your brand. And then you could take advantage of user-generated content like sharing a user's experience of using your product. So in other words, if somebody's engaging with you or they've posted something about your brand and product, you can reciprocate. You can certainly post something that is similar to what somebody's doing with your product or brand. So that's a good way to create some original content by taking advantage of what the users have generated. So these are just some examples of how to take advantage of Facebook. I mean, there's lots of things you can do on Facebook, plenty of things. If we float back to Coca-Cola page, you know, you could see they have, you know, careers. They have different videos. They have reviews. They have community. So nowhere in here do I see an e-commerce platform. Now, if you are selling t-shirts, then hey, you can put something in there to help you sell that t-shirt. But Coca-Cola's strategy is, hey, what can we do to help build up our community? What can we do to fundraise? So if we click on fundraise, you can see they have, you know, an end aids campaign here. If you look at Simply Learn, just as another example, you could see what Simply Learn's done as well. You could see they have information about us. They have different events. They have a community link as well. And so you could see what they're posting as well. And they're, you could see they're posting visitor photos. So there's lots you can do on Facebook. You can post polls. You can put your Instagram feed in there. You can add testimonials. So there's a lot you can do on your page. You just got to get creative and take advantage of everything Facebook has to offer. Be true to yourself. And before you know it, I mean, you're going to have, you know, a number of likes on your business page as well. So some other tips about Facebook when it comes to content, you want to schedule your content. Okay. You don't want to just continue to, to post back to back to back to back. You want to space your content out. And the, another great advantage to Facebook, as I already mentioned about social media marketing, that's advertising. So Facebook owns Instagram. They have a great tool for communicating called Facebook Messenger. And so you can advertise leveraging Facebook Messenger. You can leverage Instagram. And what you need to do is if you go to Facebook's ad manager, and you create a campaign. When you go to create a campaign, you're going to click on placements. And depending on what you're trying to do, let's just say you're trying to build brand awareness. You can actually hone in on you know, Facebook. You can hone in on Instagram. You can do a number of different things within Facebook. You have different ads available to you from single image ads to video ads to carousel. So you have a lot of options. And the biggest option on Facebook when it comes to advertising is your audience. Who are you targeting? So remember, Facebook has old, young, and everybody in between, between men and women. And so you can specifically target interests. You could specifically target gender, an age, a location. So Facebook really allows you to hone in on who your audience is if you're advertising. And so that's the great thing about Facebook. They have a lot of users and you're, you have an opportunity to hone in on a segment of that user base. Now, Facebook also has 
metrics that you can look at to really understand how people are interacting with your ads, how inter people are interacting with your post. So let's take a look at that. So if we go to Facebook, when you go to your page, you can click on insights and you can actually see some insights on posts that have been posted on your page. You can get insights into how many people viewed it, how many people liked it, how many people engaged, how many people you reached with your post. Okay, you have information about videos, followers, Facebook provides recommendations. So this is all part of Facebook Insights. So if you're posting on Facebook, Facebook will give you feedback as to how your posts are performing. Now, if you're running ads on Facebook, you can simply just view metrics related to how your ads are performing. So you could see how many people clicked on an ad, how many people the ad reached, how much you've spent. Okay, you can look at it by demographic. You can even see cost per result. So you can get a lot of good insights into how your ads are performing as well. So if you're running a campaign targeting a specific audience on Facebook, you can look at the you know stats and metrics surrounding that campaign. And again, for your Facebook page, you have Facebook Insights. So if you have any questions, you know, feel free. We have a video called uh, Facebook Advertising uh, Tips and Tricks. So feel free to, you know, take a look at this video on Simply Learn's YouTube channel for more information about Facebook. Okay? And if again, if you have any comments to share about Facebook, feel free to put them under the comment section. Okay, let's turn our attention to one of the platforms Facebook actually owns, Instagram. So Instagram is a place where you can actually promote your brand product or service through the power of imagery or video. And so the average number of monthly users on Instagram reaches 1 billion. And 32% of all internet users are on Instagram. So a lot of users using it. It's very easy platform to use. You just, the only prerequisite, you need your mobile phone. So you open up that app, it's as simple as just uploading uploading an image. That's why Instagram is so popular because it's just a simple tool to use to go ahead and just post an image with some hashtags. So 68% of all Instagram users are women. So unlike Facebook, it does tend to slant more on the female side. And 59% of the audience is a bit younger between age 18 to 29. So slants more women and slants more younger. And so if these particular demographic and age groups tend to fit your target audience, then Instagram is a place you probably want to be for social media marketing. So as I mentioned, content that works best are photos or videos. I would always slant towards videos if you have them available, but photos, you know, the rule of thumb is photos always tell a thousand words, a thousand stories, a thousand interpretations. Images are just always the best way to go as well. I mean, if you don't have the videos, hey, nothing to be sad about if you fall back on imagery. So um, you can really put your brand in a good perspective and a good light by posting images. And as you can imagine, if 18 to 29 year old women are on Instagram, you know, that's skewing towards a certain demographic, but in terms of industry, it is open to most industries. But the ones that tend to be most successful are beauty, food and beverage, and e-commerce. Now, food and beverage always tends to work well when you have video and imagery. Likewise, beauty but e-commerce if you're selling that t-shirt or shoe you know instagram allows the platform to work in a way where people can purchase that product right within the platform so that's why it tends to work well with e-commerce okay there are lots of channels just like on facebook lots of channels on instagram i mean some of the most followed brands are chanel starbucks nike i mean if you have a product or service that you want to push out there then instagram is the way to go just for brand awareness if you're selling shoes then why not take images of and photos of their shoes and get them posted on Instagram. Like I said, it's very simple to use. All you need is some hashtags to go along with that photo of a shoe or photo of that cup of coffee. And Instagram kind of takes care of itself. I mean, photos do accentuate the product if you have them. 
So leverage Instagram if you're really trying to build up some brand awareness for a particular product. Some best practices here on Instagram is, you know, have a compelling bio, a good profile picture, you know, add a link to a landing page and, you know, leverage emojis if you have to. So set yourself up nicely on Instagram. You know, if you're in a particular industry like food and beverage, follow other food and beverage brands like Coca-Cola, like Starbucks, depends on what it is you really want to be related to. So just make sure they're relevant. Get hashtags, can't stress that enough. You know, when you post a photo, throw some hashtags in there. You can see what other people are hashtagging on Instagram and you can ride that wave of what's trending or you can create your own unique hashtag. I'd probably have two to three hashtags per photo. Then don't be afraid to use both photos and videos. Videos do tend to work well on pretty much any platform. They tend to work well on websites and blogs, so why not use them on social media where people can engage, okay? So videos and imageries both work well on Instagram, okay? You can also get shout outs from other influencers. You have plenty of influencers on Instagram, especially in beauty, especially in food and beverage. Fashion tends to be another industry that has a lot of influencers. So feel free to reach out to them, reciprocate. See how you can work together where they can actually, you know, give you a shout out on your particular product. You want to keep your Instagram account updated and you can update those with Instagram stories. It's basically you showing off a particular product, you know, over a span of a few seconds or even a minute. That's an Instagram story. They're very popular, uh, easy to use. You can even run contests to boost engagement. So, for example, if your particular product is a particular food, like a hamburger, you know, hey, post a contest about, you know, allowing your followers to post the best, good looking, tasty, you know, hamburger, as an example. Or it could be something else in terms of fashion. Hey, what's your best outfit on a Friday night before you go out for the evening? You know, there's always things you can do to spur engagement, especially on a platform like Instagram where people like to post photos. And then I mentioned this earlier with Facebook ads, you can run Instagram ads to give a particular post a boost. So if we take a little snapshot of what we have available in Facebook ads manager, you can choose Instagram as the particular platform. So if you just want to advertise on Instagram, when you go to your placements, you could choose just Instagram either the feed or the stories. Okay, so you can choose one of these two options. If you want to boost your posts, get some more eyeballs on that. Okay, it's a cost per click platform. So anytime somebody clicks, it's going to cost you. But, you know, just like Facebook, you know, the cost per click tends to slant a little bit lower. It really depends on what you're trying to post, when you're trying to post it, and who else is posting. But Hey, the Instagram feed and the stories could be a good option if you're really trying to draw attention to a particular product. Okay, let's turn our attention now to the B2B platform called LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a very powerful, popular business to business platform. Okay, it has 260 million active users monthly and unlike Instagram, where Instagram slants more towards women, LinkedIn slants more towards men. 50 seven percent so a majority of the users are men but still you have a lot of women involved in on linkedin so a nice you know nice mix between both genders 38 percent of the user base are millennials you know a lot of young people older people a nice mix from a business, lots of dis different business segments, different levels of business, different business industries and verticals are on LinkedIn. So don't be, you know, shying away from uh, LinkedIn if your demographic or target audience tends to be older, just because 38% are millennials doesn't mean anything. It means that everybody's using it. It just that means that, hey, you know, more than one third of the users are millennials, are younger. Now, LinkedIn is a B2B platform. So if you're in the business of generating business leads, then LinkedIn is the place for you to go. There's opportunities for you to advertise on LinkedIn. Okay, there's also opportunities for you to post lots of different content on LinkedIn. So content that works on LinkedIn could be a blog, it could be, you know, particular news article, you know, tips and best practices. I've posted videos on LinkedIn, 
you know, it's good for jobs. So there's a lot of content on LinkedIn. So if we take a sneak peek at LinkedIn, if I just go to LinkedIn here, you know, and I just go to my home, uh, the start news page, you know, I could see the types of content that's been posted. So somebody just posted something with an image, you know, then you got an article down here. Okay, you got, you know, uh, an influencer like Richard Branson posting. So you got a lot of different types of posts that you'll be able to see and, you know, leverage if you want to. Meaning when I say leverage, if you see somebody like Richard Branson posting something, hey, stay fit and healthy, you know, that's an image. That's something about, not about business per se, but, you know, something interesting and unique. So you can see all sorts of different types of content based on who you're following on LinkedIn and who you're connected to. Some things about LinkedIn, you always want to create an engaging profile. When I say engaging, well, first things first, make sure it's complete. I mean, there's lots of opportunities. So if you sneak over to my profile here, you want to be able to post a lot of information about yourself, so about what you're affiliated with, what jobs you've held, what groups you're associated with, what your interests are, what certifications you have. So you want to be able to, you know, complete your total profile. You can create a company page for your business. So if we go back to LinkedIn, we can just do a search for say Simply Learn and let's take a look at, you know, their business page. So if I just do a search for Simply Learn here. So if I select their page. You can see just like your profile page, if you have a business page set up on LinkedIn, you want to make sure it's complete. You want to put information about the company, what jobs are available, and you want your company to associate with that business page. Any Anybody who does, you know, follow that particular business page, part of the organization is going to be listed under people. So, and you want to be able to post just like on your personal profile. If you have a business page, you want to be able to post unique content. I mean, you can see here, Simply Learn is posting, you know, some of the accolades that they have. But they're taking that a step further. They're also posting, you know, information about, you know, upcoming events and webinars. So they're posting a mix of different content. And that's ideally what you want to do on any social media platform is mix it up. And just like you can on Facebook, just like you can on Instagram, you can, you know, boost a post per se. Okay, so you can get that post in front of some additional eyeballs. Now, of course, you want to optimize your company page for searches. So it really does come down to how many people are following you but when you say when we say optimize your company page just make sure it's complete with some compelling content and then increase the number of followers you have so the great thing about LinkedIn that I like the most is that you know you can you know simply look at other people if I go back to say the home page, you can actually see who's following what and you know, LinkedIn does give you um, opportunities to connect with people. Okay, so if I go to your if you go to your profile, you'll be able to see other people that have viewed your particular page and you can connect with them okay or connect with people who are like-minded or similar or connected to people that you know so LinkedIn does a good job of presenting other people you can connect with so it makes it easier for you to increase the number of followers so having an engaging profile personal profile you know having an engaging company page making sure both your personal and the company company page have all the content necessary have all of it completed and then increasing followers posting unique content I mean that's really the key to LinkedIn now again with LinkedIn you can use different media you can use videos slide share presentation images and you can boost content as I mentioned before you can boost content on LinkedIn so if you want to get that content in front of eyeballs you can do that so let's take a look at an example of a campaign and what you could do on LinkedIn in terms of sponsored content so if you go to LinkedIn's campaign manager I mean you have an opportunity to put your ad in front of a particular audience so it really depends on again on who you're trying to target just like Facebook which slants more towards personal LinkedIn is gonna slant more towards business so with LinkedIn you have an opportunity to target a particular industry a particular company a particular job title 
Okay, so you could target everything business related on LinkedIn. So you can go ahead and create an ad. The ads have imagery to support the ad. And so basically when you set up your ad, you set up your target, you could choose your placement. You're gonna be able to see you know, who it is you're actually targeting. And you can go ahead and the great thing about LinkedIn is you have different ad formats. And again, you can get really creative with who you want to target. And just like Facebook, you know, LinkedIn has, you know, some metrics that you can measure and figure out how your particular campaign performed by impressions, by click, click through rate, even conversions, cost per conversions and how many leads. So LinkedIn has built in platform for measuring campaign success. And so the differentiation between Facebook and LinkedIn is really just the type of demographics that you have to choose from. You know, with LinkedIn, you do have, you know, different options available based on business like you know job title or job level or industry or vertical so you have a lot of examples available or a lot of options available to you on linkedin in terms of advertising okay let's talk about youtube now so youtube has 1.9 billion active users if it was a search engine it'd be the second most popular search engine the highest number of monthly active users in decreasing order starts at the united states brazil russia japan and india all big markets all like to use YouTube, but YouTube's popular across the world. Just like Facebook, where the app is popular, the app on for YouTube is very popular. So 70% of all views are generated from mobile. So with YouTube being a video platform, you def definitely need videos. Now, there's a lot of industries on YouTube, a lot of industries. Um, and some of the most successful brands on YouTube, you know, range from Logo to Coca-Cola, you know, pretty much to every brand. If you're a brand, you want to be on YouTube because of the massive reach that YouTube has to offer coupled with video and how great video is in terms of engagement it's a just a great combination okay so some best practices here for YouTube you want to optimize your video for SEO to get views and so we have a video that we've created at simply learn how to rank youtube videos <clears throat> so if you watch that video you'll get some really good tips and strategies about how to you know optimize your video for YouTube. The very least, you want to make sure that you know using right the right keywords and the title, description, and hashtags. So that's a start when we talk about optimizing your videos. You want to upload regularly and fix a schedule for your videos because if you're starting to get followers on YouTube or subscribers, they're gonna expect you to produce more video, especially if you're producing engaging, unique, relevant content for that target audience. So we're not saying you have to have a video once a day or once a week. Start small and build up and get on a regular schedule. Okay, then you can organize your videos in a playlist. So, you know, if we look at Simply Learn, you know, Simply Learn does a, a good job of organizing their videos into a playlist. So all you have to do is go to I'm a founder and CEO of Simply Learn's uh, YouTube channel and you can see how it's broken down into playlists. Now, YouTube also has the ability, because it is global, you do have the ability to provide translations. So if your target audience is from another country, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea. Like Facebook and Instagram or like LinkedIn, you can advertise on YouTube. You would just need to do that through Google Ads. So with Google Ads, you're gonna say, Google, I wanna advertise on YouTube, and you have plenty of available options to available to you. Anything from you know pre-roll to showing up in the middle of a video to showing up, you know, before or excuse me, at the end of a video, all the way to native content marketing where you know your ad is showing up next to a video. So you have plenty of options for advertising on YouTube. And then just like on Instagram, there are influencers on YouTube. You know, feel free to reach out to these influencers and see if you can collaborate in some way where maybe you post their video on your channel, they post your video on their channel and vice versa. So you want to be able to maybe collaborate somehow to get some views on your video. Okay, let's talk about Twitter now. So Twitter is a micro blogging platform. And so when I say micro blogging, I mean limited in characters, limited in how much you can actually post. But it's very popular. It has 326 million active users per month, and it does tend to slant 
a lot towards millennials. So a lot of young people use Twitter and a lot of people use it to get their news. So no longer are the days of grabbing that newspaper, no longer are the days of going maybe to a media news site online. You can quickly go to Twitter and get all your news right there in a feed, an easy feed. Let's take a peek at Twitter here. You know, I can get everything from, you know, somebody posting something specific about their dog, you know, all the way to a particular job you know, all the way to industry news, you know, all the way to basically an advertisement, all the way to a specific news article. So it's all here on Twitter in your feed. So Twitter does offer videos, so videos do work well. So if I go back here, you could see, you know, here's a video of Antonio Brown. He's posting a video of his news conference and another promotional video. So industries that capitalize on Twitter, as you can guess, if a lot of people go there for their news, you probably see a lot of news and media and entertainment on Twitter. So that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't use Twitter for your brand. It really comes down to target audience. Some of the most influential brands are slanted more towards, you know, news and media, but you know, you got cosmetics, you got gaming companies, you got everybody's on Twitter. Okay. It just comes down to, does this platform have your target audience? And given the nature of Twitter, you know, how can you get your particular brand, product or service out there in so many characters? Okay, some other advantages and best practices you can use on Twitter. So I would recommend implementing Twitter cards and really, all Twitter cards does is allow you to attach rich photos or videos and different media experiences to tweets. So when you can attach, you know, rich media like videos and images to tweets, it can help drive traffic and engagement to your website. All it's going to take is just a few lines of markup to your web page and then users who tweet links to your content will have a quote unquote card added to the tweet that's visible to their followers. So that's how it works. I would certainly look to get Twitter cards implemented if you are going to use Twitter as your platform of choice for social media marketing. So it does enhance the experience for the end user and because uh, allows you as an advertiser or as somebody leveraging social media to really enhance your tweet and it just provides a better experience for the end user who's looking at your tweet and so like linkedin you can really take a look at who's trending, what's trending on Twitter. So Twitter makes it easy for you to, you know, follow. So here they'll list a who to follow. So these who to follow are similar to what you've been posting or similar to your industry. And then here you can look at trends. You can look at what hashtags are trending. And so if you click on a particular hashtag, you can, you know, follow a particular you know, person who, or an organization who tweeted something. Um, so you always are reminded in Twitter who to follow. And so it makes it easier for you to pick and choose who to follow and build up your following fairly quickly because Twitter actually provides you with opportunities on who to follow. Just like LinkedIn, just like YouTube, just like Instagram, there are influencers out there, people who have a large number of followers who tweet on a regular basis, who tweet original content, who get high engagement. These are influencers and these are the people you want to engage with. So look for those people on Twitter, follow them. I mean, the rule of thumb is if you follow someone on Twitter, you know, generally they're going to follow you back. So if you can engage and follow influencers, you have an opportunity to see not only what they're tweeting, but the ability to communicate with them and engage with them as an influencer. So maybe they can retweet one of your tweets and get that tweet out in front of their followers. So you can advertise on Twitter. And the unique thing about advertising on Twitter, you can you know promote your tweet just like you promote a post on Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn but more so I think than any other platform is the use of hashtags and so use appropriate relevant hashtags I always tend to use a unique hashtag but also depends on what you're tweeting about if there's something that's trending and again Twitter will tell you what's trending in terms of hashtags if it's something you're tweeting about 
then go ahead and use that hashtag as well. You can have multiple hashtags in a particular tweet. And so don't be afraid to use a unique hashtag along with a hashtag that's trending because the whole idea is you want your tweet to get noticed. And then you can use tweet chat or some, there's some other tools out there that are available to allow you to find people to follow. And these people might be interested in your product or service because you know they could fit your target audience. Or you can connect with like-minded folks who are in the same industry or have similar products or interests. So tweet chat's available for that reason. And you wanna take advantage of these tools because again, with Twitter, it's easy to build a following, but you wanna build a following that is going to engage with your tweets. So let's talk about what tools are available for social media marketing. So when we talk about all these platforms available to us, okay, we talk about Facebook and Instagram and we talked about LinkedIn and Twitter and YouTube. I mean, those are popular platforms, but at the beginning of the session, I mentioned there's hundreds of social media platforms out there. And if you're posting content on a number of them, you wanna be able to organize that content. You wanna be able to organize it and schedule it you know where it makes sense and when it makes sense you want to stay organized and so there are tools available to help you stay organized tools like Hootsuite Buffer or Sprout Social okay some of these tools are available you know at a cost of a free trial or at a low cost per month so regardless of whether you're using a free version of one of these tools or another tool not listed or you're actually paying for it it's worth the investment if you're going to partake in social media marketing and even if you're on one platform it's still worth it to have a social media tool available to help you schedule and not only do these social media tools help you schedule they do a lot of other things too for example they help you measure the engagement of your posts so let's take an example of one of them like sprout social so if I go to Sprout Social, here I can see for a particular company, I'm able to see, you know, how my posts and get, were engaged. Okay, so I can see daily engagements on particular platforms. I can also, you know, schedule my post. So I can go ahead and, and pick a time and date to schedule them. And so I can go ahead and post something and put it in a queue to be published, for example, tomorrow or next week or whatever the case may be. So these tools do a lot for you. I mean, they help you discover new followers. They give you in-depth reports. They help you stay organized. And so to me, it's worth the investment to look at one of the tools listed here you know these are some of the more popular ones to maybe even a free version but regardless of how much you pay and what tool you're using it's still worth the investment just to make sure you're scheduling your post at the appropriate time so you're not posting something back to back as an example and you're able to measure accordingly so it's nice to be able to go into a tool like sprout social go to reports and measure you know in one place you know how twitter's performing or how Facebook's performing or how LinkedIn's performing. And so that's what a lot of these tools provide is nice reporting options and nice scheduling options. So you can find more content you can create by using these tools. Again, you can schedule efficiently, analyze them, and you can use insights to improve your campaign. So a lot of these tools give you nice insights to how the post was actually engaged and you want to be able to leverage that. And some of these tools, if not all of them, have social listening. And social listening is monitoring what's being posted out there. So what else is posted, you can take a look at, and if it's something interesting or relevant, you can go ahead and follow or take part in that conversation. Okay, so that's what social listening allows you to do, and a lot of these platforms have that as a feature. So let's take a look at tips to be a good social media marketer. So some of the important things you should take care of are set up a social media marketing plan. When I say set up a social media marketing plan, there's some questions you wanna be able to ask. Okay, what platforms am I gonna use? What's my objective on each platform? In fact, even before you choose the platform, you wanna figure out what your objective is in terms of social media. So your objective could be different on each platform. It could be brand awareness on Facebook and it could be promoting a particular product on Twitter. Your objective is gonna be on each platform. You wanna be able to choose your KPIs and align your KPIs with each platform. 
meaning what metrics are important to your business goals. And you wanna be able to figure out, okay, what kind of content am I going to post on these social media platforms? So you wanna get organized and put a plan in place. And then you wanna create informative, shareable, actionable, and relevant content. And what I mean by all that is you wanna create unique content. That doesn't mean you can't leverage what other people are doing, meaning, you know, if I'm, you know, in the shoe business, I can certainly go to Nike or Adidas or Puma or Reebok and see what kind of posts they're putting out. And then I could take their cue and do something similar, but I want it to be unique to me. And I want it to be unique to my brand. And I want to be able to keep my content visual, meaning I want to be able to use as many photos and videos as I can that's available to me. Because remember, videos generate better engagement. I wanna be active and responsive with my customer base, meaning the whole point of social media is to engage. And people are going to respond, they're gonna comment, they're gonna take part in what you post. And so whatever they do, you wanna be able to respond accordingly, whether that's positive or negative. And then you wanna measure metrics like conversion rates and click-through rates. So that goes back to putting a plan in place, figure out what your metrics are, and then and when you're posting on a particular platform, you want to be able to lean on those metrics to make sure you're achieving your goals. So you want to have those metrics in place beforehand, and then you want to be able to use those metrics moving forward as you post. The whole idea is if you're measuring what you post, you're obviously going to want to lean more towards what's working versus what's not working. In a world where a lot of competing different products satisfy the same requirement, you have a lot of advertisers who want you to try their product. And then you have other advertisers who want you to try their product. Try my product. Try my product. Try my product. Try, no, try my product. My product's the best. No, 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 no. My product's the best. Try my product. Well, I want you to forget all that and try my product. Forget about those other advertisers. Try my product. Well, there's only one way you can prove your product is better than the rest, and that's with powerful advertising. And one of the best ways to advertise on the internet is via social media and through the largest social media platform in the world, and that's Facebook. So today, we're gonna talk about Facebook ads tutorial. And I'm excited to teach this class. My name is Rob Sanders. I'm with Simply Learn. And today we are going to talk about all the different ads that Facebook has to offer. So introduced back in 2007, the Facebook ads platform has grown tremendously over the last few years, almost $4 billion of revenue in one year. So what does that mean? That means there's a lot of advertisers. Why is there a lot of advertisers? Because a lot of people use Facebook. Facebook, it's a popular platform. So not only is it popular, but it's popular with advertisers because if you're advertising on Facebook, you have the opportunity to share your product and your brand with users who you think are going to buy your product or associate with your brand. And on Facebook, you can do that a number of different ways, specifically in somebody's newsfeed. And specifically, that person's news feed that, again, is interested, potentially interested in your brand, your product. So there's a lot of ways to advertise and a lot of reasons why you want to advertise. So I just mentioned one of the reasons. Hey, it's an opportunity for you to reach out to people who are targeted, who are specific to your product and your brand. So not only that, but you combine that target audience with the amount of time that people spend on Facebook. Okay, people spend a lot of time on Facebook. In fact, not only do people spend a lot of time on Facebook, there's a lot of people on Facebook. In fact, 2.27 billion in the third quarter of 2018. And so when we say spend a lot of time, we mean going to that Facebook profile at least once a day. Okay, so a lot of eyeballs throughout the day checking their newsfeed on Facebook. Facebook also enables you, the advertiser, to find the perfect audience. And so that's the great combination. A lot of people on Facebook and targeted audience. So it's a platform that allows you to put your product in front of people based on specific interest, 
specific demographics, specific location. So you're really, really putting your product out in front of the right people at the right time. And so the other positive and pro about Facebook is it's lesser spend, greater reach. And what do we mean by that? Well, traditionally, Facebook is a little bit cheaper than other online advertising models. It is definitely a lot cheaper than your traditional advertising models. And Facebook has been known to have good return on investment because it's cost a little bit less than other advertising models and other advertising platforms. So that's the other benefit to being on Facebook. So if you're into building a brand, you want to be on Facebook. Why? Because it helps you increase your brand awareness. It's going to help you allow users to know what your brand is all about. Because remember, you're putting your brand in front of like-minded people or people you think that are going to associate with your brand that are going to associate with your product. So you put your brand out there, you incorporate your, your advertisement in somebody's newsfeed, it's going to add value. It's going to establish trust and credibility, especially if that person's friend is associated with that brand. So instant credibility if friends and family members of a person on Facebook are associated with your brand. So it has the opportunity to really lend a lot of credence to somebody who is on Facebook, active on Facebook, and is your targeted demographic. And the great thing about Facebook is it also has other features, other advertising features such as retargeting. So you could target people who've already expressed an interest in your service or product. But if they didn't go through the conversion process, meaning they didn't go all the way through and, and buy your product, you can certainly reach out to them again. Just like your traditional retargeting options on say Google or some other advertising platform, Facebook works the same way. We want to be able to reach out to people who aren't fully committed at the point in time, but we can reach out to them at another point in time. And so Facebook's advertising platform allows us to do that. So it's a great feature that we could take advantage of that we'll talk about more throughout this session. And then it helps increase revenue sales and leads. And, and that's primarily what most advertisers are after, you know, more revenue, more sales, more leads. So Facebook allows us to educate our audience, again, a targeted audience, about a specific product we have to offer. So the more our audience knows about our product, especially if their friends and family members and colleagues are using the product, then the more likely they're going to purchase. So if you go back to the other feature, higher revenue, less spend, this is the primary reason because you have a chance to influence somebody who's very targeted, who's very active on the platform, and who may have like-minded people in their life associating with your brand and product. So it's a perfect combination for advertising, perfect combination. And so today we're gonna to talk about all the different types of Facebook ads. And we're gonna start out with the single image ad. And the single image ad are just single image advertisements that have an optional text on top and a link description that links to the website. So single image ads are probably the most popular. You can see them on probably your own Facebook feed if you look. So in fact, I'll just jump over to my Facebook feed right now. And if I go there, what do I see? I see a single image ad here and it's from Shopify Partners. So become a Shopify partner at e-commerce to your list of qualifications. So Shopify must be, you know, a brand that is trying to woo my business. Okay, so they know that somebody that I'm associated with or maybe I fit their demographic, so they're targeting my newsfeed with a single image ad. So that's what a single image ad looks like. It's simply just one single image with some description. And the great thing about this single image, if you haven't noticed, is the pixels are pretty large. It's 1200 by 628, so it kind of stands out a little bit. It's not your traditional thumbnail. It really pops when you look at the newsfeed. So again, if I go back to my newsfeed here, you can see it just really stands out within the newsfeed. So I can't miss it. If I'm a targeted part of their targeted audience, it's hard for me to, you know, not see this ad interact in some way, especially again, if I know somebody in my network on Facebook, or either that be a friend or family member is associated with that product. 
Okay, in addition to the single image ads, Facebook also has multi-product ads, or also known as carousel ads. And so what the carousel ads do is allow you, in, in carousel form, allow you to rotate different ads with different messaging and different call to action. And so here you can see Simply Learn has a example of a carousel ad where they're showcasing their different courses. So this allows users to view a range of all your different products and services. If you have multiple products and services to offer, then the carousel ads would be a good option for you. So in addition to the carousel ads and single image ads, it gets a little bit more sophisticated in terms of technology where Facebook allows us to offer up video ads. And so video ads are interactive. It's a good way to really showcase your product, your brand, your service. And the great thing about the video ads is they can go from just a few seconds all the way up to you know two minutes, or excuse me, all the way up to 120 minutes. And so you can really, really put a lot of time and effort into the video ads to really put your brand out there. And so the one thing about video is it is interactive. Most people engage with video and they tend to get about 10 to 30 percent more views than other forms of ads. So the video ads are really a popular way for you as an advertiser to put your brand or product out there. So you can put your brand and product out there in not just a few seconds, but you know, really tell a nice complete story to get the engagement, to get the person to take the action you want them to do. So that's why video ads have become very popular because they tend to get more engagement, more interaction than your traditional single image ad or say your carousel ad. So Facebook also allows us to advertise something called lead ads. And what lead ads allow us to do is obtain user details. Okay, so we can acquire or get an email address or phone number from somebody who's interested in our product or service, and that person doesn't even have to leave Facebook. So if you look here in the example, here we have the ad, somebody clicks on sign up and they get this form submission. And the great thing about the lead ad is that it can sync up with any CRM or most of your popular CRMs, I should say, for example, Salesforce uh, as a good example of a CRM where somebody fills that out, the information goes directly to Salesforce. And so lead ads are really good if you're trying to generate you know, leads for your business. And the form itself, the interaction stays right in Facebook. And so that's the great thing about it. They don't really have to leave the platform. Another form of advertising on Facebook are slideshows. Okay, so unlike the carousel ads, which rotate, and the carousel ads, remember, rotate and showcase different products or services, these ads are, are interactive, but they're rotating different imagery. So it allows you to really put your best images out there with a really strong call to action, just like you see here with the Simply Learn example, okay? So they're showcasing, you know, their different classes, and then they have the Get Started Today call to action to really punctuate the slideshow ad. So what's interesting is you can really gauge a, a person's interest by throwing different products or images out there. You know, you can really immerse a user's experience here by showing different, different images. And then the last type of ad on Facebook is called the collection ad. And so these ads combine basically your video, your slideshow, or your product images taken from your product catalog. Okay, so if you're an advertiser who wants to advertise several products at once, then this could be a great option for you, the collection ad. So here you could see the Simply Learn example. Here they're showing, you know, not only, you know, some, some good slideshows and imagery with some good messaging below that, so before we get into the steps for creating an ad on Facebook, let's talk about some of the important changes that have happened on Facebook recently in light of data sharing. So really what Facebook's done is they've made an important change on how user data is being used for advertising. And so what Facebook's done is they removed something um, called a partner category, and that was an ad targeting program which the targeting option was based on data provided by a third party partner. 
So if you're an advertiser and you had a third party partner that provided some targeted options to you, that was known as a partner category. And in summary, Facebook has removed that program. And so now the only way you can gain user information is if they provide that voluntary, like the lead ad, for example. Now you have to get the data directly from the third party now. So you can't have that third party give you that targeting op option anymore. You could certainly again, capture the data yourself by relying on lead capture landing pages as an example, or the lead ads. And you can certainly still outsource your advertising to lead gen agencies and media buying companies. Okay. But the partner category has more or less gone away. Okay. So now let's get into how to create a Facebook ad. So what are the steps? So the first thing you'll have to do is set up a campaign. So when you're setting up a campaign, you have to select what kind of spending you want to do for your advertisement and what you want to achieve. Okay. So you have to, in other words, identify the goal. Okay. So with Facebook, you have two opportunities at, at hand here. You can jump into an auction, just like Google. What you're going to do is your ads going to enter into an auction. And so this is where you can decide how you want to spend your money to achieve your goals by choosing an appropriate bid strategy for the auction. So in the auction, you're competing with other advertisers. Another option is you could do reach and frequency. And so with reach and frequency, you'll be able to advertise to your brand's audience with a fixed cost. So reach and frequency allows you as the advertiser to better predict the delivery cost and reach of your branding campaigns. So with auction, you have more choice, you have flexibility, you have scalability, but not a lot of predictability. Okay. Because again, you're going into an auction and your auction is going to be competing against other advertisers. So it's this option is available to all advertisers and you can have pricing that you can change during the auction price process. So that's the unpredictability part is the pricing. So pricing can fluctuate during the auction because you have different advertisers who are trying to achieve the most prominence for their ad. With reach and frequency, you'll be able to plan and set up your campaigns and actually set it up so it's more predictable on how the delivery is going to be done with reach and frequency. So more predictability with reach and frequency because you could set everything up in your campaign. Okay. So again, with the reach and frequency, you'll be able to advertise with a fixed cost auction. You're not necessarily going with a fixed cost. You're going with more scalability, flexibility on cost uh, that can change. Okay. So once you choose your objective for your advertisement, then you need to choose the type of advertisement you want to do. And it's based on your objectives. So what's your objective? Is it awareness to drive awareness? Is it to drive consideration or is it to drive a conversion? So these are the three objectives uh, available to you for your advertising. You want to choose one of those objectives. So let's take a look at each of these objectives available to you. Okay. So let's start out with awareness. So awareness can help with creating an interest for your product. Or, or your service. So when we say awareness, we're thinking maybe brand awareness or, or product awareness to get out there in front of people. Okay. So with consideration, it's a little bit different than awareness, but not so different in that we're really aiming to get people to think more about our product and service and have them take the next step. So with awareness, you're introducing your product and service with consideration. You're getting people to take the next step and start looking for information about the product or service you're advertising. And then conversion is kind of that final step. If you're really after conversion, you really want that person to make the decision. Okay. So they're either going to buy or use your product or service. Okay. And so that's the conversion objective. So you have to choose one of these three objectives here. Is it going to be awareness? Is it going to be consideration or is it going to be conversion? And so, Let's go back to awareness. Okay. So if we look at awareness under awareness, we have brand awareness and we have reach. 
Okay, so when we look at brand awareness, really what we're trying to do is we're trying to increase awareness about our brand or the product in our brand. So these types of objectives, I mean, meaning awareness, don't really emphasize interaction, okay? You're not really trying to get somebody to purchase or, or buy something or opt into a newsletter. Really your goal as an advertiser with brand awareness is to get your product out there so people are aware that it exists, okay? Let alone forget about buying it or opting into a newsletter. You really, your goal with awareness and brand awareness is to get people to see that you're existing, your product exists, your service exists, it's available. And really, the aim is to create high brand recall amongst users rather than focusing on generating revenue. So when we say, you know, high brand recall, what we mean is, hey, if your brand is out there and you are really pushing it out there amongst a large targeted demographic audience, then the next time that audience sees your brand, they're going to be able to associate with it. Okay, it's not going to be foreign to them or the first time they ever seen it. You really want them to recall, hey, I know that brand. I've seen that brand before. Okay, that's kind of the reaction you want to get from a brand awareness. Hey, that's a cool looking logo or man, that product looked interesting. Now I'm going to take the next step. So that's what brand awareness really needs to do. It needs to create that recall for that for your audience. Okay, so let's take a look now at reach. So with reach, reach ensures that our advertisement is seen by the maximum number of people within our target audience and budget. So with reach, we're really trying to reach or get our ad out there to as many people as possible, given who we're trying to target and given the amount of money we have to spend. So it helps to target a smaller audience to visit your website, watch your video, or even convert on your website. Okay, so that's with reach, we're just really trying to get it out there. Okay, so let's move on to consideration. So we talked about awareness, we talked about brand awareness and reach. With consideration, we have you know people who are willing to take that next step okay so if we're targeting a specific demographic and we're looking at consideration we really want them to do something with our ad we don't want them just to recall it or see it for the first time we want them to take that next step and so with consideration we have traffic so if we have an ad you know the least we want somebody to do who's seen our brand before is at least click on our ad okay so we want people to you know, click on our ad and go to our website. Really, that's an, a goal of consideration is, hey, I know that brand. I've seen that brand before. Let me click on this and see what they have to offer. So this might involve them listening to a podcast or reading an article or being introduced to an app. So really, you're setting the stage for further down the funnel by further introducing them to something that's on your website. So you really want them to take that next baby step. The next baby step is clicking on the ad, going to your site, and further educating themselves about your particular product or service. So Facebook shows these advertisements to people within your target audience based on their past behavior, okay? So that's a great thing about Facebook. It's You can really, really get targeted here with your audience. Okay, so engagement. So we talk about traffic, we're gonna talk about engagement. So these types of ads are useful when we want users to engage more with our ad. For example, we can you know, really have an advertisement or a post that will allow people to like it, they can respond, or even take advantage of an offer. So that's what we mean by engagement. We really want people to react positively within Facebook about our ad or our post. Okay, so it can help with building engagement, an engagement audience for your Facebook page that can be used for future advertising campaigns. So we're really getting people to take that next step. And what's that next step? If they don't go to our website, they can like what we have to say.
and then we can have app installs so that's another option to us for consideration so app installs are great if we want to send users to an app store for example so they can download our app so if we're really really pushing an app that we just developed then an app install could be a good opportunity under consideration to t allow that user to take the next step and download your app so that that at a later stage they can go and interact with the app we have video views so video views are are good advertisements when you're promoting your product or service and you really want a high number of views so remember early on we were talking about the types of ads available on facebook we talked about video views how they get 10 to 30 percent more engagement well that's really what we want videos to do under consideration we really want people to understand what we're trying to do and really engage with our product and so they could turn around and like it they could turn around and um, push it out to their friends so video we know is high engaging with an audience and so having a video allows you to really allow that video to potentially go viral Okay, so video views help users engage and enables the creation of an audience which can be used for future advertisements. Okay, so highly engageable, you know, interactive, allows people to, you know, really, really take that next step with your product or service by really getting to know what you're all about. Okay, then we have lead generation. So lead generation is interesting because remember those leads ads we mentioned in the when we we're talking about the type of ads that Facebook has to offer? Well, lead ads, or you know, if you have a lead generation type ad, really what you could do is you can just collect the information. So if really somebody's interested in your product or service right away, then you can generate a lead ad and allow them to say, hey, you know what, I'm interested. I'm gonna sign up for your newsletter. Or yes, I'm interested in your product or your future, any future giveaway or, or promotion you have to offer. Here, here's my email address, here's my name, here's my phone number. So lead ads are great for consideration because somebody knows your ad, they've likely engaged with you, they like what you have to say, and they're willing to take that next step and you can integrate your lead ads with third-party apps that's tied to your CRM. So, for example, Salesforce. Lead ads can sync up right with Salesforce, and then you can then follow up with that user at a later point. So that's consideration. So we have a lot of good options available to us under consideration. You know, we could drive traffic, uh, video views, app installs, just regular engagement, you know, and then we got lead gen. So we got a lot of opportunities for consideration. If you're really trying to target people who are already familiar with your brand or product or service. And then last, but certainly not least, we have messaging. So with messages, you know, these ads aim to convert a user's interest in a product to a successful sale or conversion. So it targets people who are more likely to respond through Messenger. So Facebook Messenger is a service that is integrated nicely in with Facebook. And so with Facebook Messenger, you know, you can communicate with that person directly just through Messenger. Okay, so it, it could be a chat bot or it can be a rep who can act as customer support or provide more information about the product or service. So you can use Messenger to your advantage. You can talk right away to somebody who is really interested in considering your product or service. So this is kind of the capstone of consideration because it takes into account one of Facebook's most popular features, which is Messenger, and allows you as an advertiser to use that feature to engage with your targeted audience directly. Let's turn our attention to the last objective, which is conversion. So under conversions, we have conversions, product catalog sales, and store visits. So for conversions, really, this is the end of the funnel. This is really the part of the funnel where we want people to take action. So ads related to the objective of conversions really aims to increase, you know, whatever the goal is of your website. So if it means signups or registrations for your services or sales or downloads or any desired action on your website, then that's the conversion. Okay, so that's what we're aiming to achieve when we are tying our ads to conversions. Okay, so you have conversions and you have 
you know, pure product product catalog sales. So for product catalog sales, these could be ads to help promote your e-commerce store or other products in your store portfolio, you know. So think of Amazon, think about all the products they have on their website, you know, they are probably likely going to choose, you know, product catalog sales because it, it really will help really push traffic to the store and really get somebody to convert either in a for a particular product or get them to look at other product categories and buy something there. So a really, really product catalog sales are really great for future campaigns when you're really looking for sales. And then we have store visits. And so store visits really help direct traffic to your location and really it helps deliver ads based on your user's current location. Okay, so if we really wanna get somebody to the store, if you have a brick and mortar store, for example, and then you can use store visits as your objective under conversions to really drive traffic to that location. So that's what store visits are. We really want people to, you know, take that next step, get to your store and check out your store and purchase. So that's what store visits are under con the conversions objective. So within each of these advertisement objectives, we can create split tests, also known as A-B testing. And the reason why we call it A-B testing because what you're doing is you're testing one variable from the other. So really you have two advertisements that really are the same, except the only difference is there's one thing that's altered from the other. So in this example, we have A with one promotion and then we have B, which is the same audience, same everything except a different promotion. So you're really changing one variable when you do a split test. And so that's available to Facebook, just like any other type of advertising. Let's say you do, you know, search advertising on Google, split testing's available. Let's say you do email marketing, split testing's available with subject clients. Facebook's no different. It allows split testing or allows you to use two versions of the same ad and able to change one of those parameters. So you can see really what ads performs best. That's the whole idea behind a split test. Okay, so if it's the original sales, sale of 25% off, then hey, so be it. You know it works because you tested it against another variation. And then the great thing about testing, it never ends. So if 25% off works over say $2,000 off, then you try something else to see if that will increase sales. That's the whole idea behind testing is you, only want, you always want to see what works. Okay. So really what it comes down to is it can be really, it could be a, a, a promotional offer or it could be something as simple as changing the call to action you know, a different color on the call to action. It could be anything you want to test as long as you're able to, you know, figure out what works and then apply what works so you can continue to improve your advertising. That's really the whole idea behind A-B testing. Okay, so it really is identifying an element you want to test. And then really once you identify that element, and you test it and you know what wins, then you can move on to other things to figure out what else works. So if you test at the promotion, then go on to the CTA. So you could test things like colors and call to actions and imaging and messaging and positioning. And you could play around with your target audience and test a segment of a target audience against another. So there's lots of things you could test when you A-B test. The most important thing to note though when you A-B test is you always wanna keep in mind what metric you wanna measure the test up against. So some of the metrics you could use are click-through rate, which is CTR, cost per click, CPC. You can use conversion rate, also known as CR, or just clicks. The whole idea is when you do a test and you're testing a promotional offer, or you're testing even the call to action, you need to measure that up against a metric. So that metric is what's gonna determine the winner. And so it doesn't have to be overly complicated. It can be as simple as testing, you know, one call to action against another and determining which one gets more clicks. And if one gets more clicks than the other, then hey, you know you have a winner. Okay, let's go through the steps of creating a new campaign on Facebook using Facebook's Ads Manager. 
So you're gonna log into facebook.com slash ads manager and you're just gonna click on the create new campaign button. And when you do that, you're gonna see a screen that looks just like this. And you're gonna go through a series of steps. So as we presented earlier, the first step is always choosing your objective. So we have awareness, consideration, and conversion. So recall that awareness was getting your brand out there to people who never seen your brand or product or service before. So it's a matter of trying to reach as many people as you can to get your brand out there. And so you have brand awareness or you have reach. Remember one is controlled, one is uncontrolled. Okay. So reach is a little bit more control because you could set your budget. Okay. And you can control your budget a little bit better. So brand awareness is just getting it out there, having Facebook plop it in front of uh, the ad in front of as many people as possible. Uh, with reach, you are trying to maximize how many people you show your ad to, but it is a little bit more controlled against the budget. Okay. Either way, choosing awareness is going to set the objective of trying to maximize your exposure for your brand, your product, or your service. Okay, if somebody has already seen your brand or somebody's already familiar with your product or your services, then you may want to choose the objective of consideration. And so these are people who, again, are already familiar, who you want to take that next step. Remember, Facebook is an environment where you're targeting a specific audience. So you're targeting people you know have likely seen your brand, product, or service. So you want them to take that next step. That's what you want them to do. Okay, so here, under consideration, we have traffic, engagement, app installs, video views, lead gen, or messages. All of these choices are getting somebody to do something for you. For example, app installs. You want them to install your app. Or engagement, you want them to like or share your post. Video views, watching your video or messaging. You want them to interact with you via Facebook's Messenger uh, feature. So all of these are interactions of some sort where somebody's taking that next step. They've seen your brand, they're interested, but you they're not ready, quite ready to purchase yet. Okay, so that's what consideration is. Then you have conversion. This is people in the funnel who you know or think you know want to convert and when I say think you know meaning you know you're really targeting people who you've targeted before who maybe has purchased from you before or is exactly the type of audience you're looking to purchase okay so you have conversions you have catalog sales and you have store traffic meaning driving foot traffic to a store okay so these are people further down the funnel who you don't necessarily want to take a smaller action like just share your Facebook post or provide their email address and name. Okay. So you want them to purchase. So these are three marketing objectives you're going to choose from. Okay. So we're just going to choose conversions for the sake of this example. And then when we go to choose conversions, remember we can create a AB split test. Okay, so that's a choice you should always choose because you always want to be testing something. Okay, in this case, we might want to test the ad. We might want to test, say, the call to action because we're looking for conversions. So it could be as simple as having one ad with a buy more and the other ad that says, hey, check out our website. So you have that option to A, B split test, and then you have budget optimization, which basically allows you to set your budget evenly across your different ads. Okay. And so what Facebook's going to do is basically make sure that the best performing ad is going to be seen more often. So that's budget optimization. You're maximizing your budget towards an ad or ads that you want to be able to have more control over in terms of what's working and what's not working versus not selecting this option. Your ads are just going to randomly show and there's not going to be any necessary control over how much spend each ad gets. So that's the first step in creating your campaign. It's always choosing your objective with a few options built in. So the next step in the process is ad set. Okay. And as you can see here, before you even get to ad set, what uh, Facebook is prompting us to do is look at basically how the A-B test is going to work. So here 
they're explaining how an A-B split test works, okay? So basically what an A-B split test does is serve up 50-50, the original versus a variation of the original, okay? So that's more or less how an A-B split test works. And so Facebook is doing us some good by showing us this messaging, okay? Because that's what we chose. Now, notice we chose conversion as our objective, okay? So what we're going to be required to do is put a conversion pixel on our website so that Facebook can actually track conversions. And so what we want people to do is purchase. And so what we need to do then is add a Facebook pixel to our website so that Facebook can actually track how many people purchase from your campaign. So this is very important. And so if you're driving traffic to your website and you want them to convert, then you need to make sure all the tracking's in place. So the next step in setting up your ads is setting up an offer. So if you have an offer that you wanna provide, go ahead and select on, because the default is set to off, okay? What you could do is you can associate it with your particular uh, company page on Facebook, and then you're gonna create your offer. So I'm gonna put my offer title, I'm gonna put a little bit more details in there. I can put an end date when the offer expires and a specific time. So based on what you put, this is what people is going to see with the ad. And here you have the redemption section where you can have people redeem the offer online or online and in store. So if it's online, you need to provide Facebook with a URL where people can go and redeem that that promotion, that offer. And then you have a chance, an opportunity to add a particular code. So you don't necessarily have to have a code with your offer. It could be a one-time code or it can be a unique code, okay, or unique codes, okay. And then you have an advanced option here. And this advanced option is pretty important because if you're setting up an offer and you only want a specific number of people to see that offer, then and you don't want them to share that offer, then what you could do is hide the share option. So that way people won't be able to share the promotion with friends or family or whatnot. Now they could still copy and paste the link of the offer, but they won't be able to easily do it with the share option. And uh, here you can put some terms and conditions. Okay. So that's the offer, okay? And it's pretty intuitive in the wizard. My recommendation is you should always put out an offer to get people to, you know, again, your objective is to get people to convert. So an offer always helps incentivize conversions. Okay, here we have our variable because we're testing, we're split testing, okay? So here we're, we're choosing what we wanna split test. So if we choose creative, basically what we're doing is we're telling Facebook we want to test our creative. Or ad. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to select the audience. And so we could choose a custom audience, a lookalike, or all. So here you can see we have a lookalike. And a lookalike basically is, basically what Facebook does is they're trying to find people who are very similar to your customers. Okay, so that's who you want to target. People who look like your customers on Facebook. Okay. So you could choose a lookalike audience, or you could choose a custom audience if you already have one. So we're gonna create a new custom audience here. And basically what we want them to do is website traffic. And we're just gonna call it website traffic. And basically it's gonna be all website visitors. Okay, so we're gonna create this audience here. So we've done that and basically now what we're trying to do is we're trying to tell Facebook, okay, if our audience is all website visitors, where are those visitors gonna come from? So we wanna choose a location. So it could be everyone in a particular location, everyone who lives in a particular location or recently in the location or traveling in a location. Okay, so here you can see we have it set to United States, but we can always change that. So you can really pick and choose areas or cities and even exclude areas. You can even upload locations in bulk. So if you have a specific set of locations, you can upload that. After you choose your location, you're then gonna choose your age. So here you have 
if you look all the way down to 13 years of age, and then your range goes all the way up to 65 years of age. Then we have our gender. We can choose both men and women or just men and just women. And then we can target a specific language. If we want to target Spanish people or people who speak Spanish, then we can choose Spanish. Notice we can add multiple languages. Okay, so if we want to do some specific targeting, for example, we can do interest or specific behavior. So if I click suggestions, then for example, Facebook's going to offer us up some suggestions. So if we want to target people who have an interest in foreign language or charity and causes or mindfulness, or it could be specific job titles. Okay, so we can get really detailed with our targeting. We also have connections. So who do we want to target? So are these people who like our page, who are friends of people who like our page? We can also exclude people who like our page. Okay, so remember, your advertising is tied to a Facebook page. However, you could still drive that traffic to your website. But what Facebook does is once you connect your ad or your campaign to a Facebook page, then they have an idea of the profile, then they have an idea of what type of community you have on Facebook. Okay, so that really helps them offer you more detailed targeting in the form of connections. Okay, so when we're done, we could save the audience. So I'm just gonna name it uh, English and Spanish, click save. Okay, now I have my audience saved. And the important thing here is that this audience is saved, we can use it at a later date, or if we're setting up a new campaign, we can pull from the same audience under use a saved audience. So if I just type in English and Spanish, you'll see my audience here. Okay, and we can always edit it if we need to. Okay, so next is the placements section. So here, placements is where we wanna show our ads, okay? So we want to be able to place our ads in the proper placement. And so what Facebook does is they actually recommend you do an auto placement. And so Facebook will, based on your audience, show your ad in different spots or different placements throughout Facebook based on the people you're trying to target, the audience. Okay, so in this case, we're targeting both Spanish and English, okay? And we're targeting 13 to 65 year olds who live in the United States. And so what Facebook's going to do then, because we have automatic placement set up, is they're going to be able to place our ads based on our target audience. So this is an option I always uh, recommend you do, and Facebook recommends as well. If you're specific about where you want your ad to be placed, then you can just select edit placements. And notice when you select edit placements here, you have different options. Not only on Facebook, but on Instagram as well, okay? and Facebook's network and in Facebook Messenger. So you have all these different options available to you if you really want your, your ad placed in a specific position. So here, if I just scroll over here, I can see what it looks like in a feed, in stream video. I can scroll down to Instagram. That's what it looks like in a feed on Instagram. Okay, uh, you have Instagram stories. If I wanna go and advertise on Facebook Messenger, then I have some options here in Messenger Inbox or Sponsored Messages. Okay, so you have a lot of options available under Edit Placements, meaning picking your placement specifically. But again, I recommend, as does Facebook, just go with the recommended placements for now. Unless you're really clear and you really understand how Facebook works and where these placements are actually going to be. But remember, if you choose edit placements and place it in a specific position, let's just say on Messenger inbox, remember your audience may not be there. So going with the automatic placements, you know, is a way for Facebook to help you get your ad in front of the right audience. Here, the next section, delivery optimization. Okay, how much of our ads are optimized and delivered? So Remember, we chose conversions here, so we're gonna optimize our ads for conversions. So what Facebook's going to do is take into account each conversion that each ad is getting. And they're going to show that ad that's getting more conversions more often than the ads that aren't getting as many conversions. Okay, so they're optimizing the ad delivery based on 
how many conversions each ad gets. And there's an option in here as well. So you can put a cost control in place. So you have an average cost per purchase. Okay, so Facebook will aim to get the most purchases and spend your entire budget. Okay, if you put in an average cost per purchase. So for example, if I'm selling t-shirts, I may not want my average cost per purchase to be $20 because I'm not going to make any money. So I'm probably going to choose maybe two, three, four, even as high as $5 on a cost per purchase because I want to make sure I'm not spending a lot of money just to get a purchase. So you have that option available to you to put in as a cost control. And here we have a conversion window. And so what this conversion window is going to do is, you know, help Facebook optimize your ads a little bit better based on the number of conversions that happen in this window. Okay, so you have some other options in here. You want to do standard delivery, uh, ad scheduling. You can run your ads on a schedule or you can run them all the time. Okay, and then moving down to the next option in our ad set is we have split test and uh, split test budget and schedule. So we have the opportunity to put a budget in place for our ads, okay? And we can schedule the, the, the A-B test to start running immediately if we want to, or we can have the A-B test run at a specific date, and we can have it run for a specific period of time. So this goes all the way back to the first option, where we chose A, B split test on step one. So we have a series of options available to us for the split test. Okay, once we have all our options in place, okay, we're gonna click continue. And then the final step is actually setting up our ads. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're going to name our ad, in this case, ad A. Okay, it's gonna be tied to a Facebook page. It's gonna be tied to an Instagram account. And then we could choose the format of our ad. So remember, we have a lot of different options available to us on Facebook. We have the carousel, which allows us to have multiple images scrolling horizontally. We can have that single image ad. We can have a video. We can have a collection of images. So we have a lot of options available to us. And then what we could do is we can link up our ad to a specific page. Okay. Now, before we do that, we want to be able to upload our images. Okay. So we're going to manually choose images, videos, and links. Okay. And then we're going to add some text to support that image. Okay. And so when we add text in for our ad, we have the option of setting up a headline. Actually, it's not an option. It's actually mandatory. The description is actually optional. Okay. But my recommendation is you want to add a headline that's going to grab attention and you want to add a description to support that headline. So I always recommend putting in a description. And then once you do that, you're going to add your destination URL and then you're going to be able to preview your ad. Okay. So if we have an image here, okay, we can just say, hey, this come check out our new product. And so as I add this information, I'll be able to view it on the right side. Okay, so it looks like Facebook at this point is not able to view the image, but normally you're able to see a preview. In this case, it's on the mobile news feed. So if we drop down, we can see desktop right column. Okay, so we need to really choose our images. So we're going to change an image here. Let's see if I can choose another image. Okay, I'm going to choose an image here. And so now I could see the image. Now I could see the headline. Um, and, and then I could see what it looks like just by changing the placement. Okay, so if I want to choose Facebook stories, whoops, that's not available. If I go to, for example, instant articles, okay, here I can see what my ad looks like on instant articles. So it wasn't available on certain placements because of the type of ad we chose. But the point being, when you set up your ad and you choose your image and you write your headline and put your destination URL in, then you'll be able to preview it on certain placements, depending on what type of ad you chose. Okay, once you're set, once you're set up, and remember, we're setting up 
A, B testing. So that was add one. Now we want to test the second add or the variation. And so basically what we want to do is choose the same type of format. And then what we want to do is pick a variation. What is that variation going to be? It could be maybe just a different headline, okay? Or it could be a different URL. You need to decide what it is you're going to test, okay? Once you decide what you test, you're going to add that to variation B. Once you add that to variation B, then you have both ads set up. Once you confirm, Facebook is going to confirm for you whether the ads meet their criteria. Okay, and if it doesn't, in this case, you could see we have some errors, then we need to go back and fix them. So I'm gonna go back and choose single image ad. Okay, so now I could just choose my one image. So I can browse a library of images I already have. Now here's my single image ad. I'm gonna add some text in there, a website URL, a headline. Remember, you want it to be catchy, okay? You can change the call to action here. Okay, you can add multiple languages. So you have a lot of options depending on the type of format you choose. So remember, we chose A-B test, so we're going to set up both ads, ad A and ad B. Okay, and when we do that, again, we can have Facebook review it. Once they review it, we, they can confirm. They, you can see we still have some errors on ad A, so let's go ahead and fix that. I'm going to choose single image because that's what ad B is. I'm going to browse my library. Maybe I'll just test a different image. I'm going to click continue. And so basically keep everything the same. What I'll test is maybe the image. So you have to go into an A-B test knowing what it is you want to test ahead of time. Okay, once you do that, you're going to go ahead and continue to add B. And then once you do that, um, here, let's go ahead and fix this error here. Um, the link field. So let's just go ahead and put a link in there. Continue to add B. Once I confirm, then I have two ads ready to go on specific placements or excuse me, automatic placements in this option is that's the option we chose. And basically the ads are set to optimization against conversions. We have a set budget and we're going to be able to then once our ads go live is look at some reports to see how they're performing. So that's the steps in setting up a campaign on Facebook. You're choosing your objective, okay? Then you're setting up your ad set, okay? And then once you set up your ad set with your target audience, then you're actually going through the motions. In this case, we set up two ads because we chose A-B testing, okay? And if you didn't choose A-B testing, then you would just choose to set up the first ad. And once you do that, you confirm and voila, your campaign is set up based on these three steps. Choose from over 300 in-demand skills and get access to 1000 plus hours of video content for free. Visit Skill Up by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. Okay, so let's uh, review with some do's and don'ts of Facebook. So we mentioned the types of ad that Facebook has. We mentioned how to set up a Facebook ad itself and choosing the right uh, objectives. And so some of the do's involved are what just what I mentioned. We always want to do A-B testing on our ads, whether that's, again, just changing out the color or changing out an image. You always want to do A-B testing. Because Facebook has, you know, carousel ads and because they have, you know, ads that can rotate and you can use even video with your ads, you always want to take advantage of what's given to you. And so Facebook allows you to do it, do it. So if you have the opportunity to have a video ad, then use the video ad. Highly recommend it. Remember, video ads have higher engagement. So definite do is use engaging videos and imagery. So you don't necessarily have to use a static ad or image ad. You can use the carousel, for example, or the presentation mode where you could show multiple images to really showcase your product and service. So with all the advertising that you do, you always want to align your messaging. So use a message that will stay with the audience. 
Okay, so use something that's going to be able to trigger. Remember, it depends on the funnel and where you're at. So if your awareness or consideration or conversion, that has to align with your messaging. So if you're, you know, targeting ads, you know, and you want people to convert, then your message is going to be as such. You're going to talk to people as if you want them to convert, as if they're ready to convert. And you want to keep your message consistent and simple. So remember the ads are available to you and you have so many different features available to you within those ads, but that doesn't mean you got to convolute it with messaging. So keep your message just consistent and simple. If it's brand awareness, you know, definitely keep your message simple so that people can understand exactly what it is your product or service is all about. Then you want to alter your reach so that the ads are shown to the appropriate audience. Okay, so you always want to keep in mind who you're trying to target. Okay, so you don't want to target somebody who's not in your demographic. So alter your reach so that the ads are shown to the appropriate audience. Remember, you have, you know, reach available to you and reach allows you to really pick and choose exactly who you're targeting to and how often. Remember, you want to reach as many people as possible, but you don't want to reach the wrong people. Okay, some of the don'ts to stay, some things you want to stay away from is you don't want to put all your money on one campaign. So you want to separate out your budget, allocate your budget across different campaigns. And I would even take that a step further and you know put different types of ads in different campaigns just to see what works. So again, it depends on where you're at in the funnel. If it's just brand awareness, okay, maybe create a campaign for that. If it's consideration, create a campaign for that because in consideration, you might have lead ads in there. I say with the awareness campaign, you may just have a single image ad, okay, just to introduce your product to somebody with a simple message. So you want to, you know, definitely think about how you want to separate out your campaigns, but don't be afraid to separate your campaigns by the type of ads. Don't put too much information in the ads. Remember, keep it consistent and keep it simple. That's the best thing I could say. And remember, a lot of these ads are image based. So images tell a thousand words. They tell a thousand stories. A video will do the job if you have to say too much. So if you're saying too much, think about a video. But if you're using an image, let the image tell the story. Okay. Don't forget to proofread your ads. I can't stress that enough. Remember, if you're an awareness campaign, this is the first time somebody's seen your product or service. So you definitely want to get the messaging not only correct, meaning consistent and simple, but grammatically correct. You don't want to be so active on your Facebook page. So, you know, when I say being, don't be so active on your Facebook page, really, it depends on where you're at. You're trying to introduce a product or service. So that doesn't mean that you need to go out and tell everybody to start buying your product. Remember, these people may not even know who you are, what product and service you offer. So you want to be able to approach your audience on your Facebook page in a manner which is suitable for your audience. And then have an image that doesn't correspond to the product being advertised. So you, you want to be able to, you know, have an image that does correspond. So if you're targeting a specific audience with a specific product, then make sure the image on your Facebook page aligns with that. Okay, don't be inconsistent. Don't confuse the audience. You know, be consistent with your imagery as well as your messaging. Okay, so those are some of the don'ts. You things you want to stay away from when you're advertising. Today we're going to cover a number of tips to help you gain a better advantage on advertising on Facebook. So let's get right to it with tip number one. And with tip number one, not all advertisements need to sell something. So remember, you have different objectives on Facebook. You can advertise an event, you can promote a customer story, you can send traffic to your website, or you can get them to download an app. So it all goes back to your objective. So if we go to Facebook and I want to create an ad, Remember, my first option is to create an objective. So you have awareness, you have consideration, you have conversion. So depending on what you want somebody to do, that's the objective you're going to choose. So just keep that in mind when you're setting up your campaign on Facebook. 
You need to align your objective with what you want people to do. So tip number two, we want to use Facebook Messenger for advertising. So Facebook Messenger is a feature that can be used with advertising on Facebook. And it's a good tool, it's a good practice because it allow you to, as the advertiser, to commute with individuals directly. So it's a feature that you should take advantage of because it allows you to quickly engage with your target audience. So that's the beauty of leveraging Facebook Messenger with your advertising. The communication tool is available and for you to engage with your target audience. So it's great for not only interacting, but taking care of any other objections that they have as an, as an audience or prospective client. So you can answer any concerns they have right away. So it's a lot more personal and interactive than other forms of advertising because you're directly communicating with your audience. Tip three, use video advertisements. I can't stress this enough, video is very engaging. In fact, it's not only engaging, but it's very easy to use. So if we go to Facebook, really, Facebook is telling us for video, all we need to do is have basically a phone handy and an app and just to be able to upload it. So with Facebook video, you can really drive awareness and you can really drive sales. I mean, you can really make some really splashy videos on Facebook. All you need is a mobile camera. So with Facebook videos, it's really very easy to create. You just got to be creative. That's really the key to videos. You know they're going to be engaging to the end user. Say something, do something that's going to really grab their attention and get them to do what you want them to do. So these are just some of the examples you can see on Facebook and you can see how creative advertisers are getting. You know, clear call to action, great video or great imagery, good promotional use. So there's a lot you can do with video and really make it interactive. So I can't can't stress video enough as an option for Facebook. It really is one of the better features with Facebook advertising and really very limited use of resources. All you need is that web camera, an app, and the ability to upload that video. That's really it for video advertisements. So keep in mind, and the reason why I'm harping on those video ads is they tend to outperform your traditional Facebook image ads in other formats like the carousel or the presentation mode. So there's other types of formats on Facebook, video tends to give it that extra edge because it's very interactive. And in the form of interactivity comes engagement. So in this example, you know, people are going to react, they're going to comment, they're going to share the video. And that's what you want as an advertiser. You want to grab as much reach as possible towards your target audience. And so video will help you do that. It'll help you not only engage with the person, but allow that video to be shared and expand your reach towards your target audience. So remember, video can range from a few seconds all the way up to 120 minutes. So you're really going to get more views regardless of how long the video is because it's just going to be so interactive. So just keep that in mind. It doesn't have to be full on 120 minutes. It could be, you know, anywhere from one to five minutes. You know, to me, that's probably a good range, but just know that you have that lead way if you wanted to. So remember, video ads always perform better than single image ads or other type of image ad formats on Facebook. And they also perform better when they have subtitles support so just keep that in mind as well because you may have you know individuals watching the video from you know different countries speaking different languages say so tip four when you're placing your advertisement where you place your advertising will play an important role in deciding how many people come across it so Facebook offers a number of different options to choose from so remember you got the news feed you got instant articles right column you got suggested videos so you got a lot of options at your disposal there's lots of other options too. So you can have Facebook actually automatically place your ads or you can specifically tell Facebook where you want to place your ads. And that's all part of the Facebook setup. So if we go to Facebook and then we go to create your campaign. So if we close ad set, here is where we're going to be able to choose our placement. If we click on choose placement, we'll be able to, you know, be able to allow Facebook to place it or we can edit the placement specifically. So just just keep that in mind. You have a lot of different options here. Again, feeds, instant articles, in-stream videos, you got Rycom, you even have Instagram. So you have a lot of options available to you. So my recommendation and Facebook's recommendation
recommendation is always go with the auto placement, but you could specifically choose your placement if you want to when you're setting up your campaign. So start the advertising on the news feed could be recommended. The news feed is where you're probably going to get your most eyeballs. Most users spend most of their time there and it has the highest chance of grabbing their attention. So the news feed could be a good place to start. Again, you can have it at auto placement and your ads may be there as well, or you could specifically choose just the news feed or other placements. So tip four, just be careful where you place your ad. It's really important. You want to place your ad where you're going to get eyeballs. So tip five, Facebook ads also offer you the option to advertise on Instagram. So you have that option available to you. As I mentioned in tip four, you have the option to advertise through stories, carousel ads, photo ads, and video ads. So again, that's all part of the ad setup. When you go to choose your placements, here you got Instagram feed, you get Instagram stories. And again, with both of those placements on Instagram, you can work with several different types of ads, including that carousel ad, including that video ad. So just keep that in mind that Instagram is an option for you. Take advantage of it. There's a lot more eyeballs on Instagram Instagram these days and it plays off nicely with what you're trying to do with Facebook so go ahead and give it a try okay so let's take a quick break from the first few tips we went over and let's take a look at an ad so it's an ad break time so let's take a look at this ad. And this is by new scientist and so what makes this ad so great well there's been a lot of shakeup in the world today about fake news. You know, what is fake news? So New Scientist is actually playing off of that. They're mentioning, hey, fake news, not in our world. So they're actually playing off of that, that term fake news. And so that's an attention grabber. So I think that's what makes this look so good. But this is a single image ad. And you can see here, they're promoting this ad with a promotion. So try 12 weeks for just 36 euros. Okay, so they have a promotion in there so and you notice they the image of the you know the magazine they're also displaying that hey you can look at this digitally on a laptop a tablet or a mobile phone so you have other options as well so they show you that in the image which is placed on the right side of their messaging so for me this is a good ad because of the placement of the image the type of image they're using the play on fake news and the promotion that they're offering up so this is really a good ad it's very eye-catching and hopefully the promotion is good enough to get you to sign up okay so tip number six so tip number six we want to continuously do a B testing you want to always have this option going for you You want to be able to test variation a versus variation B because you want to be able to find out what works and what doesn't work with your audience and on top of that it helps you really put your best foot forward by showing your best ad so by doing a b testing you're getting feedback from the audience and turning that feedback into positive returns so you're then turning your ad that does work well in front of an audience and you're going to continue to do that so a b testing is always a good option so remember when you're setting up your ad in facebook go ahead and choose to have your a b test set up and when you do that you choose that option you're going to be able to then go in and choose what it is you want to test with ad a and then with ad b so you're going to again align your test with a facebook page you're going to choose an ad format once you choose your ad format then you're going to be able to go ahead and you know put your ad in there and then you're going to choose your call to action so the whole idea behind an a b test is you want to be able to find what it is you want to test is that going to be the call to action? Is it going to be the messaging? Is it going to be the ad format? So there are lots of things you can test with Facebook on A-B testing. So it's all part of the ad setup. So things you can change again are the color of the elements, imaging, text, the call to action, the position of the ad. There's lots of things you could test. That's all part of the Facebook setup. So the thing is you want to continuously test. That's the key. Continuously test certain elements of an ad. So testing can be done initially on broader elements and then smaller finer details like statements in your ad copy so my advice is when you're actually sending this up on Facebook you know think ahead think what it is you want to choose to test 
My advice is maybe start out with a call to action. So if you're in Facebook itself, you know you have an opportunity to test different call to action. Try that. That's an easy way to test. And then, you know, when you test the call to action, once you find out what works and doesn't work, then you can move on to something more sophisticated, like maybe the image type, or maybe trying different types of imagery or ad types, like the carousel versus single image. So start small, start easy, and then work your way up. Tip number seven. So we want to choose an appropriate call to action in your advertisements that will attract potential customers. So what do we mean? Well, you have different call to actions available to you. You want to choose one that aligns with your ad. So for example, the Simply Learn ad about, hey, learn how SEO works, search engine optimization. So if you're trying to get somebody to you know, learn or take one of your courses, you're not asking them to actually shop now, you really want them to sign up. So that's the key, we want them to sign up. So use a call to action that makes sense. Tip number eight, choose the right audience for your advertisement. Okay, so what do we mean? So for this, you can consider, you know, website visits, interests. It all depends on your objective. Okay, what is it you want people to do? If it's, you know, customers in the buying process, then that's our objectives to get conversions. Then we want to move somebody over to a product page and get them to purchase. You know, if it's focusing on just website visits, then maybe it's the objective of consideration. Maybe you just want to get people to your website to learn more about your product. So that's the whole idea behind, you know, choosing uh, the right, you know, objective because uh, you want to align the objective with your ad. Okay, so tip number nine create look-alike audiences. And I like look-alike audience because what Facebook does is they create an audience that's similar to the audience you already advertising to or customer base you already have. So in other words, Facebook already has an idea of who your audience is. You can also you know, provide them with additional information like an email list to give them a better sense of who your audience is. And then what Facebook does is they take that information and they'll put your ad in front of an audience that looks just like the audience you already have. That's why they call it a look-alike audience. So it's a great feature by Facebook. It really allows you to reach a target audience, an audience that's very similar to the audience you currently have. In one example, provide Facebook with an email list. With that email list, they're gonna be able to map that email list and be able to identify an audience that you could target. So that's the whole idea behind lookalike audience. It's a great feature by Facebook. Definitely recommend taking advantage of that. Why? Because it will increase the number of people who will find your advertisement relevant. Remember, you're targeting people who are similar to your actual audience, to your the people who are already connected with your brand or are already liking your page. So if they're similar to those people, then the chances of them engaging with you are gonna be greater. So lookalike audiences tend to perform well because you're targeting an audience that's very similar to your actual audience. Tip number 10, so use the golden point rule on your ad creative. So what do we mean by golden point rule? Well, let's take this ad here as an example. So what we want to do is we want to divide the creative into nine equally sized boxes. So what we want to do is draw two horizontal lines and two vertical lines, just like a tic-tac-toe box. And so ideally what we want to do is place the main subject of your ad in the cross sections of the drawn lines. And so what that does is encourages the user to place their focus on those points. The lines are just simply there as a guidance to help you position your messaging. So that's the golden point rule really, is we wanna be able to position our messaging accordingly. So time for another ad break. So let's take a look at another ad here on Facebook. And this one's by Blue Apron. And so of all the tips we've talked about, this particular ad takes into account a lot of them, okay? So this is, again, they're using multiple images in this ad here. So again, what they're doing, promotion, they're offering up a $30 off promotion here. And what they're asking you to do is sign up to get that $30 off. So you could see the call to action. We already mentioned that on one of our tips. The call to action matches the ad, so they're asking you to sign up. They're using really good imagery here, and they're supporting that with, you know, some good copy and text. 
So this is what makes this ad so good. I mean, who doesn't like good looking food or tasty food and healthy food? Okay, so they're definitely taking advantage of the imagery with a promotion and with a good call to action. And so remember, we want to A-B test. So Blue Apron is likely testing this ad. So what they could do with this is test different imagery or they could test a different promotion. So there's a lot they can do here on the A-B testing side. So for me, if I were to test this, yeah, I would probably be testing the imageries because we want to be able to see what images get people to sign up. Alternatively, we can also test the offer as well. What offer is going to get somebody to click on that sign up button? So ideally, there's a lot to do here from the A-B test standpoint and the way they've structured this ad, it makes it very easy to test. So that's what makes this ad really good is shows good imagery, has a good promotion, and aligns the CTA. Tip number 11. So we want to place the product in the right hand of your creative. So the right side should contain our product imagery. So why is that? Why? Because there's been a study called the Perceived Product Heaviness and Package Evaluation, and that states that depending on where a product is placed, users would react differently to it. And so the study found that users tend to react more positively when the product is placed on the right side of the ad creative. So here you can see Countdown to Black Friday. This is an Amazon related ad. And you can see the product is basically a, a litter box, which is placed on the right side. So it's a Black Friday ad. They didn't place the image on the left side. They placed it on the right side because people tend to react positively when the product image is on the right side. So keep that in mind when you're placing your imagery. Try to place it on the right side. Tip number 12, don't use images that have more than 20% text, okay? So you want to use images that are clean. Remember that blue apron image we looked at? And that was a very clean image of food. No text overlaying the image. So we want to try and stay away from images that have text on the overlay. Okay, so there's no limit to how much text you can add to your creative. But you know, Facebook and myself recommend, hey, the lesser text you have, the more likely it is for your ad to have its desired impact, meaning somebody's going to click on that ad. Okay, so keep that in mind. Let the image do the talking for you. You don't necessarily need to overwhelm the image with words or messages. Tip number 13. So we want to use an ad creative that's attention grabbing and is relevant for your business. So again, going back to that blue apron ad, hey, who doesn't like good looking food, good looking healthy food, green food? Well, Switching gears, we're looking at a Nike ad. Who doesn't like a good looking shoe here? This is a good running shoe and Nike is definitely taking advantage of the opportunity to place the shoe against a nice looking background. So here the image on the left, you got a nice mauve looking color, the shoe on the right on a nice red background to kind of really play into the color of the shoe. And so that's attention grabbing. So the colors kind of match and go with one another and it tends to grab your attention. So Nike's doing a good job here of just not showing an image of a shoe. Really what they're doing is put the shoe as the central focal point and supporting that with additional color. And they're really putting the messaging kind of as the background behind the shoe. So they're making it as attention grabbing as possible here. So Nike's done a good job with this ad. You know, me personally, I'm not the biggest Nike fan when it comes to shoes, but hey, this ad definitely grabbed my attention because now I could see, you know, this shoe is really popping to me. We don't want to use clip art in your ad creative, okay? And don't use low resolution pixelated images as well. We want to use high quality imagery. So, and use images that are well lit. You know, natural lighting always tends to work well as, as well. So when you're doing a placement for a product, whether that be food or shoe, you could see here in this plated example, they're putting it on the right image, they're putting it in a natural environment, on a table, on a plate, with some paper next to it, you know, and then you could see the one on the left, it's of a person holding a box with the image of plated on it. And so to me, that's not stock imagery or clip art. 
you know, that's an actual person holding the product. So it's real life. You want to make it as real life as possible and as clear and quality as possible. So when you create attention grabbing ads, you know, show images of people benefiting from your product instead of just having the product itself. So that's always a good idea. In the case of Coca-Cola, you know, these people are enjoying their bottle of Coca-Cola. Well, going back to the Nike ad, you know, they could have had a person wearing that shoe or, you know, running with that shoe. That could have been an alternative for them as well. So the whole idea is just make sure your ads are attention getting and they grab your attention. And if you're going to use people, make sure the person's enjoying it. Just like on the previous image, the person holding the box. We could see she's got a smile on her face and she is enjoying holding that box. So to me, you want to use people with the images to the best of your ability. And that means use that person who's enjoying it. So that's really going to put the product in the forefront. Okay, tip 14, don't hesitate to experiment with your advertisements creative or its copy. Okay, so what do we mean by that? Really, we want to be refreshing our text. We want to be refreshing our images. Okay, so if you're going to place an ad on Facebook, don't let that be the only ad. Okay, if you're using a single image ad, you know, feel free to change out that single image from time to time, especially if a lot of people have seen that ad. So if you're using reach as your objective, and you're trying to reach as many people as possible, just keep in mind that if that ad is reaching the same people over and over again, it's gonna get stale and you wanna be able to update that ad. So feel free to change out the imagery. Changing out the text is just as easy, okay? So feel free to play around with the text. Even if you're not doing A-B testing, you can always change out the text just to see, hey, if changing out the text actually gets you better engagement or meets your goals. Tip 15, plan your campaigns for the holiday season, okay? So can't state this enough, you know, towards you know, October, November, December, there tends to be a lot of holidays, you know, across multiple religions. Okay, so it's really the time of year where people are in full ad mode and audiences are in full watch mode. So advertisers are really pushing ads that time of year, especially Christmas, you know, and people are accepting of that because they're used to it. So you want to be able to plan accordingly. So if you're doing your ads, you can easily engage with your audience if you're aligning your ad with that time of year. So during Christmas, most people are in the mood for shopping. So it's a time of year where you can really, really, really take advantage of increasing your sales, increasing your conversions. So you want to plan accordingly. And so if you're planning, you know, months in advance, you don't have to do a full year. But you know, for me, if I'm thinking I'm going to do a lot of advertising during the holiday season, I'm probably going to go out maybe once summer ends, probably August beginning of September. Beginning of September, seasons change a little. I might start thinking about the holiday season. And when you can plan appropriately, you can come out with really good ads. You can think about what you want to say. And so in this case, you know, Target, this particular ad is really promoting Black Friday. So Black Friday is the day after Thanksgiving in the United States. And so here, they're letting you know Black Friday's here and there's deals to be had. So planning in advance gives you an opportunity to really, really tweak your messaging and come up with some good creative ideas. So let's take another break and let's look at another good looking ad. This example, we're gonna look at Dell. Okay, so Dell, I've seen their ads all over Facebook. They do a lot of different advertising types between videos, carousels, and this is a single image ad. What they're really trying to do is get you over to the storefront so you can buy one of these good looking, you know, Dell computers. Okay, so, you know, here, again, they're promoting their latest computer, the Dell Inspirian 3000 series, all in one desktop. So, to them, anytime they create a new product, they're gonna go ahead and put out a new ad for that product. And here, they're putting a little bit of a different twist on it. 
If you notice the ad itself, it's just the image of the product. There's really no promotion here. They're letting the product image speak for itself. They're really showing you, hey, look how good this computer looks. You know, this is our new model and you know, we got a shop now CTA. So if you're interested, go ahead and click on that shop now. So they're really putting the effort into the image itself. You know, they're not offering any promotion, you know, no discounts. You know, what you see is what you get with the image and you click on it, you're gonna go right to their storefront. So Dell does a good job of really, you know, cranking out their new products whenever they go to market. So tip 16, shorten the amount of time between retargeting your audience. So target people have visited your website within the span of a month or two weeks. So retargeting is reaching out to people who you've already engaged with. So if somebody has seen your ad or somebody's went to your website, somebody's even purchased from you before, you have the opportunity to reach back out to that person. So how often you reach out to that person or how long between their initial engagement and when you retarget them really does depend on what it is you're selling. So if you're selling a pair of shoes, if you're Nike, then chances are if somebody's looking for a pair of shoes, it's not gonna be a long purchase window, meaning they're not gonna wait two, three months. So so if I'm Nike and somebody's seen my ad, I'm probably gonna target that person in a short period of time for retargeting. So it really depends on your product, but you don't wanna wait too long between the time they've been get initially engaged and the time you retarget. So it really depends on your product. You know, again, if you're selling merchandise, you know, retail, it's probably gonna be a smaller time frame. If you're Dell computers, you know, that's a bigger purchase. Somebody's gonna take their time. So, you know, you wanna target people, you know, for their Dell computer, probably, you know, over a longer period of time. Okay, so just keep the product in mind. You don't wanna wait too long. You don't wanna keep it too short. So you wanna find that nice balance of when you could retarget someone. Okay, tip number 17, keep altering the hook of your ad copy. What do we mean by altering the hook? So here you can see a couple of different options. Option one, you know, we're talking about, hey, if you're interested in getting some DMCA certification, you know, this is what you need to do. Option two, little bit different of a hook. Hey, start your journey to get your DMCCA certification. So, you know, just altering the way you're trying to talk to somebody is really what we're, we're after here on tip number 17. You have an ad, especially the text. Remember, we always wanna refresh that copy, but if you're testing it, try different hooks, try different ways to talk to people, okay? It always works well when you can have different types of messaging because people react to different messages. So an effective strategy would be to create multiple ads with different hooks and see what performs best. So this is an option for A-B testing. Okay, you have an option to add messaging. Go ahead and talk one way in one option and then you know tweak that messaging, tweak that hook a bit in option B and see what resonates with people. So that's a good option for A-B testing is always you know look at the way you're going to try and you know get somebody to convert. Tip number 18, okay, respond to lead ad responses as soon as possible. So remember one of your ad formats is a lead ad. Okay, so if you have a lead ad, basically what you're asking somebody to do is add their name, their phone number, and their email. If you get that information, don't sit on it, react to it. Just like the messaging, the Facebook Messenger, how it's almost instantaneous. Think of the lead ads the same way, okay? You have somebody who's engaging with your ad by providing information. You don't wanna sit on it, you wanna respond as soon as possible. In fact, you know, when you do engage with that person, let them know you're available on Facebook Messenger so they can actually then reach out to you via Facebook Messenger just to expedite the communication. But when you get that valuable information from the customer, you know, respond as soon as possible. It's good customer service. Because the longer you take to respond, the less likely the customer will want to continue interacting with you. So there's no real good rule of thumb here, except for do it as soon as possible. Okay, tip number 19, add scarcity to your advertisements. So what do we mean by that? Well, in this example, we could see the top 100 registrations get free access. So by putting this into your ad copy, we're hoping your prospects are more inclined to buy your product due to that fear that they're not gonna be one of the first 100 registrations, okay? So it allows you to really put some sense of urgency 
in the ad to get somebody to react. So that's what we mean by, you know, scarcity. Okay, so by doing so, it could affect the long-term credibility. You know, we don't want to come across as fear-mongering by any means, but hey, if your promotion is the first 100 registrations, get free access, then why not? You know, go ahead and put it in there. Some other examples could be, you know, only three days left to register or first 50 get 50% off or, you know, hurry now, there's only two days left. So there's other language you can put. So play around with the language. But if you only have certain slots available or a certain amount of days left, there's nothing wrong with putting that in the ad copy to get people to react. And so that's the whole idea behind, you know, the scarcity is you want to be able to let people know, hey, there's a limited edition going on here. If you're interested, go ahead and take advantage. Tip number 20, keep track of your ad relevance score. So your ads do get scored. So the score ranges from one to 10, okay? So what that score does is it's an indicator to signify the quality and engagement levels. So, you know, if your score is between one and six, then the ad isn't reaching the relevant audience and your audience isn't reacting to it. However, if your relevant score is between seven and 10, then your ads are reaching the appropriate audience and you're getting a lot of interaction. So keep an eye on that. You know, the lower the number, that means, hey, we're not get, our ad's not getting to the right audience. And if it's not getting to the right audience, our audience isn't gonna react to it. So it all starts with making sure you're reaching your audience with your ad. When your ad is reaching your audience and you're doing A-B testing, your audience is gonna react to one one of those two ads. So that's always going to help your relevant score. So keep an eye on that relevant score. Okay, so let's take another break here and let's take a look at an ad here by Blue Bottle Coffee. Okay, so I'm a big coffee drinker myself. I frequent Blue Bottle in San Francisco a lot. And so here, this is a nice image, a nice close up image of coffee. And I really like this. Notice there's really no call to action here. Okay, so they're putting their website URL, the domain, bluebottlecoffee.com. They're saying, hey, we source great coffees, we roast them to perfection and get them to you fresh. So I can vouch for that. Really putting their brand out there. Okay, so this is more of a brand awareness type ad. That's their objective. Their objective is if you're going to drink coffee at some other location or with some other brand, hey, take a look at ours. You know, we got good coffee too. We roast them pretty good. And, and we make sure that you get them fresh. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to introduce their brand to you. So this is a good example of a brand awareness ad, single image ad. They're definitely making use of the ad, the image itself, you know, with a nice close up shot of that roasted coffee. So that's what makes this ad so special. Brand awareness, you know, the image is telling us, hey, this coffee looks pretty, pretty good. It looks nice and roasted. It looks pretty fresh and maybe I'll give Blue Bottle Coffee a try. So that's why they're putting their domain there. Okay, so it's a good brand awareness ad and the hope is to convert some people over to their brand. Okay, so tip number 21, include emojis in your ad copy. Okay, so emojis we know are popular. You use them in text, you use them on social media. I mean, there's hundreds of emojis nowadays that you could pick and choose from. They are really specific. And so here you can see in the case of Simply Learn, hey, if you're taking a digital marketing course with Simply Learn, it doesn't hurt to have some emojis support that, that message. So you always got the thumbs up, it's a good emoji. You know, the image of the graduation, you know, that's a good emoji. So, you know, you always want to align, you know, really fun, relevant emojis with your messaging. It kind of just helps it stick out a bit and people resonate with emojis. And so it doesn't hurt to add those emojis in your ad copy. And especially if your competition is not using emojis you want every advantage you can to have your ad stick out so emojis is a good way to get your ad to stick out tip number 22 use UTM parameters to your ad which can feed into your Google Analytics account and provide tracking information so I can't stress this enough if you're using Google Analytics to track your campaigns, then you want to use UTM parameters. So what do we mean by UTM parameters? Well, let me show you an example. So all you need to do is type in UTM tracking or 
URL builder in Google. And then you're gonna actually get to this page here. So what this does, this is a tool to help you create UTM tracking. So if we're Simply Learn and we want to advertise and drive the audience to a specific page, in this case, Artificial Intelligence Master's Program page. So this is gonna be the URL, but we want to append that URL with some UTM tracking parameters. Our campaign source parameter, we're going to put Facebook because that's the source of where we're advertising. The medium in which we're driving that traffic to the page from Facebook is CPC, which stands for cost per click. And then we're just going to put campaign name AI engineer to identify what it is that campaign is related to. So notice that the only required parameter is campaign source. In this case, we're going to put Facebook, but we can also use campaign content if we want to differentiate the different ads that we have. So you can use campaign content parameter as well. You don't have to. The only required parameter is campaign source. My recommendation, go all lowercase, okay? And then when you're done, you have a URL that you can use in your advertising. So when somebody actually goes to that URL, notice the URL includes the UTM tracking, and then analytics is going to be able to pick up that campaign from where? Facebook. The medium is gonna be CPC, and the campaign in this case is gonna be AI engineer. And that's what you're gonna look for in Google Analytics. So it helps you track your ads more closely. Because if you don't use UTM tracking, for example, on Facebook, then analytics might you know, interpret that traffic coming from that ad as, you know, organic social. So we wanna be able to identify specifically the campaign you're running by putting in different variables for those parameters. So that's what UTM tracking is. You wanna use it for all your Facebook advertising, okay? So it really helps you, you know, in analytics, identify how your campaign's performing. Not only is it driving traffic, but is the campaign converting for you? So if you're trying to get somebody to sign up for a class, then analytics is gonna help us measure those conversions. But with UTM tracking, we can bridge the gap between how many people Facebook delivered or drove to our site from the ad and how many of those people actually converted. So UTM parameters help bridge that gap. Tip 23, use exclusion marketing to improve your Facebook return on investment by not including people who have already taken the action desired by you. Okay, so this is a very key feature here. So if we've already advertised and people have reacted to our ad and has subscribed, they have subscribed, then we don't want to target that person again. So that's what exclusion marketing is. We want to be able to, you know, target people that we're really after. So if, you know, somebody's looked at our ad and did not convert or did not go to our website or did not download something or whatever it is we wanted them to do, then those are the people we want to, to focus in on. Okay, so in this case, exclusion marketing we're going to exclude people who have subscribed in this case we're going to retarget people meaning advertise again to people who have not subscribed so that's what the exclusion marketing feature does it helps you really hone in on where you're targeting and retargeting so that way you're not hitting the same people over again and that's only going to lead to poor performance tip 24 Track the right metrics for your business. So keep your eye on important metrics. What are those metrics? You know, those are gonna be KPIs. KPIs are key performance indicators and KPIs differentiate from metrics because KPIs are related to business goals. So track the right metrics for your business. What are the right metrics for your business? More than likely, it's going to be conversions or conversion rate, but you could be running a brand awareness campaign just like a Blue Bottle Coffee did. And so if you're running a brand awareness campaign, then maybe your KPI or metric is gonna be a click, okay, or click through rate. How many people are actually reacting to our ad? Okay, so you always want to align the right metric with your business. Okay, it's just very important that you're measuring against the right metric. If you're not, then it's going to be misaligned in terms of how you judge the campaign performance. Another set of metrics could be reach and frequency. So reach and frequency allow us to measure how many people saw the ad and post engagement can determine how many users are reacting to your ads. CPC helps us determine the cost effectiveness or how much we're paying 
for every click. You could see that information in your Facebook ad manager. For example, if I go to Facebook's ads manager, here I'm looking at some, some ads that were running. Here, what can I see? I could see my reach, how many people I'm actually reaching, the frequency in which they're seeing my ad. Notice I can see my relevancy score. I can also see my cost per result. I can see the total clicks. So I have a whole set of metrics available to me. Really what I wanna do is pick and choose the metrics that are most important to the ad I'm running, okay? So if it's reach, am I reaching the full amount of people possible if I'm running a brand awareness campaign? Or it could be some other metric like conversion. So we want to be able to align the right metric with the right ad. Tip 25, take advantage of Facebook's location tracking tool for your advertisements. So Facebook allows us to advertise up to 25 countries with different states, provinces, cities, districts, and zip codes. So we can really hone in location-wise on where we wanna target. So Facebook allows us to do that. So basically it could be somebody in a particular area or people who have been recently been there or traveling to that location or actually live there. So really you can hone in on a specific location based on certain set of criteria. So with this, you could take your marketing to the next level by poaching your competitors, uh, customers by offering them better discounts. So that's the whole idea. Targeting your advertising on a specific location and then knowing that your competitors are there, you can really put out some really good ads with some really good offers to really convert some of those people in that audience. Okay, let's take a, a look at another ad. Okay, so Grammarly, this is an ad that they've uh, put out there. And again, you notice there's no real true call to action associated with a single image ad. Here, it's all about messaging. Here, they're saying, hey, download it free today. Okay, and so it's a browser extension that they're promoting. And really, they're trying to get you to identify or identify with this particular brand that offers a specific product. So they do have a promotion in there. It's brand awareness. Hey, your life is about to change. I mean, the messaging is pretty you know, matter of fact, they're trying to get you to, hey, I need this in my browser as an extension. So for me, this ad is all about the messaging here, okay? So with Grammarly, you know, if you're in Gmail, or you're in Word, you're in Outlook, they got you covered by using their browser extension. It's free and by using it, it's gonna make your life a lot easier. So for me, the ad works from a messaging standpoint. Not really big on the imagery, but it's really about this is who we are and we can really rock your world if you use this browser extension. So they're really putting a lot of emphasis on the messaging. So for me, anytime somebody says my life's about to change, they've got my attention. How to rank YouTube videos today. So it's Simply Learn. We take our videos on YouTube very seriously. Meaning that when we create videos, we want people to see them because we know we make good videos and we know we have good content and we know that our audience is going to enjoy it and so we want our audience to see the videos that we're creating and so we're gonna give you some tips and tricks and methodology and ideas on how to get your videos to rank on YouTube so at simply learn if I go to YouTube and I just type in machine learning you could see we're right here is the first organic video on YouTube for machine learning if I jump over to Google and I type in machine learning basics, you can see we're number, we're number one for machine learning basics under videos. If I click on all, we're also ranked here as well under the video section on organic search results. Another example, data science for beginners. We ranked number one for that. If I look at another keyword, data science interview questions, okay, we're ranked number two for that. So we're ranking for a lot of videos and why are we ranking for a lot of different content and videos on Google search and on YouTube? Well, we put a lot of work in behind the scenes of creating the video and that's what we wanna show you. So part of that has a lot to do with, you know, how our audience engages and sees our video. So for example, we're looking at uh, the machine learning basics video here. And we can see that it has over 221,000 subscribers for this video, 234,000 views. We've had over 2,000 people like the video. And we have had over 270 plus comment on the video. So when we get our videos to rank, then 
we can see there's a lot of engagement. And so that's the whole idea is when you do a video and you want it to show up on YouTube, you want people to enjoy it, you want people to share it, you want people to like it, you want people to comment on it. And that's part of the whole ecosystem of YouTube. It's, you know, we're gonna show you behind the scenes of what it takes to get your videos to rank. And then we're gonna show you some of the metrics involved with some of these videos to help you stay ranking. So without further ado, let's go into how to get your videos to rank on YouTube. So we're gonna talk about keyword research for YouTube. We're gonna talk about some ways to create high quality videos. So the importance of user engagement, just as I showed you with the machine learning basics video, all the shares, all the commenting, all the views and subscriptions. Then we're gonna get into how to promote your content. And then we're gonna just review a little checklist for you and sum it all up. So let's get started with keyword research. So basically what we wanna do is center our keywords, just like our website, we wanna center our keywords around, or our content around good keywords. So the videos on YouTube are no different than the web pages on our website. So if we have somebody who states YouTube is the world's second most well-known well engine, well, it is because it's right behind Google. It's not a search engine per se, it's a video platform, but if it was a search engine, it'd probably be second right behind Google. So YouTube is pretty popular. Majority of people use YouTube search every day to watch videos on a number of different topics. So they can find these videos in Google, but because YouTube's so powerful and so popular, people go directly right into YouTube for their searches. And so the whole idea behind YouTube being the second most well-known search engine is centered around keywords. So if you have the right keywords for your video, then the chances of you ranking higher increases on YouTube. So we're gonna share with you a few easy ways to do keyword research. This is the most most important step in getting your videos to rank on YouTube. Just like for those of you who watched any of the SEO videos we produced at, at Simply Learn, you know that keyword research is so essential to getting your web pages to rank on Google. Well, it's no different. Keyword research and choosing the right keywords is just as important for your videos as it is for your web pages. So we're gonna go into a few things to do here to find the right keywords. So we have the search suggestion. You can look at your competitors. We have different tools we can use, some other factors involved in Google itself. So let's start talking about some of these ways to really hone in and do some good research on your keywords to align them with your videos. So first thing is search suggest. So YouTube has a feature called autocomplete. So if you've done any searches on Google, it's very similar. If you're typing something in to YouTube search, then YouTube is going to suggest other related popular keywords. So let's take a look at that. If we go back to YouTube for a second and I just type in machine learning, YouTube is going to populate on the autocomplete in the search bar some other popular keywords that we can potentially use. Or in this case, if I choose you know, machine learning tutorial, I'm gonna see a video about machine learning tutorial. So here you can see Simply Learn's ranked number one for machine learning tutorial. But there are other videos that show up in my search result. So we wanna be able to use the search suggestion box in the search box. Field. So when we're typing in something, you know, YouTube, just like on Google, is going to give us those suggestions. So if we're focusing uh, a video on machine learning, then you know we have some ideas of some other keywords that we could center around because these are our popular keywords. These are keywords that people are using to search on YouTube. So that's one suggestion. Looking at competitors is another suggestion. So we could search for keywords used by our competitors in their video and title and description. So let me talk a little bit about that. What you wanna do is you wanna to go to that particular channel of your competitor. So when you go to your particular competitor's YouTube channel, you want to be able to click on the videos tab when you click on the videos tab then you're gonna sort by most popular and then 
what you could do is see a list of videos and then when you look at a list of videos you're going to choose a video and then what you're going to do then is take a look at the keywords used in the title and description and then once you do that you're going to have a list of keywords that you can use yourself for that video so for example let's go back to youtube so if i go to type in simply learn here's our channel page just by clicking on simply learn i click on videos ever wonder if there's so now I can see all the videos. Ever wonder if there's an easier way? Go back. So here I can see all the videos. Sort by most popular. Once I do that, then I can choose a video. This is the most popular video right now for Simply Learn. If I click on that video, it's automatically going to start playing. But what I could do is simply just look at you know the content description. So just by clicking Show More, I can see all the content that align with this video. That's one way to do it is simply by looking at your competitors. Now what you could also do is look at the tags associated with the particular video and so what you want to do is you want to look at the HTML and so that means looking at the page source so just like web pages what YouTube does is they look at meta tags so if you call from SEO in order to get your pages to rank you need to have a title tag and a meta tag description so videos are no different what we're doing uh, for YouTube is aligning certain keywords with the video so if you take a look and do a search for for keywords by viewing the page source, you're gonna see all the keywords associated with a particular video. So for example, if I go back to YouTube and I look at the page source of a video, let's just say this video here, Facebook's ad tutorial, I'm gonna pull up the page source. And all I need to do is control F and type in keywords. And now for that Facebook video, I can see all the keywords associated with the video. So you can see there's a lot of different keywords we're aligning with this video. And so why do we wanna do that? Because we want you know, our video to show up for keywords that people may type in. And so if you use that YouTube autocomplete, it's gonna give you those ideas, those most popular keywords. So if they're related, align those keywords with the video. So here you can see Facebook marketing, Facebook ad strategy, Facebook ads for beginners, so forth and so on. So there's a lot of keywords we've aligned here with that particular video. And again, all you need to do is look at the page source. So right clicking, view page source, do a control F for keywords, and you'll be able to see the keywords aligned. So you could do that for your competitor's videos as well. So you could see what keywords your competitor's using for a video that's most popular for their channel and is also ranking on YouTube and on Google. So using the autocomplete gives you those keyword ideas. Looking at your competitor's videos also gives you some other ideas for keywords that you can align with a video that's relevant that you want to rank for. So let's look at uh, some other ideas here. So you can install plugins and there are plenty of plugins available on the Chrome browser that will help you see the video tags associated with a particular video. So a couple of examples are vidIQ and TubeBuddy. Those are extensions that work in Chrome and what they do is they give you the exact tags that a particular video is using. So for example, if I go back here, and I look at a video on YouTube, let's just say the machine learning basics video, I have vidIQ installed on my Chrome browser. So just by clicking on that, vidIQ is going to give me a lot of information about that video. They're just gonna give me an overview of their particular metrics. They're gonna give me some other information associated with Facebook, some engagement metrics. Really what I'm interested in is those keywords. So if I scroll down a bit, here I can see the video tags associated with the machine learning basics video. So vidIQ is telling me is these keywords are associated with this video. And not only does it show me what keywords are associated, I can also see where they rank. So for machine learning basics, this particular video ranks number one. If I go down, I could see what is machine learning and how does it work? I could see it's ranked number two. Here I could see machine learning algorithms, it's ranked number nine. So I can get some ideas of the types of keywords that are being used as tags for that video. Further down, I can also see some 
channel tags. But really, this is the video tags or the idea place I want to be able to look to get an idea of the types of keywords that are associated with the video that are also ranking or not ranking. So that's another way for you to really get an understanding of what keywords to use at the particular video. So autocomplete, you can look at the page source of a competitor's video, or you can use a Chrome extension. In this case, I'm using vidIQ to give me some information about the video tags for a particular video. So according to an industry study, using keywords and video tags will help you rank well on YouTube. So you have to use keywords and video tags if you want your video to rank. There's been a lot of studies. YouTube is so popular and videos are so prominent in today's world where if you have videos and you're going to upload them to YouTube, then associate the right keywords with those videos. So some important factors when we look at keywords, what we want to do is look at search volume. We want to look at competition. We want to look at relevancy. We want to look at the primary and secondary keywords that we want to use. So well-chosen keywords will help you rank. So we just gave you some ideas on how to do some keyword research. Again, those ideas were really to use the autocomplete on YouTube or Google. They're going to give you some popular keywords. You can look what your competitors are doing by looking at the page source and just looking at the keywords that are aligned with that video. Or you can use a third party extension in Chrome. In my example, I use vidIQ that gave me the keywords associated with that video. So you have ways to get the keywords. So what we want to do is we want to make sure we choose keywords with high search volume. They're going to drive more traffic to your video. However, we want to balance it out with keywords that have low difficulty and are easier to rank for. So you don't want to choose something very broad. That's just going to be very difficult to rank for. And of course, we always want to go with relevancy. So if we're talking about machine learning basics, then we want to choose keywords associated with that. And that's where that autocomplete comes in handy because what Google's going to do and YouTube's going to do is give us keywords that are very closely related to the video that we're trying to optimize for. And so we have a number of different keywords at our disposal that are relevant that we can look to see if they have good volume and low competition. And so the whole idea is we want to choose a keyword that defines the nature of the content. And then what we want to do is support that with secondary keywords. So we want keywords that are highly relevant to the primary keyword. So so that's the way to go about aligning your keywords. You want keywords that are high volume, low competition, are relevant, and you want to choose that one keyword that is really what the content's about, and then those secondary keywords that support the primary. So if you have a machine learning video, you could choose your primary keyword as, in this case, the machine learning basics video. So well-chosen keywords help you rank well on YouTube, just like the machine learning basics. So if I go back to our video, our machine learning basics video, if I just type in machine learning basics, I'll be able to pull it up. And so here it is. If I click on it, I'm gonna to go to YouTube. And so here I can see this keyword Keyword we know humans learn from their body is well aligned because it's in the title, it's in the copy, and it's aligned as a keyword tagged with the video. So we know that that keyword has good volume, low competition is relevant because that's what the video is about, the basics of machine learning. It's an introduction to machine learning. So instead of honing in on just introduction to machine learning, primary keyword is machine learning basics. And then we supported that video with those secondary keywords. What is machine learning? Because somebody who doesn't know what machine learning is probably going to type in that keyword. And then introduction to machine learning is a good secondary keyword because it's explaining the basics of what machine learning is all about. So primary keyword, machine learning basic, secondary keywords, what is machine learning and introduction to machine learning. So that's the whole idea behind choosing keywords. You want that keyword that really is going to define the content and then support that with those secondary keywords. So remember when you're performing your keyword research, choose keywords for your videos that Google shows on the video results page. So what I mean by that is your video can get more views if you rank on Google as well. 
well. So the whole idea is not necessarily to be found on YouTube, it's also to be found on Google. So if I go back to Google and I just type in data science for beginners and I type in videos, then you could see we're ranked number one. So even if you're not looking at the videos, clicking on the videos link on Google search, you can always just, when you do a search, what Google's going to do is also put in the videos here on par as part of the search results. So what they're going to show you is the top videos that are ranking for that particular keyword. And so we may not rank overall for data science for beginners, but we're ranked number one in the videos category. And so if somebody's looking for a video, that's important. And you can see here that these first two are ads. So what Google is doing is they're saying, hey, this is so relevant, this particular video for the keyword query data science for beginners that we're going to show it above the organic listings, even though it's a video. So the whole idea is to be found on YouTube and Google because you're increasing your visibility. You're increasing your chances of getting found on both search platforms. So according to Backlinko, Google ranks videos with keywords like how to, tutorials so you know a lot of the videos that you find on YouTube are going to be instructional based and so what Google's doing is they're saying hey if somebody types in how to or a tutorial or an introduction to anything that's going to signal to Google that it's instructional it's going to help you rank so when you search for machine learning tutorial or how to become a machine learning engineer you're gonna get results related to that because if you look at these examples we have machine learning tutorial in our title or how to become a machine learning engineer so keep that in mind if you're creating a video and it's educational in nature you know use those key terms like how to and tutorials in the video title because that will help you rank so let's move over now to video title so we want to use our target keyword in the title of the video and again we want to make sure if it's educational to include that keyword tutorial or how to so for every video title YouTube has a limit of a hundred characters so we really have to pick and choose a really wisely so if we look at the video that we were focusing on a couple of minutes ago so machine learning basics here we could see under 100 characters we have machine learning basics what is machine learning introduction to machine learning and then the brand name so that is the title of this particular video so it takes into account the primary keyword the secondary keywords and the title and it also includes that really that key term that really Google and YouTube like and that's what is machine learning so it's helping us rank by having our keywords words in the title with that key phrase what is okay so that's a, a good tidbit on creating a good video title is to align it with the right keywords your primary and your secondary and so we want to use those catchy words and numbers to gain high click-through rates just like you would on the title tag of your web page we want to do the same with our video title because the video title is what's going to show up in search so if I go back to you know search here we could see you know data science tutorial data science for beginners so we want to make sure in this case you can see data science in five minutes so that was purposely done so that hey I don't have time to watch a video I only have a couple minutes data science in five minutes okay great I'm gonna click on the video and now I have an opportunity to watch something and learn something under five minutes so choosing the right words in your video title is going to help you get that click-through rate up remember click-through rate is clicks divided by impressions and an impression is how many times your video shows up in the search results on YouTube or Google so we want to keep our click-through rate high and in order to do that we want to be able to write some really good title tags for our video so use catchy words like a number or how to or what is because that's gonna resonate with people when they're searching now for the description what we want to do is we want to use the target word at the beginning of the description the title and the tags itself so if I go back to my video here, Machine Learning Basics, we know it's in the video title. And right off the bat, if I look at the description of the video here, I can see this Machine Learning Basics video will help you understand what is machine learning. So our primary keyword is in the first sentence, right in the introductory of the description. And so that's going to bode well for optimizing our video. 
The description length is 5,000 characters. So we have a lot of characters to work with. So if I go back to my video, I click show more. We have a lot of characters to really describe what the video is about. Okay, there's no shortage, no shortage of including keywords into the content. So you have 5,000 characters. Go ahead and see if you can work in naturally your keywords. But one of the key tips here is just make sure that first sentence starts out with that keyword. That's a good tip. Of course, you always want to make it sound natural as possible. You don't want to stuff it with keywords. At the same time, work them in naturally. Work in your keywords naturally. And then include hashtags in your description to help the audience find your video is easily. So if I go back here, you know, we want to be able to include hashtags. So hashtags, it's like anything else you would use on social media. It just signals to the end user, hey, this is what the video is all about. And if I go ahead and type in that keyword, then it's our video has a better chance because it's aligned with that hashtag. And then there's target keywords and LSI keywords, latent semantic indexing keywords. We want to be able to use those keywords as target keywords with our video. So if you recall the example I gave a few minutes ago, we used the Facebook ads tutorial as our example. Here I could see all the target keywords associated with that particular video. So don't be afraid to use those LSI related keywords, meaning keywords that are related to the content. Use them as target keywords with the video so between your LSI keywords target keywords and then using our primary and secondary keyword in the title tag using our primary and secondary keyword in the description and then using hashtags in the description the combination of all of that if we chose the right keyword then we should find that our video will eventually rank on YouTube so just doing these small tidbits with our keywords really help get our video to rank. So at the end of the day, we want to be able to use the tools available to us, YouTube itself by looking at our competitors, those extensions like vidIQ, the autocomplete to really find our good keywords and then incorporating those keywords into you know, the title tag, the description as target keywords, hashtags. We should really be off and running with our video on YouTube. Let's turn our attention to creating high quality videos and some of the best practices around that. So along with everything we mentioned about choosing the right keywords, we always need to keep in mind that the videos we create need to be of high quality. So the content itself, in addition to the keywords, is, is a primary factor in ranking. So in order to have keywords, we need to have content. And in order to rank, we need to have you know good content. So let's talk a little bit about creating content and what's involved with that and what we really mean by high quality videos. So if you have a video content that is not informative or irrelevant to the topic, it won't rank. So that's just common sense. So you need to create content that's aligned with the topic, obviously, and then that way you have keywords that are aligned with the content. So, but if you have content really isn't aligned with the topic, then you're not gonna rank, no matter how much you've optimized that video. So just keep that in mind. So. There's a couple of things we want to look at here. So high quality content is determined by really two metrics. So if we're not sure about how good our content is and how good of high quality video we've created, we want to look at audience retention and user engagement. So audience retention is simply the percentage length of your video that the audience has watched. It's the percentage your audience has watched. So focusing on audience retention is important for people who want their videos to rank high. So if you want to rank, you need to optimize for the keywords, but you got to keep in mind content. So content is related to audience retention and user engagement. So audience retention, percentage length, your video of your video that the audience has watched. And for example, it can be both absolute in minutes or percentages. So audience retention can be the average view duration or percentage of the audience that watched. Then we have user engagement. So user engagement are viewers who are engaged with your content. And so that means they're either sharing it, subscribing, commenting, or liking. So those are all forms of engagement. So the percentage of users who watched or 
how long they watched versus engagement or in combination with engagement are two factors for ranking. So let's talk about some tips for creating high quality videos. So we wanna publish longer videos. And so what do we mean behind longer videos? So what's the reason for longer videos? Let's just suppose we have two videos, one shorter in length and one longer in length. First video is 15 minutes long. The second video is seven minutes long. So on average, if viewers watch about 40% of both videos, then video X, which is 15 minutes long, will have more than twice the watch time of the video that's seven minutes long. So remember, duration. We want you know people to watch our videos longer. So if the video is longer in length, if it's 40%, then it's gonna have a longer audience engagement, audience retention. So that's one of the reasons, you know, from a metric standpoint. So even when viewers watch, you know, both videos, the time is gonna differ. So we wanna take into account longer videos for primarily that reason is because, you know, it gives an, an end user an opportunity to watch the video longer and then it's going to help us rank our videos longer. So when we talk about watch time, so if one video has higher watch time than the other, watch time is just the number of views times the average view duration. So another tip is we want to plan our video script. So we want to keep the content organized. My recommendation is, you know, create an outline first. And once you create an outline of how the video is gonna flow, then start populating with content. And so to me, that's how you can keep the flow organized, okay? is really with an outline, starting out with an outline. It's no, videos are no different than say a presentation. If you've done a PowerPoint presentation, you always wanna start out doing an outline. And then we wanna upload high resolution videos. High resolution, we don't wanna create videos that, you know, are small resolution, like say, you know, 400 by 400 resolution or something, you know, something really small. We wanna create something a very high res. So according to Back or Link Oaks, more than 50% of videos on the first page of YouTube are high definition. So high definition videos of higher quality are going to be shown on the first page of YouTube more often than not. So high resolution videos, organizing the content, publishing longer videos are examples of creating high quality video. We also want to make sure that content is relevant to the title. So if we're talking about machine learning basics, you know, obviously the content is going to be about, you know, intro to machine learning or what is machine learning. And then the title should reflect that content. So aligning the title sets the expectation for the end user. So when they see a title, what is machine learning? Then when they watch the video, you know, they're expecting to learn about machine learning and what it is. So if it meets expectations, then the chances are that person who's watching the video is going to watch it longer. And that means it's going to fulfill the viewer's requirements. And when you align everything accordingly, keywords, titles, content, then at the end of the day, the view user is gonna watch it. And the more they watch it, the higher the engagement, the higher the engagement, the better chance you have to rank. Some other tips that you could use to create high quality videos. So we wanna be able to you know, use examples to clarify our content. So you know, don't be afraid to go into another screen like I am. I want to, I'm talking about videos, jump into the machine learning basics video, which I've done throughout this session. I can simply do that by keeping the user engaged. Here, this video is about machine learning basics. Well, the titles align with the video. We made sure that we have a nice description about what the video is about and we're aligning the expectations. So not only that, I'm showing you an example within the video itself. So we want to use examples throughout your video to keep the user engaged. It will also help clarify what you're trying to express in the video itself. So we want to make it visually appealing. So visually appealing means imagery or examples in the video. And then when we talk about imagery, you know, you want to use good images in your video. So use public domain sites that that are available to you like Shutterstock or Flat Icon. I mean, there are plenty of those sites out there. So feel free to use any one of those sites 
to use high quality images in your video. Give more information to your audience. Okay, giving maximum relevant information can help gain more views. And so when we talk about more information, again, it goes back to you know the examples you use. There's no should be no shortage of examples. Here, description. Use all 5,000 characters at your disposal. Imagery. We want to build up as much information as you can in the video itself to keep the end user, the viewer, engaged. We also want to create original content. So always create original content. I mean, you could certainly get ideas is from YouTube. If you want to create a video about machine learning, see what else has already been done. Do searches on YouTube itself. But, you know, when you want to create a video, yeah, you can create another video about what is machine learning, but just make sure it has your own take on it. You're the subject matter expert when creating the video. Create it with your own original content. Have high audio quality and video effects. So, just like you see here on this video, we have effects in it and the audio is of high quality, meaning no background noise, no distortion, and we want to be able to speak clearly in the video. So you want to speak clearly, loudly, concise, just as I'm trying to do now so that you can understand what I'm trying to say or what the viewer's trying to, to understand when they're watching the video. So watching and listening are two of the components and you want to make sure both of our high quality. Avoid distractions. We don't want to pause. You don't want to ramble on a particular point too long. We want to keep users engaged. So you always want to move from one point to the other. Intermix it with examples. Those are ways to keep the users engaged. We want to include transcripts or subtitles for your video. So transcripts is just more content that's aligned with the video and the search engines will be able to pick up that content and help your video rank. So to me, that's a key component to creating a good video is having the necessary content to go along with the video. That outline I referenced earlier in terms of organization, you always want to have a content outline. So what topics are you going to cover in the video? That's why you need the outline to point that out, confirm that before you actually start creating the video. Okay, focus on the initial 15 seconds. So that's key. You know, somebody's going to click the play button of your video, and if you don't catch them in the first 15 seconds, then they're likely going to pause the video or just go ahead and close it out altogether. So you want to be able to capture somebody's attention right off the bat. And even before they click on that play button, you want to make sure, again, you're exceeding expectations. That title is aligned with the content. So in your first 15 seconds, it basically needs to be catchy, but also setting the expectation of what the user is expecting. So in this example here, we want to pay close attention to the first 15 seconds. That's when viewers are most likely to drop off. So we can look at audience retention in YouTube. So use the options above the graph to view absolute audience retention or relative audience retention. So audience retention is basically how many views a video received and the percentage of the total number of video views. And that includes every moment of the video as a percentage. So we'll show you an example of what that looks like. So here, if we go to the machine learning basics video, we can look at the audience retention report. And this is since it's been uploaded, the lifetime audience retention. So here we can see a nice graph, the percentage of people who viewed it and how long they viewed it. So in percentage. So here, for example, I can see, you know, 43, 44% watch the video for at least two minutes. Here I can see 28.6% watch it for six minutes plus. So that's the audience retention. It gives us an idea in terms of percentage, how many people or percentage of people watch the video at what length. So that's audience retention. So we wanna keep that number high at the very initial stage of the video. And we wanna keep it high throughout, and that's why you always wanna create high quality content using those examples, using imagery, making it organized content, not pausing, you know, going from one point to the other. Those are all best practices to keep the viewer engaged. And then we wanna add resources from well-known sites, so throughout this video, we've used Backlinko. There are other sources we've used. So if you have a source, go ahead and put it in your video to add credibility. And then we wanna use cards to your video. So this cards is basically a feature that recommends relevant videos to your audience. So in addition to machine learning basics, there could be other videos about machine learning that we can recommend or YouTube can recommend to the audience. To set up end screens, you wanna make sure that 
With end screens, you can use relevant videos to your audience towards the end of your video. So you can recommend relevant videos towards the end of your video. You can also create play playlists. So this is a feature that keeps your audience engaged with relevant content by auto playing the next video. So if you enable this feature, it's gonna go from one video to another. Pattern interrupts keep the audience engaged. So basically it allows your audience to stay within one video without having any interruptions involved. And so going back to the did you know, audience retention report helps you analyze how well your videos are engaging to the audience. So what do we mean by that? Well, if I go back again to my audience retention report, how engaging was it? Well, I could see 42%, 43% watched it on average of three minutes and 21 seconds. So to me, that's pretty good. Of course, we always want 100% of the video. The video is seven minutes long. If almost half of our audience saw over half of the video, then I would say that's pretty good. People were engaged. So audience retention just is a good report to start looking at to help you understand how engaging is my video. And if your video is not engaging, you know, you can always go back and edit it or fix it or tweak it. So remember the average view duration for all videos and top performing videos listed by all time. We can look at that information as well. In addition, we can look at demographics so we can get an overview of the age, gender, and location. Okay, we can look at playback locations report and what the playback locations report does is it helps us determine the platforms where our videos are being streamed from within YouTube. We look at the traffic sources, where did the viewers come from, devices, did they look on mobile or tablet, and so if there's any doubts, you know, if you have any questions, please drop a comment below, but especially if you have any doubts on the metric. So if we go back into YouTube, we can look at analytics. And if we're looking at analytics, we can see more. And then this is going to show us everything we need to see from device type. So if I click on more, I can see my playback location. So this will show me where the video was watched. It was on a watch page or a channel page. I could see the traffic sources. I could see the gender and age. So if I click on the viewer age report, I can see the percentage of views by age. So I can get a lot of information about my video and how it's performed, who's watched it, what they've done with it, uh, where they come from, all the information they need to know. And so it's all within YouTube Analytics. So again, if you have any questions about that, you know, just drop a comment below. Especially if you're new to YouTube, you may have some questions, but just know that every video you publish to YouTube, high quality, aligned with your keywords, you're gonna be able to view the metrics by looking at YouTube Analytics. So let's talk about the importance of user engagement. So engagement is, as we mentioned, important because basically we can't rank without engagement. Our videos won't rank unless we have engagement. So that's why it's important. So engagement is somebody liking the video, commenting, sharing it, or subscribing. Each one of these is important to ranking. So yes, you need to line keywords. Yes, you need to have high quality content. So when you do both of those, and you upload your video, then it's up to the viewer. And so the hard work that you put out for the video is hopefully gonna pay dividends with engagement. So you want people to do one of these four. Okay, so let's talk about what that means. So how do I get engagement? So we already talked about creating engaging content. So there are a lot of tips to creating engaging content. And so according to WordStream, if your content is entertaining, then over three quarters of the users are gonna share it. So that's part of keeping uh, uh, users engaged is keeping it entertaining is part of getting a high quality video. So remember on that high quality video, when we say entertaining, the audio portion has a lot to do with it. Examples has a lot to do with it. Quality of the video itself has a lot to do with it. So a lot of components. So all those components on a high quality video are going to lead to engagement. So parts of what you could do in your videos is conduct a quiz. So meaning the quiz itself is a way to keep people engaged in your video. So that also help you get some more comments. So according to Backlinku, video comments help in ranking your video higher. So just as I mentioned in the last segment about 
YouTube analytics and all the different reports available on YouTube. Hey, if you have questions on those, just go ahead and add a comment. So that's a way to entice your users or your viewers to add comments is if they have questions. Because, you know, with videos, you're not going to be able to cover every detail or every minute detail about a particular topic. You can only cover, in some cases, the topic at a high level. So users are going to have comments or questions naturally and so the comment section is a good way to remind viewers hey if you have a question or comment go ahead and put it in the comment section because that will lend to engagement as well so we want to add sources from high quality websites that'll help with engagement okay use humor in your video we want to be able to basically you know make it human based we don't want to be robots so we want to be able to sound like, you know, we know what we're talking about, but at the same time, talk to the viewer, not necessarily at the viewer or looking the other way and just going through the motions. So adding humor, adding personality never hurts. At the end of the day, we are all human. Adding that clear call to action at the end of the video will also lead to engagement. So if we win the video with, hey, leave your comments on this video, or hey, feel free to share this video with colleagues who are interested, then that's a call to action that's likely going to lead to more engagement. Reply to your comments as well. So if you have comments, we always wanna to reply to them. Likely those comments are going to be questions because again, as I mentioned, even in this video about how to rank your videos on YouTube, okay, there's a lot of information and a lot of information sometimes doesn't get covered in its entirety. And so we wanna make sure that if we miss something, because we're only human, that we're able to respond in the form of an answer to a question that somebody leaves in the comment section. So more comments also lead to higher rankings because it's engagement. So when you're getting high engagement and your video starts to rank well, you know, you're gonna start feeling really good. And what is that gonna do? Okay, that feel good's gonna lead to confidence, which in turn is gonna probably lead to more videos. And that's exactly what we do at Simply Learn. I mean, we're in the education business, but we're in it to not only educate, but making sure that our videos are shown to as many people as possible so that we can educate as many people as possible. So it's all, it's contagious. So getting ranked feels good. And then once you get ranked, then you know you probably have good engagement. Okay, let's talk about how to promote your content. So once you've done all the hard work, getting your video done, high quality content, optimized with keywords, and then publish to YouTube, we want to let everybody in the world know about it, right? So we want to promote it. We've done all the work. We want to promote it now. So is it necessary to promote it? I would say yes, because once your video is published, you want to reach out. You want to reach out to your audience, not necessarily on YouTube, but on different platforms. So if you're active on Facebook or Twitter, that's an opportunity for you to post or tweet something about the new video. So when we say different platforms, I am talking about, you know, social media platforms. So it depends on what you're active on. So if you're active on Facebook, yeah, go ahead and post something. If you're active on Twitter, go ahead and tweet something. It could be, you know, on LinkedIn group. If you're part of a LinkedIn group about, you know, machine learning, then go ahead and post something to that group to promote the video. So that's going to help drive traffic to the video and then help with engagement. So we want to engage with our audience on those social media sites. So really, depends on what you're active on so if you have a large following on Twitter then go ahead and you know share that YouTube video link on Twitter with the tweet that's going to drive traffic from Twitter to YouTube remember you know you're gonna be able to see audience engagement or retention by getting people to watch the video so you're gonna be able to see right away by promoting the video and driving traffic to the video how engaging it is remember the more people you have watched the video the more engaging it becomes the better it's going to rank so it's an ecosystem and promoting your content is part of that ecosystem so it all starts with social media if you're active on whatever platform that is go ahead and promote it so you can also look at 
you know, content-based social media sites or social media content-based platforms like Reddit or Flickr, for example. So you can participate in a forum discussion on Reddit. So in this example here, it's about machine learning. So we wanna be able to post something about machine learning with the link to our video. So we can also go to content-based sites that are Q&A uh, related, like Quora, for example. Quora is a really good site where, you know, if you go there, post information about machine learning or the basics of machine learning with the link back to the video, it's gonna help because not only is it gonna drive traffic, but it's gonna signal to Google, hey, you get a lot of traffic coming from Quora. This is gonna bode well for this video in terms of ranking. So here's an example. You know, if you find a question that you can post on Quora, then you're gonna get people to click on your video and respond accordingly on Quora. Or you can act as the person responding to a question that's already there. So if somebody already asked a question about what is machine learning, you can respond with your video as the answer. So you can just simply embed your video URL as part of your answer. That'll help drive traffic. So you can also create your own blog and embed your video. So in the case of machine learning, here we have an example, machine learning, what is it and why it matters. So this goes nicely with the video. So here you can see the person, the author of this blog went ahead and embedded the relevant video in the blog post. So they play off one another nicely. You can also opt in for influencer marketing, meaning, hey, you can reach out to somebody. In this example here, you know, Katie Nuggets posted information about machine learning. So in this case, why choose machine learning as a career? Well, they got information and then what did they do? They went ahead and embedded the video about machine learning basics. And so working with, you know, influencers in a particular category or topic will help drive traffic to the video. You can also create a YouTube playlist. So playlists tend to rank high in YouTube searches. So if you find yourself doing a lot of videos, well, go ahead and you know go to your channel and simply in your channel, you can go ahead and create playlists. So when you create playlists, basically what you're doing is you're organizing the content into different playlists. No different than say the music you have set up on your you know your iPhone or iPod or or iPod, whatever it is you're. Using using. So you're just creating different videos in a particular category. And it YouTube likes it, it's organized, it's going to help you get your videos found quicker and easier on YouTube itself by putting your videos in a playlist. So here you could see we have entire playlist on machine learning, trending technologies, cloud computing, big data, digital marketing, project management, so a lot of different playlists. Very organized. If somebody goes to the channel, they're going to be able to go to the playlist that's interesting to them and see all the videos there so it allows not only the end user to find what they're looking for but it's good for YouTube because YouTube likes those playlists so we want to engage our audience by posting your video link on a community page so you could do that within YouTube and you can prefer to link your YouTube channel in your email so you can also do that so for example if I go back to YouTube and I'm looking at a, a YouTube video you know I can always click share so here, I'm gonna get a particular URL that's associated with the video and I can just embed that. So I can embed the whole thing in my email. I can embed it on a web page or a blog post. So just by clicking share, I can also immediately share it onto the social media platforms that we mentioned, Facebook, LinkedIn, Reddit, okay, Tumblr. So there's a lot of ways to embed the video, not just that on a blog post or influence influencer blog post, but in our email and on social media as well. So here's an example of what we can do with a YouTube discussion. So we can also bookmark the video on a popular bookmarking site, you know, like stumbled upon or Reddit or, you know, there's lots of other ones out there. So there's plenty of sites that you'll be able to go to and bookmark that content so that people can find it. And you can always opt for backlinks. So that means that, hey, if there's a blogger out there that blogs about machine learning, you can always 
you know, ask that blogger to create a link back to the video and you could reciprocate, do the same thing. So that helps increase the authority of the video. So there's a lot of things you could do to promote your video. So let's do a, a quick review on everything we talked about in terms of ranking your video on YouTube. It all starts with the keywords. So we want to identify a list of keywords that are relevant to the video. So we can use tools to choose our keywords, but remember, we wanna choose keywords that have high volume and low competition. And so where can we go to choose those keywords? Well, we can use the autocomplete on YouTube, we could check out our own competitors' videos, or you know, we could use vidIQ or TubeBuddy or any of these extensions in Chrome to help us look at the keywords that are tagged with a particular video. So remember, we wanna have a primary keyword that's aligned with the content, then we wanna choose LSI keywords as our secondary keyword, or keywords that are related to the primary keyword. So we wanna create high retention videos, meaning that first 15 seconds are the most important, but throughout the video, we wanna use examples. We wanna keep it interacting by adding quizzes, imagery, good audio, good video quality. So we wanna focus on the user experience. And we also want to optimize our video content. What does that mean? Well, those keywords that we chose, we want to use them in the title. We want to use them in the description. We want to use them as hashtags. We want to use them and tag them with the video themselves. So we can add keywords to our meta tag. Okay, we don't want to overdo it, but we want to add a handful of keywords that is, are associated with the video. So we want to be able to write eye-catchy video titles and descriptions. So remember, use some of those key phrases like a number or a question like what is machine learning so we want to use relevant meta tags for the videos and we want to use popular youtube tags so we want to be able to tag our videos appropriately so watch the length of your meta tags so there are lengths involved remember keywords at the beginning of the title target keywords in the title description and tags we want to use interesting thumbnails to increase our click-through rate ensure that thumbnails are relevant meaning when i say thumbnails i mean the actual title tag itself or the meta description we want to use high res videos we want to create you know videos with good high audio quality don't be afraid to put in video effects like some animation don't be afraid to use examples and then you know obviously look at the draft of the video before you publish it so does your video follow an outline? Is it organized? So these are all the things to take into account. And there's there's plenty more you can do. You know, you remember, once you create and optimize that video, you want to promote it. You want to make sure that you're sharing it on social media. You create a complimentary blog. You know, generate backlinks from, say, other blog posts. So there are lots of things you can do to promote your video. So before you promote it, you wanna organize the content, create good quality content, align it with keywords. Once you publish it, you know, keep organizing it by creating those playlists and then reach out on social, reach out on different communities related to the topic. And all those things combined will help you to get your YouTube video ranked. Today, we're gonna to talk about how to increase YouTube subscribers. So with YouTube, it's all about subscribers. Subscribers. The number of subscribers you have on YouTube, it's just one of the key metrics to measure success. So gaining more subscribers can help you achieve more view counts on your YouTube videos. So it's all about how to get subscribers. And today we're going to talk about how to get more subscribers. And before we begin, let's just show you what we did at Simply Learn. So if we look at the past 365 days on our YouTube channel, you can see we started here back in, uh, if we look back at March, March 9, 2018, we had 208. And you can see just over the course of the year, it kept creeping up, creeping up, creeping up, and creeping up, we've gained, you know, a significant number of subscribers over the last year. And what's our secret? Well, it's posting videos. So you can see we've posted a number of videos over the course of the year, and then our subscribers have gone basically 165% over the last year. So you can see it's part of it is about 
posting videos because when you post videos you have people who can watch those videos when you have people watch those videos you can have engagement and then when you have engagement you have shares and people who like it and then other people will see it so it's kind of a halo effect so to speak so getting subscribers it takes a lot more than just posting videos and today we're going to talk about some tips to help you increase the subscriptions and so let's start out with some of those tips we're going to start with creating engagement and informative content so engaging in informative content that's where we're going to start talking today about how to increase subscriptions then we're going to talk about publishing videos frequently so if it's simply learn you could see the past 365 days we were consistent in publishing videos consistently throughout the month and the weeks so another tip we're going to talk about is how to optimize your YouTube videos so there's a lot that goes into optimization but this is a key key tip to pay attention to because when you comes to posting publishing videos on YouTube you need to align certain things like keywords and content and metadata so optimize on our videos we're gonna talk a lot about that then we're gonna talk about optimizing the YouTube channel so there's some tips and tricks here you want to do to optimize your YouTube channel producing high quality videos we're gonna talk about that adding a subscriber watermark to your videos okay that's another tip we're gonna mention today engage with our audience okay that's what we want to do we want to engage with our audience that's a really key tip and we're saving the best for last promote your videos in different platforms so all of these tips we're gonna talk about today so let's get started and talk about create engaging informative content so that's the first place we want to start okay so create engaging and informative content so if we want to gain more subscribers on our channel we have to create highly engaging and informative content why because not our audience is not going to pay attention and they're not going to watch the video and then then the engagement's not going to be high and they're not going to share the video and they're not going to tell their friends or like it and so this is where it all starts you have to be able to plan your content and not only planning your content but you got to create it so it's engaging and informative so how do you do that well let's talk about that so the first thing is you have to know your audience okay so when you create a video who you're creating the video for I mean that's where it all starts so when you're creating your content you're creating your content for your audience you're not creating it for the entire world now we know on YouTube there's a lot of cute videos about kittens and jokes and you know people playing games and you know everybody likes positive things on YouTube but you know when we're talking about a specific topic you know we really have to hone in on a target audience and so if you know who your audience is then you can really hone in on your content okay so that's the first thing ask yourself who is your audience and then build your content around that specific audience don't build it just for the mass general population because it's not going to be engaging and informative so that's the first place to start then you want to engage that audience with relevant content so if you know your audience and depending on the topic you want to make sure that whatever the topic is the content matches the topic don't veer off course if you veer off course you're not going to engage your viewers your viewers are coming to watch the video for a specific reason the reason is the topic okay so if they're your target audience and they want to watch the video that's a specific topic then the content has to align so plan your video script so if you know who your audience is and you know you want to engage them with relevant content go ahead and plan the script out so what I normally do is you know have an outline and then once I have the outline then I go ahead and create my slides if I will or my topics points I want to talk about and then I write out those points I want to make sure I get all my points in and that's what you should be doing you want to plan it ahead of time so that you can get all your relevant points across that's what makes a video informative okay you want to ensure to give maximum information to your audience so the key here is maximum information so you don't want to overload the audience but then again you want to cut out information so you want to make sure that when you're planning your script and you're writing the outline that you're making sure you include all your points that you want to get across once you include those points then go ahead and you know write your script and make sure all the information for all those points are in the script that's how you're going to ensure you give maximum information but you don't want to overdo it so if you feel like it's too much information it probably is too much information back off a little use the information to create another video so it's all about knowing your audience so all of these points play against one another so be clear and use more examples
articles in your content just like we're doing here okay just like at the beginning of this session I showed you an example of simply learn subscribers over the past 365 days and so that's what we want to do we want to be clear but use examples to punctuate the content or the point we're trying to get across so we want to include sources from high quality sites so if you're going to use examples make sure they're from relevant high quality sites and when I mean high quality meaning does your audience know who that source is or that site if it's really specific and your audience may not know then it's probably not high quality so just keep that in mind always play to your audience so you want to start your video with an interesting hook so again I go back to this example if you're still watching this then the hook worked we showed you our subscriptions we showed you how we grew over the course of a year you could see our growth and part of it was posting a lot of videos with relevant and informative content and so you see how we did it so you're paying attention you want to know how to do it and so part of what we did is exactly what I'm telling you now we know who our audience is we plan out our scripts we use Use good examples and we start our videos with interesting hooks now when we do our videos we also create original content so that goes back to planning your script okay you always want to you know come across as original and informative when you do that you're gonna be engaging but if you're leveraging somebody else's content then the engaging part may not resonate because it's not your content to begin with so always 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 use original content okay so keep the content flow organized so again that goes back to an outline you know feel free to change up the outline so the flow makes sense add visuals to your content and make it appealing always include images to me if you can use images in your videos and play off the video or the images then it's just gonna flow and make it a little bit more engaging and appealing meaning the content so visuals help guide and aid in the points you're trying to make so don't make it so text heavy you know accentuate it balance Balance it with some images use simple language and crisp sentences meaning don't use jargon don't come across and talk above your audience you always want to talk to your audience and talk in a language that they're going to understand so it goes back to point one if you know who your audience is you're talking to them as if they're right in front of you and not you're above them or they're below you you want to talk at them so add cards and screens and pattern interrupts to engage your audience and so YouTube cards are just interactive panels that slide in and out when a video is playing so it encourages interaction by the viewer okay so you can add up to five cards which include images text or clickable links so feel free to play around with some of these features that YouTube has to offer to make your content more engaging so tip two: publish videos frequently so creating and uploading videos consistently will help you increase your YouTube subscribers so suppose you haven't published videos for more than say a month or two months it's likely that that audience is not going to subscribe subscribe to your channel so think about YouTube videos as a popular TV program that comes on once a week when a new episode comes on based on the regular schedule it's consistency and that consistency is what helps your users stay engaged so for example if I go back to our YouTube channel you know what helped us gain subscribers was our consistency in publishing videos you could see we were consistent in publishing a couple of videos a week every couple of weeks and so this helps users stay engaged they know when the video is coming out they know that simply learn is good for two three four videos a month and the great thing about publishing videos is that when somebody does subscribe to your channel they're gonna get a notification or YouTube has an option where they can get a notification via email so I subscribe to simply learns channel I subscribe to other channels like Google Analytics for example so anytime Google Analytics publishes a video I get an email that says hey Google Analytics YouTube channel just published a video and the great thing is I'm checking my email and I'm getting this notification in Gmail so guess what I can watch the video right then and there just by clicking on the link in the email I don't even have to go to the channel but knowing that if you publish consistently and somebody does get the email once a week then it's more likely they're gonna engage especially if the content is original engaging and informative so 
So frequent video publishing equals more subscriptions. So according to Social Media Examiner, YouTube channels that publish videos more than once a week are performing much better. So if you can afford to publish more videos more than once a week, the chances of you gaining subscribers quicker are gonna be greater. So keeping a fixed frequency can help you quickly gain more subscribers. Posting videos is like almost like blogging. I always say start small if you can do one blog post a month. And then once you get in a routine, then you can ramp up the frequency. So from one blog post, you could do two a month, then four times a month, then once a week or twice a week. Same with the YouTube videos. You want to get into a rhythm, you know, start with once a month, then ramp it up. Okay, the, you'll find that the more you ramp it up, the more subscribers you're going to get. So tip three, optimize your YouTube videos. So optimizing your videos will help your content rank higher on YouTube. So this is a give must it's not a given it's a must you must optimize your videos if you want people to see them of course if you don't optimize people aren't going to see them then people aren't going to engage and and then not subscribe so it's just kind of a snowball effect so this is an important tip so i mentioned it at the beginning when we were going over all the items we're going to discuss this is the one item that is a must and a given to some degree because if you don't optimize your videos they're just not going to be found so you need that audience to watch your video so audiences who tend to interact more with your content have more chance to subscribe to your channel but they're not going to subscribe if they don't even watch your video so there is a snowball effect in play here if we don't optimize your videos so okay Rob what are some of the tips to optimize your YouTube video well let's go through some of those tips so to ensure your videos reaches the relevant audience on YouTube you need to optimize the title description description in the video tag. Okay, Rob, what do you mean by title, description, and video tag? So let's take a look at that. So when you actually create your YouTube video, you're going to have an opportunity to put in a title. You're going to have an opportunity to put in a description, and you're going to have an opportunity to add tags. So those are the three key areas. Okay, so once you put in that, what it looks like on the front end is this. So if I go back to YouTube, and here you can see another video that we did about a month ago, you can see what what is SEO? So if that's our topic, that's our title uh, or of the content of the video, then the title of the video is going to be what is SEO? And you can see we also added in some other content for the title. So what is SEO and how does it work? SEO tutorial for beginners and then our brand name. So we have some content to work with for the title. Okay. And then the description, we have a lot of characters to work with description. So use as much as you can here to describe what the video is about. Here here you can see we did that and so it's always good to include this information okay and then you can see we have tags up here SEO SEO tutorial for beginners digital marketing so we put in the necessary information here on this video to help us rank because if we don't optimize it we're not gonna rank and so you can see we just put a lot of relevant content around the description around the title and around those tags by doing so we're able to optimize this video and get found so that's just an example three of the things you can do to help optimize your YouTube video so if you want to watch more on how to optimize meta tags then I suggest maybe watching the other video we did on the subject how to rank YouTube videos so this goes into more detail about how to optimize the title the meta description and the meta tags but those are three quick fields or areas that you can use to optimize your video so just something to keep in mind write a long description with keywords timestamps and links so when I mean by timestamps with timestamp an audience can choose the section of the video that they want to look for and then links prefer to include relevant links of your other videos so those are just some additional tips to help keep your content engaging so remember when your content is engaging then people are gonna like it people are gonna share it and watch it later so upload a captivating thumbnail okay so you want to include a thumbnail that's gonna grab people people's attention you want to upload a transcript of the video so that goes back to when you're creating your content when you write your original content you want to keep a transcript of the content of the video so that you can upload that as well and then add a start screen and end screen to your YouTube videos so that way you know when somebody plays the video they're gonna see it what it looks like up front and then the way you finish it they're gonna see an end screen at the end and so you just don't want to keep it dark and black 
and non-descriptive. So according to Backlinko, using an exact keyword in your video title can help you with rankings. So high ranking, more views, more views, more subscribers. So that's what I've been saying all along. You need to get these videos optimized. So again, use an exact keyword in your video title. So let's go back again to that video I just showed you a couple minutes ago. What is SEO? So here we started out with a question. What is SEO? That's the name of the title. That's one, our exact title of the video. That's our exact keyword. Okay, so what is SEO and how does it work? And then SEO tutorial for beginners. So what is SEO is our exact keyword. And that's part of the video. That's the content of the video. That's in the title. And we use it throughout the description as well. So using that exact keyword in your video title can help with the ranking. So whatever your topic is, your title of the video or the topic of the video, include it in the title. So Backlinko also mentions that there is a moderate correlation between a channel's total subscribers and rankings. And so for some of you, this may be common sense. It's just like organic search. If you're not ranking, you're not going to get traffic. On YouTube, if you're not ranking, you're not going to get eyeballs on your videos and you're not going to get subscribers. So higher rankings can help you to get more subscribers, but you can't get those rankings unless you optimize. And so again, just for the sake of simplicity, going back, focus in on your title. Make sure your title matches the title of the video itself. When you're publishing your description, use all the amount of content available to you. So you can see it. this entire description has a lot of content. Maximize the content and then use tags. Using those three fields, those three areas can help you optimize your video and gain the necessary ranking you need to get viewers, which will turn into subscribers. So tip four, optimize your YouTube channel. So we just talked about optimizing our videos. Now we're going to turn our attention to our YouTube channel. So one of the easiest ways to ask your views to subscribe to your channel is really by creating a good, not even a good, a great YouTube channel trailer. You also want to add channel keywords, a description, and some good artwork, and then having sections and playlists to keep your videos organized. These are all good tips to creating a good YouTube channel. So let's talk about some of these, these tips here. So we want to give your audience a preview of what your channel is offering. So this is by hooking your audience with a trailer. So you can create a, a trailer to you know just give your audience an idea of who you are as a brand, what kind of videos you're going to be posting and give them a kind of a taste of what the future videos are going to be like. Okay. You can even tell them your release schedule in the trailer. So you can start out by saying, Hey, Hey guys, we're new to this. We're going to be posting one video a month, but as we get rolling, maybe two per month and you know, one per week, you know, just being honest and open and talking to your audience and get them excited about future videos. That's what the trailer is all about. So you also want to keep it that the channel description short, and interesting. So in your channel, you want to have a description of what the channel is all about, what kind of videos you're going to be posting. So in addition to the trailer, you want to write something short and interesting. Then we want to use keywords in our channel description, just like in the videos with what is SEO. We included what is SEO in the title. We included, you know, what is SEO in the description. And so we want to be true to what our channel is. So pick keywords, not only include those keywords in the videos, but include them in the channel description. Pay attention to the first 100 to 150 characters of your channel description because that's what's shown next to your channel in the search results. So for example, here you can see we have a description here. Simply Learn is one of the world's leading certification training providers. We partner with companies and individuals to address. And so you can see those characters 100 to 150 are what shows up in the channel description when somebody's trying to understand Hey, Simply Learn just uploaded this video. Who is Simply Learn? So you want to write short, interesting channel description so that when somebody's first introduced to your video, they could see what your brand's all about. So end your description with an appropriate call to action. So short, interesting, good call to action at the end of the video. A good call to action would be, hey, check out our next video or check out our latest video. Something that's going to gauge somebody and get them to watch one of your videos. So you want to pick 
pick interesting channel art. So let's turn our attention to the Simply Learn channel page. And here you can see we recently had reached a milestone. So recently reached the 200,000 K subscribers. So 200,000 subscribers is a big achievement for Simply Learn. We went ahead and updated our channel art. And I'm sure when we reach 500K, we'll update the artwork then too. But the point is you want to keep your channel art kind of interesting, hip and cool. And feel free to change it out every once in a while. So you have that option in YouTube to do. I mean, it's very simple. So here you can see Simply Learn's channel. If we go home, we got all our videos listed here. We got the about us, you know, something very short, and interesting about us. Here's our call to action for more information. Visit Simply Learn. So you want to make sure when you create your channel, get some good artwork in there, put your description in play and create your first videos and get them posted up there and optimize them accordingly. Okay, so this is the mother tips to go with that channel art and description is a profile picture relevant to your brand. So you always want to maybe put the, the company logo up there. Okay, so here you can see we have the company logo at accurate and relevant channel keywords. So if we go back to who we are, who are we? We're the world's leading certification training provider. Okay, that's who we are. Okay, we partner with companies and individuals. So we're all about training and training is one of our keywords. So you could see at Simply Learn, we provide online training and machine learning, AWS, Amazon Web Services, DevOps, big data, digital marketing, project management, a lot of different topics. So make sure that's included in the channel description. Feature the playlist on your homepage. So if we go back to the homepage, we can see here we have our channels. So you can see we have AI machine learning, trending technologies, cloud computing tutorials, DevOps tutorials, popular videos, big data. We have a lot of different channels. So you want to organize your videos into different playlists. So those playlists are going to feature on the homepage of your channel. So how you organize the playlist is totally up to you, but I would certainly create a playlist for different sections. So depending on your product, your services, think about how you want to organize. Don't just stick all your videos in one playlist. Then optimize the playlist titles and descriptions for search rankings. So just like the videos themselves, just like the channel description, you have an opportunity to optimize the playlist titles and descriptions. So be very keen on aligning the right keyword with the playlist title. So here you can see programming language tutorials, project management tutorials, digital marketing tutorials. So we're very clear on how we go about choosing our titles because we want to optimize those playlist titles. Okay, we can rearrange our videos in a playlist. So we want to rearrange the videos in a way that we're maybe putting the freshest, the most newest, the video that's been published last first. So almost in descending order, if you will. So we want our users to see what video has the latest in that particular playlist. So they're seeing the most recent first, but you can rearrange your videos any way you want. Feel free to play around with it. And of course, you can also take the video that's the most popular and put that up front so people could see that first. Vice versa, you could take a video that maybe hasn't gotten a lot of views or isn't ranked particularly high, maybe put that video up so it can get some views and some shares and likes. So how you rearrange your videos is totally up to you. Just have some rationale behind that. So choose a playlist thumbnail from a top performing video. So for example, if I go back to our YouTube page, you can see the top performing videos here. You know, for example, this one, we got a nice thumbnail here. What is machine learning? So if I click on that, that's Think wisely. Most popular videos, so 3,000 likes on this video, a lot of views, 250,000 plus views. So have a thumbnail to go along with that particular video. So according to Backlinko, YouTube SEO ranking factor study discovered that channel keywords have a small yet significant correlation with higher YouTube search rankings. So channel keywords. So when you're optimizing your channel and you want to include keywords, start 
start with your description. So if I go back to our channel, okay, if I go back about us, make sure your description has those relevant keywords in it. That's where it all starts. So in case you have any doubts, if you're not sure about everything we talked about on optimizing the channel, go ahead and drop a comment below because we do respond to every comment that gets posted on our videos. So if you're not sure how to go about optimizing your channel, when you say align keywords with the channel, what does that really mean? So if you want some clarity on that, go ahead and drop us a channel. If you're not sure about the trailer video, drop us a comment. We're more than happy to expand upon the explanation of how to best optimize your channel. Okay, tip number five, produce high quality videos. So we need to get in the habit of producing high quality videos because viewers don't prefer to watch videos that have poor audio and video quality. It's just that simple. You need to know what it takes to produce high quality videos. If you don't, you're just gonna discredit. You're not gonna come across as relevant. You're not gonna come across as qualified, professional. There's a lot of things attached to poor quality videos. So we need to create high quality videos for the end user. So let's Let's talk about some ways in which you can create high quality videos. And so the first is to avoid any noise in the background. So you want to have a nice quiet atmosphere, no distractions, so people can hear you clearly and only you clearly. You want to use good audio recording equipment. There's plenty of options available on the internet. Usually I would recommend going with something paid, not overly expensive because you get what you pay for. So if you use something free, it might not be of good quality and you might not have all the features and bells and whistles with a free option so you know use good audio recording equipment again it could be online or it could be some software just make sure that you're able to produce good high quality video and audio so when you do purchase that audio recording equipment you want to have something similar to an input volume meter that way you can see whether your audio is coming across or not so if if you're not seeing green lights then your audio is not coming across if it's red it might be distorted and so you want something that's going to signify that you're really pushing out good quality audio you want to create your videos in 1080 pixel size okay that's HD and so you want to have at least minimum 1080 so anything less than that is probably going to come across as not so good maybe staticky blurry not professional not high def so you want to create a high def video video and 1080 is about the minimum you want to go and then you want to plan your video script before filming so it goes back to some of the other points I made earlier you always want to have a video script available so you know what you're saying when you're recording your audio. That way you're not doing something on the fly. And then you want to use good lighting for video recording. So you don't want to be in a dark place. You want some nice lighting so your video comes across well lit. People could see you. They're not struggling to strain their eyes on what it is you're trying to show and appear because of poor lighting. Again, it just comes across as professional. So if you can you know, shoot a high def video with good audio, speaking clearly, having a professional script with some good lighting, then people are going to take you serious and they're going to start to listen and engage and, and see the video as good quality and very relevant and informative and share it. So use slow motion and jump cuts wisely. So there's some features you could do with your video. You know, Using slow motion and jump cuts are some of the features you can use to accentuate your points. And then set up a green background for recording. Again, this is for you know making sure that the video part of it comes across in good quality and then stabilize your video recordings with a tripod that way you're not moving your video camera all around and and again it's coming across as shaky and poor quality shoot horizontal videos you don't want to go vertical it tends to cut the screen so you want to stay horizontal so that people can see everything that should be included in the video okay, you want to capture a wider shot using a clip-on lens again a good feature a good tip to use use that wider shot okay so you could do that using a clip-on lens and then choose good video editing software I can't state this enough because you're putting all this time and effort into a video you need to be able to edit it to cut out you know some of the things you didn't want to say or maybe some poor quality or or you know you just want to have a smooth professional output 
for your video. And so you gotta have good video editing software. There's plenty of options available on the internet. Again, I would go with something low cost but paid. Usually free isn't exactly the way you wanna go if you're trying to create a high def, good quality video. And at the very least, review your work before publishing. I just said it a minute ago. I'll say it again, you want to be able to have a really professional video and high def. When you have a good professional video and high def with good audio, horizontal shots, you know, nice green background image, nice well lit, it's gonna come across as professional. And if you have a professional video, then people are gonna take you seriously. They're gonna see you as a professional. And then share or subscribe and like, and then they're gonna watch more videos. And, and that's how you start to build up a reputation as being a very professional organization. So just following these simple tips on producing high quality videos. So you want to review your work because if you don't, you put all that effort into it and then you're going to realize, hey, your video is low quality and then you're going to have to do it all over again. So follow these tips, get a high quality video and you should be on your way to ranking. In fact, according to Backlinko, YouTube preferably ranks HD videos. So you got to have that 1080 uh, pixel size. That way, you know, your video is going to come across crisp and clear and YouTube prefers that. Tip six, add a subscriber watermark to your videos. So this is a great feature in YouTube. So it's a feature that allows you to add a watermark that can be shown on all your videos. The reason why you want that watermark, because you want to keep reminding your audience to subscribe to your channel. The watermark can be whatever you want, but normally it's going to be some type of logo or brand and a call to action. And so how do you add a watermark to your video? Well, you log into your YouTube account. It's, it's pretty simple. At the top right corner, you're going to select your creator studio icon and then you're going to go to channel select branding and then add a watermark to your video so if we look at that in YouTube so here creator studio on the left side navigation I'm just going to click channel then I'm going to click branding and then once you click branding you have the ability to add your watermark and then you can add it to the entire video at the end of the video at a specific start time and then just click update and that's pretty much it so you want to be able to add this so that you can brand your videos with an image and then add that CTA. So this is a good, good feature for YouTube. It allows you to be consistent with all your videos by branding and adding that call to action. Tip seven, engage with your audience. So you want to be able to interact with your audience as much as possible. Just because it's a video and you can't see people doesn't mean you can't engage with them. So when you interact with your viewers, especially when you interact with them immediately, there's gratification. You know, everybody likes to be responded to. Nobody likes to be ignored. And so when somebody is responded to, there's a higher chance that your viewers are likely to gonna become customers. It's just customer service is, is how you really wanna look at this. Okay, so when you engage, you're creating a service for your customers. So here are some tips on how to engage with your audience. So first is at the end of every video, convey a thank you message to your viewers. You know, thank you for spending the time out of your busy day to watch this video. You know, some of our videos go an hour plus long. And so when somebody's taking an hour to watch a video, it's only the least you can do is thank them. Now, you can thank them and give them some information about where to go for more information. Because uh, if they watch the whole video, they're already in engaged and they're probably going to want to learn more. So you always want to follow up the thank you with where to go for more information, just like our videos always convey at the end. Okay, you always want to ask your audience for their feedback or ideas on the video. So with YouTube, there's a comment section and you always want to encourage comments. So comments can be in the form of feedback. So as you're watching this video, feel free to leave feedback on other ways to engage with your audience or some other tips to increase your subscribers subscribers on YouTube. So we're always looking for those ideas. We want to keep it engaging. So somebody may have some other ideas that we didn't think about. And so we always appreciate that from our audience. So we very much appreciate the feedback that our audience gives us. So not all the feedback is always going to be positive. Some of the feedback could be less than positive or even negative. There could be mistakes. So the idea behind getting feedback is you want to look at it. You want to read it and you want to react to it. You want to react to it positively. And 
the form of, you know, a thank you for the feedback and looking at the feedback, weighing it and incorporating the feedback. So you don't always want to make the same mistake twice in a video. So if there's something definitely wrong with the video that we're doing, for example, and somebody looked at it and gave us feedback on it, we'd certainly definitely take a deep look into that and try not to do the same mistake twice because likely that user is going to watch the video again. So you always want to learn from your mistakes okay? and you want to turn those mistakes or turn those comments into future videos. Okay, So create videos based on your commenters request. The audience is giving us feedback. We should take that as positive and sometimes that's creative. Sometimes those ideas for more videos. Okay, You always want to ask questions to your audience and reward excellent commenters. So we try to ask questions in our videos and when users respond with their answer, if there's an excellent comment or excellent answer, you know, we can reward them. You know, reward them in the form of, say, some type of gift card or gift certificate or promotion or, or something. There's always some way to incentivize somebody who provides excellent feedback. You can always give emoji hearts. There's so many emojis out there that you can use emojis just to engage with your audience based on the feedback they're, they're giving. The point is, if your audience is taking the time to give feedback, you always want to respond to it. And you want to respond to a positive. So emojis tend to have a positive connotation to them. And so responding with an emoji, especially to a favorite comment, goes a long way. So you can reward your community both on and off YouTube for their engagement and support. And that's just being creative. You can reward in many ways, many ways, not necessarily monetarily, but by recognition, you could do promotions, you could do something fun. There's always ways to reward and prefer to host live streams and interact with your audience. So you don't always have to do a pre-recorded video. There's certainly YouTube has them, other platforms like Facebook have them, Instagram. So you can certainly reach out to your audience audience with a live stream and that's talking directly to your audience right there in the flesh so when you can have an opportunity to talk to your audience and engage with them that's always gonna work because they can see personality they can see what you're all about and there's two-way conversation and so that will lend to more of a you know relationship so to speak with your audience so you want to create videos for subscribers and subscribers can get impressed when a channel dedicates a video for them so you know take the time out to create a video just for your subscribers subscribers are the ones who are most likely going to engage with you okay they're your loyal fan base so if you create something for them that's a form of a reward so you can captivate your viewers by uploading interesting YouTube stories as well you can also hear from your audience and, and get their videos and use their videos and upload them to your channel so according to backlinko video comments have a very strong correlation with ranking so as you create a video feel free to talk to your audience and ask them, hey, if you have any comments, feel free to put them in the comment section right below this video. I see that a lot now with a lot of videos and I'm gonna ask my audience right now to do the same thing. If there's anything you see about rewarding the audience or engaging with the audience, feel free to comment. We'd love to get your suggestions because if you can engage with the audience even more, then that's only going to net positive results, not only in rankings, but with your subscriber base. So comments are the way to go. Solicit comments, respond to the comments, reward the comments. Tip number eight, promote your videos on different platforms. So promoting your videos on different platforms has been around for many years. It's a good strategy. Once you create your video on YouTube, you want people to see it. You want to get it out there. So if you want to increase your YouTube subscribers, this is a strategy you have to perform. So let's take a look at all the ways you can use and leverage different platforms platforms to increase your subscribers. So before you do that, you want to research, discover how uh, you can use different platforms. So the first thing you want to do is look at the platforms you're already using. If you're using Facebook and Instagram, that's probably a good place to start, but there's other platforms you can also leverage and we're going to talk about those. So social media, most companies, most individuals are on in some form or fashion amongst the most popular like Facebook and Instagram. So you you can start there. So with Facebook, you can post something, include the link of your YouTube video. With Facebook, if you're a business, you have a business page, you're communicating with your community. And that's a great way to get started by promoting your YouTube video. You can also do the same on Twitter or Instagram or whatever platform you're on. Go ahead and post something or 
or tweet something and include that link to YouTube. You can participate in forums and blog discussions. So there's plenty of forums and blogs out there where you can participate in a discussion and include a link to the YouTube video if it's relevant and natural. So for example, here, there's a blog about machine learning. You can include if you have a video about machine learning in the response to that conversation. In this example, we've done that on Reddit. Okay, you can list your video in relevant and reputable directories. There's plenty of directories out there. There's plenty of video directories okay, that you can just go ahead and publish your video on. You can use testimonial link building. Okay, So somebody can provide a testimonial, include the link of your video. You can opt for influencer marketing. So if there's somebody that is associated that likes your brand or product and has a large following, you can ask them to post the video on your behalf. It's a great way to reach an audience fairly quickly. Okay, you can earn backlinks from relative, relevant and authoritative websites. So for example, if you look at this website here, Tetragenics, okay, there's a article here about, you know, certificate of achievements, okay, for AWS. So if you scroll down, we could see our video is included here in this particular web page. So this is a high quality web page, okay, that's generating a backlink for us. Not only is it generating a backlink, it's also generating traffic and awareness for the video. Go ahead and, and find out if there's any websites that are relevant to your video topic and see if you can collaborate with them on producing a web page to include that video. You can also take advantage of email marketing by adding your YouTube link in the email signature. For example, it's a simple email, any email client like Gmail or Yahoo or even Hotmail or Outlook is going to have an ability to, or give you the ability to add a signature. In the signature, you could simply just include a link to the video or to your YouTube channel. It doesn't have to be to a specific video, but it's a way to get people to your YouTube page or to that video. So the whole idea is more eyeballs, more potential subscribers. Engage your audience by posting your video links on community pages. So for example, you know, we're promoting something here on a community page and that's going to get some additional traffic over to us. You can always bookmark your videos on bookmarking sites like stumbledupon.com. Again, this is free, very little time to do this, but it's a chance for you to get the video out there and even generate a backlink. You can collaborate with other YouTube channels. This is always a good strategy. If you're creating creating a video on a particular topic on YouTube, chances are there's probably somebody else out there doing the same thing. It doesn't have to be necessarily a competitor. It can be a complementary product or service. And if you offer that, then go ahead and collaborate with them and see if you can exchange your videos on their channel. And you could take their video and put it on your channel in a particular playlist. Okay, so that's a way to collaborate with other YouTube channels is swap videos. You could join hot IPR QA sites and post answers to the questions related to your video. Like Core is always a good example or eHap. Okay, so Core, there's always a question to be posted. And if you have the answer to that question in the form of your video, then go ahead and post a response with a link to the video on YouTube. It's a great way to get the video noticed and it's relevant and natural. Okay, you can embed videos in your blog posts or if you're using a platform like WordPress, for example, very easy to go ahead and just take that video. You can even just put the link in the uh, blog post. I like this option. I think blog posts are always good because you don't have to be text heavy with a blog post. You wanna create a blog post that's nice and balanced with an image and text, but if you put a video to support your blog post, that goes even further. And blog posts themselves can be engaging and interactive with your audience. So having a video in your blog post always goes well in my opinion. Okay, so you could promote other videos in your end screen. For example, at the end of your video, you can always promote something related like we've done here in this example. So lots of ideas. Get your video out there, use them in email, use them in your blog post, go to free bookmarking sites like StumbleUpon, you know, collaborate with other people on YouTube, you know, go to Core, respond to a question, use social media to your advantage. There's lots of opportunities to get your video out there. The more you can get your video out there, the more traffic you're gonna get. The more traffic you get to the video, the more subscribers you're going to get. So that's how the game is played in order to get your video out there, but these are relatively you know low time consuming ideas to get your video 
If getting your learning started is half the battle, what if you could do that for free? Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. So with Twitter, it's all about tweets. It's actually a verb now. Uh, when you do something on Twitter, you actually tweet. And there are a lot of people out there tweeting. In fact, Twitter has over 1.3 billion accounts. So a lot of tweets going on in the world of Twitter. So as of the third quarter in 2018, last year, Twitter had 326 million global monthly active users. Okay, so active meaning every day using the platform platform on a daily basis. So a lot of people using Twitter, it's very easy to use as you'll find out. And what you're going to find out today is how to increase followers on your Twitter account so they can see more of your tweets. Okay, a little bit more about Twitter. There are 500 million tweets posted every single day. That's a lot of tweets. So you can imagine with every tweet is a hashtag that accompanies that tweet. So a lot of information being disseminated across the platform. So tweets with videos, so Twitter does allow videos as well as images, attracts 10 times more engagement than other forms of content. So if you watched our YouTube videos and some of the other videos we had out there regarding Facebook or Instagram, you'll know that videos do perform better. Twitter is no exception. So if you have a video, even if it's done on YouTube or if it's not published on YouTube, use it with Twitter. You're going to get more engagement. So Twitter has 75% of its users use the platform for news. Okay, so people go to Twitter to get their news. That's where they go. They don't go to a regular website, content-based website. They get their news via Twitter. It's just very easy to digest because it's so few characters. 75% of B2B businesses market on Twitter. So not only is it a B2C or business to consumer platform, it's a B2B business to business platform. So a lot of businesses are on Twitter basically promoting either a product service or trying to establish themselves in the industry using the platform so let's take a look at twitter and let's take a look at some of the ways in which you can increase your followers it all starts with your profile you always want to make sure you have a complete profile your name obviously the pl twitter platform that you have is going to have a handle okay in this example here it's a totally real person at totally real person is the Twitter handle and that's what you're going to want to use to disseminate your Twitter profile to others. So you want to make sure that you have a good image, you have a real name and a good handle that people can associate with and remember. So you want to be able to set up this profile with a keyword friendly bio, okay? A link to your website and a picture that represents your brand always helps. So make sure it's complete. You can even take a step further by customizing the color scheme of your profile. You can add a header image that sticks to your theme that will help your profile stand out. And so let's take a look at an example here. So if I go to Twitter here, if we go to Simply Learn, it's Twitter account, okay? Their handle is simply at Simply Simply Learn, okay? And they've customized the header. They use their logo. Now, if you're an individual, you probably want to use a nice profile pic here where they're based, a little bit about them. So just a, you know, customized complete profile goes a long way. You don't have to go overboard with an elaborate design, so to speak, but just make it stand out, make it associate with who you are as a person and a brand. Those are best practices in getting that profile up and running. You don't want to use something bland and generic, you know, take the extra step, create something unique, make sure your profile is unique you have a good image okay make sure it's complete with you know telling people who you are and what you're all about that's really the first step on really any social media platform so you want to promote your twitter profile to drive users from other social media platforms so when you actually get that twitter account set up and you actually do have your handle Go ahead and share it. That's the first step in getting followers. If you're already on Facebook, if you're already on Instagram, then use those platforms to announce that you're on Twitter. 
You can also take that a step further and you know send out an email to friends or family or like I said if you're on Facebook go ahead and set up a post say hey guys I'm on Twitter you know come follow me so you could also use business cards advertisements marketing materials and events to put that Twitter profile on okay so it doesn't have to be within the social media sphere it could be even on your website it can be even in email so you can basically promote that profile again you want to make that profile that handle easy to remember so totally real person is the profile in this example we're going to use that profile everywhere we can whether that be offline or online you don't don't be afraid to use it on a business card especially if it's easy i can just simply go to twitter and type in that handle so you want to stay active on Twitter with regular retweets, replies, and favorites. And that's just, it's just so easy to retweet and reply and add favorites. So let's take a look at that on Twitter. So you could just simply, I'm logged in as me. And if I want to retweet something that Simply Learn did, I can just simply click on the retweet button and I can add a comment if I want to. And then I'm going to retweet. It's that simple. So now that tweet is going to show up on my profile, my handle. And I could simply like it. If I scroll down here, okay, top 10 IT trends shaping 2019. Notice a simple tweet supported with an image. So I'm just going to like that. So I can even comment on it. I can click on the comment and click a reply here. Okay, and that's going to show up in this tweet here. Just like if I click on this, I'll be able to see what other people have written. And so it's that simple. If I want, I can just click on the email button and even send a message to somebody right from that tweet. The point is I can do everything I need to do right in the platform. But to get started, if you don't have any tweets, you know, go and find other companies similar to you, look at their tweeting, and you can always retweet that. That's a good way to get going with tweets. That's what I started doing when I started on Twitter in 2008. I didn't know what to write particularly, and I didn't know how to write it particularly well. So I looked at what other people wrote and, and tweeted and just retweeted those. That's a good way to get your Twitter account started. Okay, so engaging with users is a great way to get more followers. So on Simply Learn, I retweeted one of their tweets. I liked another one of their tweets, and it's probably going to get their attention. Somebody at Simply Learn is going to say, okay, Rob Sanders went ahead and liked us. And you know what? We're going to go follow this guy. He seems to be somebody who is an audience member who likes what we have to do, likes what we have to say, like what we're tweeting. Let's go ahead and follow him. And so that's a good way to get going with your Twitter account is to really start retweeting and liking other tweets from other users. So you can find an appropriate time to post your tweets to increase exposure, retweets, and followers. And you want to do this, you could do it within Twitter or as I'll mention later, you can do it in a social media platform like Sprout Social or Hootsuite or Later or Buffer. I mean, there's plenty of social media platforms out there for you to schedule tweets. Point is you want to be able to schedule those tweets when it's the appropriate time. So you don't want to do it in the middle of the evening because what's going to happen is likely by the morning, other tweets are going to bury your tweet. So you want to be able to find the appropriate time to post your tweets. So according to a survey conducted by HubSpot, the best time to post is between 12 and 3 p.m. And why is that? Well, most people are usually on lunch, checking their phones. Yes, Twitter has an app. And in fact, most people use the app just like on Instagram, just like on YouTube. The app is very popular on Twitter, so it's very easy for somebody to check tweets, especially during the lunch hour. And then from 5 to 6 p.m., that, that in-between time when, when people are wrapping up work or heading home. Okay, so weekdays have shown to have the maximum amount of engagement. So during the week, when people are working, highly engaged with whatever they're doing, depending on what industry you're in, they're likely going to check the Twitter and react during those times. Okay, so that was a, a survey conducted by HubSpot, but really what you want to do is you want to be able to use one of these social media platforms like a Hootsuite or later and find out exactly 
when are people engaging with your tweets? When are you, what time of the day, what day of the week are you getting the most retweets or the most likes? Okay, that's what you wanna do. So you can use this as a starting point, as a best practice, but eventually you're gonna to have to cater to your audience based on when you're getting your tweets engaged. So you wanna increase followers by following more people. It's that simple. And so it really is that simple. Let me rephrase that. So it really is that simple. So if I go back to Twitter, you know, Twitter's always going to recommend somebody for me to follow. And normally those are people that are similar as myself, okay? So they're not just gonna choose random people, they're gonna choose people who are following people you're following, so there's gonna be a connection to some degree. Or they could be people who use similar hashtags, tweeting the same content. So you wanna go ahead and follow people. The rule of thumb on Twitter is if you follow somebody on Twitter, chances are they're gonna follow you back. You know, I was once told when I was using Twitter that, hey, you want to give somebody about three days to follow you back. So that's always what the rule I stuck to. You know, wait about three days, start following people. You can see here 833 people that, or accounts, Twitter accounts that Simply Learns following, and over 10,900 followers to Simply Learns Twitter account. So for me, I don't mind having a nice balance myself. I have just as many followers as I do following, and that's a good thing. So, because you wanna be able to keep up with what people are tweeting, and so you can retweet. At the same time, you wanna be following people as well because they're gonna follow you back, okay? And that's how you can build up your Twitter followers, by following people, and it's as simple as clicking on a follow link. So, the key here is to follow people who follow your content, people who are followers of your followers, and you can use Twitter's who to follow list and upload your email contacts to Twitter, okay? Since they know you, they're more more likely to follow you back okay so you can use Twitter's who to follow list and so if we go back to Twitter here's the who to follow list and so this is what Twitter is going to recommend but you can click on this link here find people you know okay so if I click on find people I know then I can upload my contacts from Outlook or Gmail and they're gonna find people who are already on Twitter based on who I'm connected with. So generally that's how it works. That's a quick way to get more followers is to connect with people you know. By the way, I'm gonna follow Simply Learn because I wasn't following them prior. So now I just clicked on the follow button. Now I am following. So now I'm going to see Simply Learn's tweets in my feed. So let's take a second to look at a brand. Okay, so it's time for a brand watch. Let's have a look at some of the best tweets of 2018. Now remember, there are a lot of active users, millions of active users. That's a lot of tweets. So what we did was we scoured Twitter from 2018 and we went ahead and picked out some tweets that we thought were pretty good. And so the first one is Wendy's. Now, I don't know if any of you have actually eaten at Wendy's. I used to eat at Wendy's a while ago. I know their Frosties are pretty good. So what they've done is they incorporated that Frosty as part of a giveaway. Okay, so basically they're saying, hey, grab yourself a free Frosty with any purchase in our app. So they're encouraging people to use our app and then they're following that up by saying, hey, and then join us on Twitch from two to five Eastern as we unlock all that Frosty goodness. So they're promoting something that's going to happen on a specific point in time. This is of last January. They're encouraging people to use their app and they're using that Frosty as kind of a carrot, if you will, okay, as a catch, it's a giveaway. So they were able to, you know, basically wrap a bunch of things into one. So get, encourage people to take part. And I'm sure a lot of people went ahead and took part of this, but we could definitely see that 206 retweeted this tweet, 302 basically commented on it, and over 3,000 liked the tweet. So the tweet was good and it, it basically engaged with users. Who doesn't like a free giveaway, especially free Frosty? So that's why this particular tweet really does some justice for the target audience, their audience. They're, they're giving something away to their audience just by allowing them to you know, use their app. 
Okay, so this tweet combines a lot into one, and I like it. Apparently a lot more people than I did, 3,000 plus, also like this tweet. And so moving on to how to increase your followers on Twitter, you wanna mention other people in your tweets to increase engagement. So what do we mean by that? So let's look at Twitter. So go back, if we look at Simply Learn, just take a look at some of their tweets. What they're doing, if we scroll down here, they have hashtags. So they are mentioning specific hashtags, but you can also mention handles as well. So the hashtag is always gonna start with either the pound sign. But if we scroll down here, if you use the at symbol, you're actually mentioning somebody. So in this case, we're mentioning Matt Bailey. So Matt Bailey says is Matt Bailey's handle. And so if you get a shout out to somebody, they're gonna pick up on that and then they're going to probably follow you, okay? Who doesn't appreciate getting recognized for something, especially something as small as a tweet, okay? Notice I can go ahead and click follow if I wanna follow Matt Bailey, but it's not a bad idea to add people into your tweet. And you simply do that by just using the at symbol and using their Twitter handle. It's a good way to get recognized by that Twitter follower. It also increases engagement because it's adding validity to the tweet. And it definitely catches the attention of the person mentioned. Remember, if you use that person's handle, they're going to see that, that you mentioned them, okay? And what it's likely gonna do is start some type of Twitter relationship, okay? They're gonna then follow you, you're gonna follow them, and chances of them retweeting you in the future or mentioning you in the future is probably going to increase. And overall, that increases engagement. So another important thing you wanna do is find and use hashtags that are relevant to your brand and audience. So this is a must, this is mandatory on Twitter. You need to use hashtags. Twitter's all about hashtags. Every tweet that goes out should have a hashtag, okay? And so what you can do is figure out what hashtags are trending. So here, what Twitter does is they trends for you. So these are all specific hashtags that are trending. If it's Mother's Day, Happy Mother, hey, Sunday morning, whatever works for you. These are trends that happen to be moving, meaning a lot of people are using them, clicking on them, okay? So you can use a popular hashtag. What I would also recommend is you use a unique hashtag. The rule of thumb is usually about two hashtags in a tweet. But that's a rule of thumb, but rules are made to be broken. Do what's best for you. If you wanna include more than two hashtags, go for it. The only thing I'm recommending is include a hashtag. So find out what's trending. You could just look right in Twitter or you could just create your own unique hashtag. It works both ways, but when you have a hashtag in your tweet and somebody clicks on it, then they're going to go to that particular handle, that hashtag. And so when they look at the hashtag, they're gonna see all the tweets with that hashtag in it. So that's the idea behind hashtags. You want to have hashtags, okay? So if somebody clicks on a hashtag that you used, then they're likely going to see your tweet in that hashtag's feed, okay? So that's how hashtags work. You want to use hashtags, okay? But you wanna use hashtags that are relevant to your brand and audience. That's really the key. So hashtags help your tweets to be found through Twitter search, thus improving your reach and increase the visibility of your posts. So that's another benefit. Twitter has search functionality. So somebody can simply go in and start searching on Twitter. So if I go back to Twitter, I can just do a hashtag and start typing in something like Spanish and I'm gonna get some of the most popular Spanish hashtags or hashtags with the word Spanish in it. And so this is an idea for me that if I wanted to use a hashtag with Spanish in it, these are some ideas, but they're certainly searchable on Twitter. Okay, so if I just click on Spanish, okay, I'm gonna be able to see all the hashtags with the word Spanish in the hashtag. So definitely use hashtags. It's the most beneficial feature of Twitter, bar none. So some reasons why you using hashtags also a good idea? Well, you're gonna get more engagement and you're likely to get retweeted as well. So when you get retweeted, then that means more eyeballs because if somebody sees your tweet and retweets it, they're retweeting it for their audience. And so it could go viral, so to speak, on Twitter. And that's where the engagement comes in. So if you're using a hashtag that's trendy, well, somebody might like that. 
okay? If you're behind a specific movement or you're following a specific baseball or football team or cricket team or whatever team you're following, then if you use that team in the hashtag, that could also get you some, some likes. So don't be afraid to use hashtags, mix it up, play around a little, use something unique, use something that's trending, just use something but make sure it's relevant to the tweet. Find out what works for your competition. What works for them might work for you too. So, you know, I work with Simply Learn, but you know, Simply Learn has a good Twitter account. You know, they have lots of followers, they're doing a lot of tweeting. So if I wanted to be just like Simply Learn, well, I could simply just go to their Twitter account and see what they're doing. Okay, see what they're using as hashtags, see what kind of tweets they're implementing and see who's following them. So I can simply just click on the 10,900 followers that they have. And what I could do is I can go through and start following the people that are following them. So just mimic your competition to some degree Agree or mimic others in the industry. You know, look at what they're tweeting. Again, start out by retweeting some of the stuff they're retweeting if it's good stuff, if it's a good tweet. Don't be afraid to retweet even your competitors' tweets. Okay, use unique hashtags. Use the hashtags they're using. Look at who's following their brand. So you can really learn a lot from others in your industry including your competition because what works for them again might work for you especially when it comes to hashtags or people who's following them again people who are following them would likely follow you if you're in the same industry so it's as simple as looking at who's following them and following those same people remember the rule of thumb is if you're following somebody they're likely to follow you back so again you can analyze things like the number of followers they have the frequency of their tweets what their profile looks like how they respond to the competition of customers okay what are they tweeting about what types of content brings them more engagement meaning of all the tweets which one is getting the most likes or retweets get some sense of what they're doing and again when I say mimic I mean what really what I'm saying is pull best practices from that Twitter account this will give you an idea what you need to do to get more followers so it's always a good form of flattery when you can mimic what somebody else is doing just like every other social media platform following Twitter influencers who belong in your industry is always a good idea. So if you're in the food industry and there's these star chefs out there, probably not a bad idea to follow those star chefs. You know, if you're in the technology industry, well, probably not a bad idea to, you know, follow Bill Gates or Elon Musk or Richard Branson or somebody else in, that's a big influencer, has an influence on a lot of people, okay? But make sure they're in your industry. That's the key. If you can make sure they're in your industry and you follow them, chances are if they look at your Twitter account and see you're posting or maybe retweeting some of their tweets, they're likely to follow you. And if they're following you, your tweets are gonna show up on their handle, on their feed. And so don't be afraid to go out and connect and follow those influencers. It's a good way to boost up your followers. So again, this will help you gain followers since you can replicate what they've done with their profile. So again, just like the competition, mimic what your influencers are doing. Okay, so people tend to follow people who follow influencers. So you're all of one like mind, so to speak. Okay, influencers might retweet or share your post if they find you retweeting favorites and replying to their post. So remember, if you're following a retweeter, or excuse me, an influencer, and you retweet their post, chances are they might retweet one of your posts Post and again, put you in front of a large number of people since they're influencers. So all of these are good, valid reasons to follow influencers because if you're out to increase your reach and exposure, it's hard to ignore influencers in your industry. Okay, you wanna use images and videos while tweeting. Remember, videos get multiple, multiple times more engagement than not using them. At the very least, use images. But you know, use images, don't use stock photography. Use images that are relevant. So one of these tweets caught my eye here from Simply Learn. So if I click on, you know, here, it was further down here. It looked like, you know, these are people who are engaging in a conference. And it might've been one that Matt Bailey was at. So it was a retweet from Matt Bailey, as a matter of fact. But you could see what Simply Learn's doing. 
is they're including either a video or they're including an image in every tweet. And so that's likely to boost up engagement. So according to Buffer, which is a, another social media platform, adding a relevant high quality image in your tweets can help you gain more than 150% engagement. Okay, videos are six times more likely to be retweeted. So if you have an Arsenal video or even one video, don't be afraid to use it. My recommendation is try and use images as much as you can in almost every tweet. Images go a long way and again it's going to help improve engagement, meaning more retweets, more followers. Okay, more followers, more eyeballs. So it's a snowball effect just by using images. Okay, so let's take a look at another brand from 2018. Okay, pizza, always my good example to use on these webinars. I like pizza. Here this just says it all. You know, they're talking about art and they're using pizza in the form of art. So they didn't really have to say much else here. This pretty much says it all. And they did get some retweets, they get some did some likes. So sometimes you don't have to say a lot to make your point. Sometimes just the image itself will do the job. This was actually not from 2018. This goes all the way back to 2016. So it still holds true. If you use an image, that image is going to get engagement. Okay, so on Twitter, just like most other social media platforms, you can promote your tweet. So you can use Twitter ads to do that. So you can promote your tweet and what you do by promoting it is putting it up above so that most people will be able to see it. Okay, so see if we can find an example. If I go here, I could see this person is promoting their handle, but if I go down here, I can see a promoted tweet by Constant Contact. So they're promoting their tweet here. So it's not a bad idea if you have some media budget to go ahead and either promote your tweet or advertise on Twitter. So what that's going to do is put you in a more prominent position and get your tweets out there. And the whole idea for that is to get people to engage. Here you can see a call to action from Constant Contact. So if I click on that, I'm gonna go to probably a landing page on their website. And so the whole idea when you advertise on Twitter is really just like any other social media platform, you wanna put yourself in front of the right audience. And so Twitter's no exception. So with Twitter, you could put yourself in front of the right audience. So what you could do is you could promote a tweet, you know, do promoted trends, or you could do promoted accounts. So you have a number of different advertising options on Twitter. What we just looked at was, you know, looking at promoted accounts and a promoted tweet. So when you do advertise, there are advantages. You have to pay only after achieving your marketing objective. So that's a benefit of Twitter. The cost per click, it's a cost per click model. So it tends to be fairly low. You could tell your audience. So again, you're picking and choosing who you want your promoted tweet or trend or account to be in front of. And it's targeting is based on either engagement or it's based on keywords i.e. hashtags. So really you could tailor who you want your tweet or your handle to be in front of. And so that's the really the benefit of Twitter. If you have a lot of active users on Twitter, you can really put yourself in front of those active users if they're your relevant audience at a low cost per click. So it's definitely worth the test. So you wanna offer Twitter support to your users, okay? So I can't stress this enough. Okay, so what you wanna do is when users have questions about your product, they're more likely to tweet you for support. Hence, they're likely to follow your account. So don't be afraid to use the messaging option as well. So we go back to Twitter. Okay, chances are somebody might have a question for you. Here you can look at Bing ads. It's great connecting with PPC experts. Can't believe tax season is here. We've got some great insights. So what they're doing is they're using the messaging app, but they're offering that messaging app in the form of customer service. So don't be afraid to use you know direct messages to reach out to people in the form of support. What you don't want to do is buy Twitter followers. Chances are you're going to get the wrong followers. So even though it may boost your Twitter follow account, these bots cannot use or buy your products or services. So stay away from all sorts of buying of Twitter followers. You wanna build your Twitter following naturally. 
Twitter's also cracking down on bot followers. So a lot of bot accounts that were paid to follow users were shut down, shut down by Twitter. So just my point is everything we've mentioned to date is what you want to take advantage of. Okay, if you want to pay for something, pay for a promoted tweet. Reach out to influencers. Look at what your com competition is doing. Use hashtags. Okay, these are all best practices and organic ways to build followers. So don't get involved with anything that's going to involve bots and adding thousands of followers to your Twitter account because chances are it's just going to lead to no engagement. So create useful and relevant content. So what we started out by saying is, hey, if you're not sure what to do, retweet. Retweet what somebody else is doing. You know, look at your competition's Twitter account. See what they're tweeting. Get some ideas as to what you want to tweet. So you want it to be useful and relevant to your industry. Okay, you want somebody to engage. That's the whole idea behind Twitter. The whole idea is if you're gonna tweet something, you wanna get somebody to engage with it. So use Twitter polls, your old recent blog posts, brand news, industry news, and events, and highlight customer stories. I mean, all of those are ideas that you can do to put content out there. Okay, so for me, one of the things I do is I'm definitely one for industry news. So if I'm in the industry of digital marketing, if Google did a recent algorithm update, I'm going to likely tweet about it or retweet it. I also am a blogger. So on my particular website, if I blog, I'm gonna make sure that blog gets over to Twitter. So those are some ideas in which you can create useful and relevant content on your Twitter account. You definitely wanna get that content out there, but you wanna make it useful and relevant. Quality over quantity because you want people to engage. So bring variety to the type of content you share. So I'm in digital marketing. I deal with pay-per-click, SEO, but am I gonna just do pay-per-click and SEO? No, I know that analytics, I know that you know Google Tag Manager, I know that A-B testing, all of those are elements of digital marketing. So I'm gonna branch out and talk about some of those things that support digital marketing. So that's an example of bringing a variety to the type of content you share. So don't just stick to one thing. You know, feel free to reach out a little bit. Shake things up by sharing other forms of updates, like engaging quotes and questions. These work best when complemented by an image and an act as a great discussion starter. So good point here. Even if you want to branch out of your industry and just throw in a nice, useful quote, it's always a good way to gain some attention and get some engagement. Okay, let's look at another brand and see what they've tweeted about. So we're looking at Forrester here. So think about emotional qualities and their implications. So here you can see customers that feel surprised or grateful or appreciated. They're sharing that insight with you. And so this was interesting when I saw this. So what I did was I simply, you see the hashtag here, for digital basically if you want to look at this particular study i just went to twitter and i typed in that hashtag and now i'm going to be able to see you know some of the other studies that they've done here you can see top 10 it trends shaping 2019 so i'm just following the twitter handle that they used so forrester does a lot of good research a lot of good insights and so what they've done here that makes this tweet look so good is they've actually put an image of the results in the tweet. So they used an image to help gain engagement or increase engagement. Notice they also gave a shout out to somebody as well as used some good hashtagging. So good tweet. This was back in 2016, but again, a good use of the image with the tweet. So you wanna organize tweet chats to interact with your users and bring in new followers. So, you know, you basically want to be organized when you're dealing with, with chats. So tweet chats enable you to send out tweets on a particular topic using a designated hashtag. So during a certain time to interact with your, your followers and other users. So you could do it at a specific time to really get out a specific topic but you want to be able to stay organized so that you know you what you're chatting about is reaching the right audience and you're getting the right following and the right engagement okay you can also pin your best updates and tweets to your profile so you can just use that pin and what that's going to do is pin it to the top and keep it there so that you know people who go to your Twitter handle are going to be able to see that best 
tweet that you've done. So what you want to do here is use the one that's most engaging. So pinning your best update or tweet, meaning the one that's really had a lot of engagement, meaning retweets and followers and likes, you want to do that. You want to pin that to your profile and that will enable first time visitors to see it. And if they could see something that other people engaged with, then that's going to encourage them to share and probably follow you. So, and, and that's always what you want to do. You always want to put your best foot forward. So pin your best tweet to your profile. So I mentioned this earlier, use tools to schedule when to publish your tweets. So here are some of the most popular platforms. You know, I use Sprout Social. So if we take a look at Sprout Social, here I'm in Sprout Social. I'm connected to my Twitter account. I can simply just start tweeting about something here. So you can see it's gonna let me know how many characters I have remaining. So 280 to start out with. When I'm done tweeting, notice I can add an emoji, I can upload media, I can tag a specific location, okay? I can even, you know, call out a specific Twitter profile. Now I can schedule this myself or I can use the schedule below. I can pick and choose a time to schedule the tweet. Now again, you wanna be able to use the Sprout Social, whatever social media tool you're using to figure out when the best time of day and the day of the week to actually tweet. When are you getting the best engagement? So ideally, that's what you wanna do. You want to tweet when you're likely to get the best engagement, when those eyeballs are actually gonna look at that tweet, okay? But you also want to separate out your tweets so they're not on one on top of another. Because if you actually tweet back to back, then those tweets are just gonna get buried. So if you spread them out a little bit, then you're likely to maximize your number of impressions or eyeballs on that tweet. So if you schedule a tweet, multiple tweets in the same day, then post them a few hours apart or an hour apart. So that way you're always gonna get that maximum visibility. So these social media platforms really help you in not only scheduling, but figuring out what tweets got the best engagement and when. And then that way you can replicate that success. So again, it's not just Sprout Social, Hootsuite, Buffer, they'll help you determine the exact time your audience is most active and schedule posts to increase traction. So, you know, most of these social media platforms do the same thing. So really what you wanna do is you really wanna nail down that exact time your audience is gonna be most active, okay? That's the whole idea behind using it. And when you actually do tweet, you are gonna get results. And these social media platforms are gonna share those results with you. And then when you understand based on your audience behavior, when they're engaging, when they're not engaging, that's when you're going to fine tune your scheduling. So what you also wanna do as you're doing these tweets, as we looked at earlier with Wendy's, is run contests or giveaways. Remember, Wendy's gave away that free Frosty. You don't be afraid to give away something if it means more engagement, more eyeballs, which could lead to basically future customers. So contests can help increase your reach and exposure, and each new participant can be considered as a potential follower. So it also gives your followers an opportunity to tag their friends who would be interested in participating. So really come up, this is a great way to be creative, come up with a good idea to get your, your audience involved because what's likely gonna happen is your audience is going to share this contest with others that aren't following you. And so what's gonna happen is when they share it, you're gonna get more followers, you're gonna get more eyeballs, and again, potentially more customers. So embed your Twitter updates on your website. You could simply do that. Uh, it's very simple, but when you do, then people to your website will be able to see your tweets. So if I just go to my website here, if I scroll down, we actually have your know, Twitter embedded on our website as well, because we want you know people to see what we're tweeting about. And you could see, I just retweeted the Simply Learn tweet at the beginning of this particular webinar, and it's showing up in my feed here. So that's when people actually go to my website, they'll be able to see what I retweeted, and that's gonna help Simply Learn out, because Simply Learn is likely gonna get some clicks on this particular tweet from my website. So it's also a good way to keep your website fresh and updated because if you're an active Twitter user and you're tweeting a lot, then hey, that's gonna show up on your website and it's gonna show that, hey, you're fresh, you're engaging, you keep up to date. It's just gonna make it look good and make your website feel fresh and not stale. 
So embedding your Twitter updates will help you add new followers as well because it's people who are coming to your website that may not even know you have a Twitter account. So you can also do this in a blog post and a newsletter and other forms of communication media. So it doesn't necessarily have to be just your website, but I would definitely recommend it because it will give a boost to your Twitter account. So now let's take a look at the final brand watch. Let's take a look at another tweet that caught our attention. And this is from PlayStation. So PlayStation is mentioning, hey, we got a multi-view on Apple TV today with support for up to four live channels on one screen. Okay, so you know they're promoting a new feature that they have with PlayStation. And you can see they supported that with an image and they got some really good engagement here. So they're basically saying, hey, look what happened to us today you know, check out this new feature that got supported on Apple TV. So you never know what's going to happen with a tweet. When you tweet, good things are likely going to happen, whether that be somebody liking it, retweeting it, or somebody adding you as a follower. Something good is going to come out of tweeting. Twitter is an easy platform to use. And if you take into account all these best practices, you are going to increase your Twitter followers. Today, we're going to talk about how to increase Instagram followers. Today's webinar, we're going to have some tips and, and best practices for you to take advantage of to increase Instagram followers. So let's get started and talk a little bit about Instagram. So Instagram is not really an up and coming platform. It is already up and coming. A lot of users. In fact, 500 million daily active Instagram users. 500 million daily. Okay, the user base growth of more than 300% year over year. So it's growing and growing and growing. It's become more and more popular ever since it's launched back in 2010. And then there's more than 100 million photos uploaded daily. So it's a platform where you can upload photos, tag those photos, even use and implement videos. And photos have become very popular with the advent of mobile technology that the Instagram app makes it easy for you to post your photo. So there's no surprise there's a growth. There's no surprise there's a lot of users. There's no surprise that there's 100 million photos plus uploaded daily. And then there are 400 million stories posted daily. So when you post something, you can create a story out of it. And there's 400 million of those per day. And then there's more than 50 billion photos shared to date. So since 2010, platform now which is now owned by Facebook has become really really popular a good place for you if you have your own company if you have your own brand if you have your own product it's a good place for you to really showcase that service that product that brand because of the user base how easy it is to use and the wide reach it has for you in which to tell your story so I mentioned there are lots of photos shared today close to seven billion dollars revenue generated through Instagram mobile. So on top of everything I just said, there's a lot of e-commerce going on here too. So Instagram is a platform in which there's e-commerce integrated within the platform. So as a business who offers up products, you can actually generate revenue for yourself. On the flip side, Instagram, which is owned by Facebook, has an opportunity to sell advertising space on Instagram. So Instagram is an e-commerce platform to say the least. In fact, Instagram is, because it's so popular, because because it's part of Facebook's advertising platform, there are more than 2 million advertisers on Instagram. So amongst all those stories, videos, and photos, and hashtags, you'll see some ads. And then because you'll see ads, because you'll see users, you're going to see businesses. It's just a good place to really set up shop and really tell your story through the world of photos and videos. So 25 million plus businesses have already migrated over to Instagram, and that's growing and growing growing and growing. So it's an opportunity for you to work with other businesses. So the arrow is definitely pointing up on Instagram. There's a lot going on here. Easy to use application, especially when it comes to photos and videos. So we're going to go through some tips and tricks today. And we're going to talk about everything there is to know about Instagram and how to increase your followers. So let's take a look at tip one here. So because Instagram is an application, everything you do on it, it is through the application. Now you could certainly view a web page version on it, but you really can't do much out of that. So if I go to my Instagram account, for example, using my desktop, I could see my profile and I can edit my profile to a degree, but everything you're doing is through the application. 
happen. So when it comes to that, tip one here is take advantage of your bio. So regardless of what industry you are, you're in, who you are, you really want to have a clear and concise and compelling bio. Why? Because this is your introduction to the world. You want people to know who you are. And because if you don't really become very clear to people, they're not going to follow you. So this is where it all starts. You need to take advantage of your bio, have a clear and concise bio, and have a link to your website or some contact information. So to me, this is where it all starts. You got to have a bio because that's what people are going to look at and they're going to decide whether to follow you or not based on primarily that bio. That's where it all starts. So make sure you have a good bio. That's tip number one. So you have to make sure that your landing page is also mobile optimized since most Instagram users are on mobile. So if you're going to put a link to your website and somebody's on the Instagram app and they see your bio and they like it and you have a link to your website, make sure that landing page they go to is mobile optimized. So tip number two, everything you do on Instagram when it comes to posting evolves around hashtags. So that's the backbone of the platform. Just like most platforms out there, social media platforms like Twitter or Facebook, Pinterest, you're gonna have hashtags accompany those posts. So Instagram's no different. But in this case, you really, really wanna take advantage of the hashtags. So hashtags are there to help users find your content. So you wanna start out by using hashtags that are relevant to your business. So if you're in the food industry, you're gonna post something related to food. Do the appropriate appropriate amount of research to find hashtags to describe your brand and also are being searched on Instagram. So what does that mean? That means do a little bit of homework on Instagram. You know, see what searches or see what other brands in your industry are using for hashtags. Don't be afraid to use the same hashtag, but mix it up. Hashtags are important. So don't be afraid to put a hashtag in there that really defines what your business is about. But if it's relevant, use other hashtags that are popular or people are using to find information. So mix it up, but the key here is relevancy. You wanna make sure you align your hashtags with your content and making sure the connection between the hashtag and the content is relevancy. So using the popular tags on your photos or videos might get you some immediate engagement, but it may not help with future goals like long-term engagement, new interested followers and sales. So here really what I'm trying to say is look, pick and choose your hashtags carefully because if you use something broad or something non-relevant, yeah, you may get that click to your Instagram page, but that doesn't necessarily mean somebody's gonna follow you or that doesn't may really mean somebody's gonna be interested in what you have to offer. So if you use something really popular and broad, yes, you're gonna get short-term gratification, but not long-term interest. Tip number three, post your content at the right time. So according to Sprout Social, which is a social media scheduling platform among other things so they deal with a lot of people using their platform and posting content via their platform they have data and they're telling us based on the data they've collected that the best time to post is between 2 and 3 p.m. and the best day to post is Thursday now that may be all fine and true according to a sprout social study and so you may want to go with this 2 to 3 p.m. and this is probably local in case you're wondering what time zone referring to so this is all local to you so go ahead and try that out try 2 to 3 p.m. on Thursday the thing is what you're gonna have to do eventually is figure out what the best time to post is okay so if you're putting out a lot of content and you're putting out content throughout the week at certain times of the day or throughout the day you're gonna have to determine which time of day and what day is generating the best engagement for you who's looking at your post at what point of the day what day of the week. And so you're going to really have to lean on a social media platform to help you determine that because they're going to have the data that you need to determine what the best time of day to post is. Okay, so we'll talk about social media platforms here shortly. We just know that when you post, post with some rationale in mind. Ask yourself before you even push that publish button or before you even schedule that post, this time of day and this day of the week makes sense. So you always want to post at the right time because you could be missing your audience. So remember, when you do this, you're gonna be working with some platform and Instagram also has some analytics for business accounts. So Instagram will also give you some feedback as to how your posts are performing. And we're gonna talk about that here shortly as well. So 
Let's move over to tip four here. So steal followers from your competitors, okay? So if you're dealing in a very competitive industry and your competitors have a lot of followers, it's very, very easy to see who's following them. So the easiest way to do this is just interact with your competitor's followers. You could follow a user, like or comment on their photos. And so the more you engage with people, the more you stand to gain from them. So you could see who your competitors followers are and you can add them as a follower just by following them so start engaging with them if they're liking your competitors brand then what the chances of them liking your brand could be great so check out who your competitors followers are if they seem like somebody who you would want to be following your brand, then go ahead and interact with them. And how you interact is, again, you can like something that they post or you can comment on something that they posted. Okay, engage with them, okay? It doesn't take that much time. It's a good way to gain followers. So if we're on Instagram, we can simply just click on the brand's followers. So here I can see this brand has 127 followers and here I can see all the followers. And what I could do is simply just click on one of the followers and I can go to their profile. And from there I could see what they've posted in terms of videos and images and I can like or comment. So just doing something as simple as this gets you an opportunity to engage with somebody who can then turn around and follow you. So tip five, pay for sponsored posts and product reviews. So a number of ways you could do this here. So pay for a sponsored post. So you could find an influencer who satisfies a couple of requirements. They have large following and an email address in the profile. So you can connect with them and ask them for sponsored post pricing. So it's as simple as that as reaching out to somebody who has a large following. Okay. So if you do this, then it's gonna put you in front of a large number of people. And so by doing this, it'll help expose your brand to that larger audience and help build your cre credibility because you're connecting with somebody who has a large audience as well. So do a little bit of homework, find people out there in your industry who has a large following and make sure they have that email address in their profile so you can contact them. And when you contact them, you know, ask them for sponsored post pricing. So if the influencer has an email address, then they're open to sponsored post or shout out. So that's the key. So they gotta have that email address. And when they do, then it's all about asking them and connecting them with them on being a sponsor to one of your posts. Okay, you wanna get yourself out there in front of people. This is the quickest way to do that. Okay, so tip six, we wanna use geotags for easier discoverability. Okay, so tag your images, videos, or stories by tagging the location, city, or venue where it was posted from. So very easy to do as you're posting. Just go ahead and, and there's an option in there to say, hey, where are you located? Or what city are you located in? So locations have their own feed and stories which you can contribute to. So go ahead and add that extra element to your tags. So if somebody's in that location, the chances of them engaging are going to be great and it's good for local businesses because if you're local and you're posting your location then again somebody in that location is likely to engage with you so tip seven use Instagram stories to attract followers and grow your user base so stories a really big feature on Instagram so what stories could be used for is just show vit footage of an environment so it could be your office it could be your home it could be you know the playground it could be the golf course it could be anywhere that you want to show vintage of so you want to post news relevant to your industry so if you're in the food industry hey why not go in the back into the kitchen and post a story about how a particular bread or cake is made okay show off your product so if you are in that food industry and say you're in the pizza making business perfect opportunity to show people via an Instagram story how to make that pizza and how you make that pizza what ingredients you use how unique is your particular product? And that's really what you wanna get across when you do a story. You wanna show something unique and relevant that's going to grasp people's attention. You can promote a company event. So if you're celebrating, say 200,000 subscribers, create a YouTube video or you can create an Instagram story. It works just as well. So you can endorse your company's blog posts, you can post positive user reviews. So these are all features of a story. 
increase interactivity with polls, sliders, etc. And then you can also mention other companies that work with or follow you. So great use of Instagram stories is do a shout out to somebody else. So Instagram stories is a really big feature with Instagram. Check it out. You know, you can just do a search for Instagram stories. In fact, let's get some of you users involved. What best practices do you have when creating Instagram stories? Why don't you go ahead and share your Instagram story with us by putting that Instagram story in the comment section below. So we want to get everybody involved here because there's thousands upon thousands of great Instagram stories out there to be shown and viewed and engaged with. So go ahead and share your Instagram story. If you have any other tips or tricks, then go ahead and put those in the comment section so that everybody can benefit from them. So the only thing to keep in mind when you're creating these stories is what are your followers interested in seeing? So your stories could teach or promote something to your user base. So always keep that in the back of your mind. You know, for me, I always go back to what industry are you in? If you're in the food industry, hey, you know, people who are following you are interested in food. If you're a pizza company, you know, show off that pizza. If you're a bakery, show off how you make your breads and goods, baked goods. Whatever it is you have, show it off because if somebody's following you, that's what they're interested in. So tip number eight, highlight important stories. So you wanna highlight, highlights serve as the easiest way to create a first impression for a potential follower. So with highlights can be used to tease what your content's about, create a trailer for what your brand offers, promote and promote your product. So highlights are there, it's a good feature, it's a first impression for potential follower. So it teases what the content's about. It creates a trailer, so to speak, for your brand and promotes your product. So use highlights. And again, any users out there who have good examples of highlights, go ahead and put those in the content section or comment section uh, right below this video. So remember, stories have only a 24-hour lifespan, so highlights can be used to give them a second wind. Okay, so highlights serve a purpose. It teases what the content's about. It promotes the product and it really kind of accentuates that story. Tip number nine, ask for followers. So sometimes people need a little push before they can follow you on Instagram, even if they enjoy your content. So you can ask users to become your followers in the caption, the comment section, or even work it into your content. So in other words, when you're posting something, don't be afraid to say, hey, follow me. You know, I got some good stuff here. Be confident. You don't want to do it for every post, of course, but, you know, pick and choose. If you feel you have a really good post, you know, really good image that you think uh, is going to gain a lot of followers and engagers, then you don't necessarily need to put a caption in there. But if, if it is popular, then go ahead and say, hey, this is a popular post. You know, think about following me or put something in the comment section. You want to do it kind of succinctly. You don't want to be begging, but just work it in to some degree. Okay. But don't be afraid to have some confidence and asking for followers. So when you do this, it's very similar to how we do it on YouTube. So you can ask viewers to subscribe to their channels at the end of the video. So it's if on YouTube, basically you're saying, hey, if you like what we have, go ahead and subscribe. It's no different on Instagram. If you have something you've posted, just go and say, hey, you like this? You know, go ahead and follow us. It's that simple. So tip number 10, take on the latest trends to get more followers. So align your content to cater to trending topics or hashtags to improve engagement and discoverability. So really what we're trying to say here is, your competitors, follow influencers. What are the latest trends? And you can get an idea of the latest trends by looking at hashtags. So what hashtags are trending? Which ones are people using the most? So really what you want to do is whatever's trending in your industry, you know, ride that wave, so to speak. Now it doesn't have to take on your entire profile, but there's nothing wrong with one or two posts. If something's really taking on popularity, then go ahead and post about it as well. You know, for example, in the wine industry, if there's a new wine that really came out that's really gaining some popularity, go ahead and post about it with the same hashtag and with the unique hashtag. So don't be afraid to, you know, ride the wave of popularity, so to speak, because it shows that, you know, you know what you're talking about. It adds some credibility and it's going to get some, you know, viewers over to your Instagram profile. So keep in mind, you need to keep your content relevant because if your audience is interested in what you have to offer, then they're going to be engaged. However, you know, if you're joining the discussion in a relevant manner, keeping in mind whether your audience will interact or not is important, 
but just always keep in mind you always want to stay within your industry and relevancy for your target audience so tip number 11 run contests and giveaways and so just like on youtube just like on facebook i mean instagram is no different you can increase reach and exposure by running contests since most followers would tag their friends to let them know about it it's a good idea to run contests and so what's an idea of a contest well Again, if you're running a, a pizza parlor, you know, you could say, hey, what's your favorite pizza or give me your favorite pizza ideas and you can run a contest and you know you can have people even create their own pizza and post an image of it you can have people create stories on the best ways in which they create pizza or their experience in another pizza parlor there's lots of things you can do to create a contest and you don't always have to give something away you could just do something for fun especially if you have a lot of followers if you have a lot of followers and somebody's going to take part in it so don't be afraid to run contest just to make Make it fun and light it up a little bit so each tag can bring you a new audience member who could be a potential follower so anytime you run a contest people are gonna tag their friends to let them know about that contest so those friends are gonna come over and likely engage so that's the beauty of running a contest or giveaway is chances are words gonna spread and it's gonna get you some new followers so that's the the end benefit so to speak but the real benefit is keeping your audience engaged so tip number 12 we want to stay consistent with posts so having a consistent pace and theme for your posts can have a huge impact to convert visitors so when we say consistent you know if you're again that pizza parlor stay within pizza you could branch out a little maybe and talk about salads or talk about beverages to you know as a complementary factor to the pizza okay but don't talk about hamburgers if you're focused in on pizza so we want to stay consistent consistent with your theme this method involves less effort with a faster production of Instagram content so that mean what we're really trying to say here is focus stay focused on who you are if you do that if you're consistent and you're gaining some followers and that's what people are coming to you for the content that you're good at for the industry you're in okay so if you start varying it and branching out then it's gonna muddy the water suppose so to speak and you're probably gonna get less engagement so set a theme on Instagram by maintaining consistency in your personality filters colors and layout and really what I'm referring to is post and when you have post something you're you're really creating a personality for yourself Yeah. Okay, so if you're in fashion, for example, and you're in the jeans industry, well, jeans, 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 right? That's your personality. Accentuate it with different outfits related to jeans. But, you know, when you start talking about dresses and shoes and, and that kind of blurs your, your personality a bit. So if you stay consistent within jeans and outfits that go with jeans, then I think people are going to start to pick up on that personality. So tip 13, keep track of your Instagram following so you can analyze the growth of your channel with tools like social blade that could tell you how many followers you've lost over time and how engaged they are okay so you can use data gather from here and from Instagram business account to diagnose where, where you're faltering so let's take a look at social blade as an example here so if I go over here I'm gonna go to social blade here I can enter in basically any account after a register and I could see how that account has performed you know where they rank you know how many uploads they have what country they focused on what industry and the beauty here is I could see and I'm looking at YouTube as an example I could see you know how my post to perform well you could do this for Instagram you could do it for Facebook so you can really get an idea of how your accounts performing so social blades a great platform for measuring and again you do also have Instagram business insights so with Instagram business insights basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna go to your app right and then from the app you could basically look at your insights from there so in the app itself you're gonna click on the upper right three lines and from there you're gonna see insights and when you go to insights you're also gonna see you know what your reach is how many impressions and some engagement metrics in terms of your audience where they're located the age range okay you're gonna also see 
see some content related information. So there's a lot you could see from the, I mean, the Instagram insights, analytics insights, but you can also see additional information from Social Blade. So the key here is when you're looking at your data, you wanna look for patterns. In post, what post received the most amount of engagement? So if you see something working, obviously replicate it. You know, you don't wanna replicate it immediately, but make note of it and use it for future content. So tip 14, use Instagram ads. So Instagram ads give you complete control over advertisements. So how they appear and who sees them. So with Instagram ads, you can run photos, you can run videos, carousels, slideshows, stories. So we mentioned this on other webinars for Facebook advertising. It's worth repeating. So if I go back into say Facebook ads manager, I can pick and choose my placements. And really what I wanna do is pick and choose, for example, Instagram. And so I have Instagram feed, I have Instagram stories. So, and I could see what the video requirement or the media requirement is for running on Instagram. So with Instagram, you can run stories, you can run videos, single image ads, you can run carousel. So really, you could put your best forward, meaning take the post that's performing well, and maybe you wanna advertise that, promote it. So you gonna run this through Facebook Ads Manager and it's gonna tell you you know what your audience size is your potential reach okay what your daily results would be so you're gonna get all that information when you run your ads on Facebook Ads Manager but it's a great opportunity for you to really push forward if you're running a promotion it's really an opportunity for you to push forward that promotion other advantages scalable pricing self-serve and instant robust reporting and highly refined audience retargeting Targeting. So all of that is in the Facebook Ads Manager. You can get all the reporting you, ne you need, meaning you know who saw the ad, did they click on it? Okay, you can refine that target audience. You can go back into Facebook Ads Manager and refine who your audience is. So lots of flexibility here on advertising on Instagram. But the key here is if you want to run advertising on Instagram, you know think about what it is you're trying to promote. If you feel something needs to get promoted, then go ahead and you know you can either Either, again reach out to somebody and have them sponsor it or you can run it as an advertisement so let's move on to tip 15 so we want to create visually attractive and eye-catching ads so if you are gonna run ads you know here's some things to keep in mind okay you want to use images that are natural and seem native okay you don't want to use any stock photography first off you want to use something that you've done okay you want to minimize the amount of text so let the image do the talking you want to ensure your caption relates to the image and resonates with your audience okay so you have an opportunity to add some text below the image okay so make sure it resonates and then of course use hashtags to show your ads to target your audience but a wider relevant audience so hashtags do play a role here as well so these are some tips if you're going to create ads you want to take these into account the whole point of the ad is to get people over to either web page or to your profile page Okay, so that they can engage and take action. So Instagram ads will help showcase your product, service, or brand in a way that's memorable and unique. So if you really want to get your vision, your brand, your product out there in front of a lot of people, then advertising on Instagram is a good way to do that. So since we've been talking about pizza throughout this webinar, this is a good Instagram a profile here about pizza. You know, I'm getting hungry just looking at this. Hopefully this is an example for all veg and non-veg pizza consumers. I mean, you can see this profile here. They got the website. You know, they got the handle. Okay, so they have a lot of followers. So, you know, if I'm in the pizza industry, I can go ahead and, you know, click on their followers and see who who's following them, who they're following. So, some really good shots of pizza here. It looks like, you know, a lot of people were, in, were involved in this. You could see lots of different examples here. Some cute ones, you know, some funny ones, some humorous ones. So, you know, just taking a look at something like pizza, which, you know, most people enjoy, you know, most. And you can kind of appreciate 
you know, how much of an advantage Instagram can be because it really, you can accentuate photos. You can have fun with it. You can really run some contests here. You know, give us your best pizza photo. So here, you know, you could say use daily pizza as a hashtag for feature, okay? So they're even encouraging you to use a specific hashtag. So you can really do a lot here on Instagram. This is just a good example of what you can do and have fun with, you know, with an example like pizza, just to give you some ideas. So let's move on to tip 16, take advantage of Instagram tools. So you can use scheduling tools like Later, Hootsuite and Buffer. So I can't stress this enough. You know, when it comes to measuring the engagement of your Instagram post, you're definitely gonna need a social media tool. So you're also gonna need it if you do a lot of you know, posting on Instagram. So let's take a look at an example. We'll use later.com. So if I go to later here, I could see, you know, I can use this to upload my images to my profile. So here you could see it's scheduled throughout the day of the week. So that way we're not overlapping. You know, we're scheduling based on the times of the day that people are going to look at this. So you know, here I could see, you know, particular stories, if any stories are posted. Okay, I can look at it from a weekly or monthly preview. I could see what's been posted, okay? And more importantly, as a schedule tool, I can also see the analytics. I could see, you know, how many were posted, how many followers. So this is really important because, you know, if my profile is growing, I wanna be able to see what post performed best, what the audience was like, you know, by gender, by age, by location. So again, I can look at it by post performance story or hashtag analytics as well. So later really goes into details about, you know, what's driving engagement. So here you can see some hashtags that this become a uh, particular company is using on Instagram. So here you can see how many posts with this hashtag, you know, and what and kind of engagement did they receive? Did they receive likes? comments, impressions, how much reach do they get, how many saves, and it really just does go into detail. So Later does a good job. I like this platform, especially for Instagram. It's great for scheduling, but more important, you know, in addition to the Instagram analytics, you can really lean on, you know, this particular platform to get a really good idea as to, you know, how particular posts are performing. Remember, if a post is performing, you want to reuse it at a certain point in time. Okay, learn from best practices, learn from what's working, learn from what's not working. If something's not working, then don't do it again. So you can really get a good breakdown in here and later.com. So remember these tools place an emphasis on automation, okay, enabling you to automatically post at a scheduled time. So you wanna lock it in at a certain period of time and not have to worry about it. So it allows you to really hone in on that particular time of the day and day of the week so that you're really maximizing your chances of getting good engagement. Okay, so develop your own signature style. So set up a style and content theme so that you're able to stand out amongst the various competitors. So, you know, again, just going back to our pizza example, lots of good photos of pizza. You know, but this this is their style. This is who they are. You know, they're not a particular brand. They're just, you know, people who like pizza. Okay. And they're having fun with it. Okay. So that's their style. You know, they're posting really good shots of all this different types of pizza, different styles, different toppings. And just to give you an idea of how popular pizza is and what you can do with it. Okay. So again, this is a, a good basic example um, of what you can do with something as simple as pizza. So don't be afraid to experiment, you know, try something different with your profile, you know, do something different. You don't always have to follow what everybody else is doing. That's the great thing about Instagram. It allows you to be free and creative. In fact, if anybody has any styles that have worked for them, you know, feel free to put something in the comment section. We'd love to hear your thoughts. So tip 18, use user engagement to your advantage. So I just mentioned that using the later example. So we want to be able to learn from what's working and not working. So user generated content shows off your brand to be authentic and improves your relationship with your followers. So, you know, you want to be unique with the content that you're posting. So if you do that, you're likely to build that relationship and you know increase your followers and you want to be able to see of that user generated content that UGC which is performing which is not performing okay so basically your followers and your audience are telling you what's working and not working so take advantage of that remember 
Going back to hashtags, you could set up your own unique hashtag and ask your users to post images or videos relating to that, which you can post in your brand's account. So just like the whole pizza thing, they're saying, hey, look, you know, use daily pizza for a feature. Okay, that's a good example of something you can do as well. So you could set up a unique hashtag and say, hey, use this hashtag and that'll help you gain some followers. That'll help you gain some notoriety and some visibility on your platform. Tip 19, use high quality images and videos. Just like on YouTube, just like on Facebook, Instagram's no different. Images must be of high quality, authentic and original. I mean, again, one more time, going back to the pizza. These images look to be pretty high quality. I mean, if you have a decent mobile phone, that's all it takes. A mobile phone with a camera, that is. That's all it usually takes. You know, you wanna be able to get that, that right shot. You don't wanna use anything that's of low quality because it really is gonna take away from, you know, the story you're trying to tell. So you don't have to be a professional per se. Just make sure what you're posting, whether it be video or whether it be an image, is of high quality. And remember, videos needs to be fun and informational without causing the user to lose interest. So, you know, if you're gonna create a video, you know, go ahead and, you know, you can make it short, make it fun, okay? You can see here, these guys are just showing you how pizza's made. It doesn't take a long time. They're just going through the motions. They're not boring you with details. They're not talking. It's really quick and easy. Just to give you an idea. It doesn't have to be as serious, it can be fun. So video content needs to be fun and informational without causing users to lose interest. That's the key. Short, sweet, unique, authentic, and fun. Have fun with it. So worth repeating, don't use stock images on Instagram because you know they don't really bode well for your particular brand. You know, it's Instagram. It allows you to post original content. That's the whole purpose of it. Okay, and on the video side, be concise, high quality, and informational enough. Okay, so you have to hold the user's attention here. So when we say concise, you know, don't make it a five minute video, obviously make it high quality, relevant to what you're trying to offer. And if you can do that, you're likely gonna hold the user's attention. So tip 20, promote your Instagram page and other social media channels. So Facebook and Instagram are part of the same family. So this seems like a natural, but you know, don't be afraid to promote it on other channels like Pinterest or, or YouTube. The whole idea is to get users to your Instagram page and encourage them to follow it. So, you know, you can always put that URL in, you know, other platforms like YouTube. Nothing wrong with that at all. Okay, you can also promote your page offline with print ads and during other relevant events. And then I would even take that a step further as you probably see, you know, an Instagram logo on a web page along with other social media icons. So you always want to help promote Instagram on your web page as well, but you can do it for offline with print ads. So you can simply just put, you know, whatever your your slug is for Instagram, whatever your ID is, whatever you're using on Instagram, that's what you can use. Don't be afraid to promote it offline or online. Social media marketing tools. Social media, always a great topic to talk about. So we're gonna finish up all our digital marketing tools with social media. We talked about SEO, paid, competition, Petition, affiliate, email, you know, web analytics. It's just appropriate to finish up with social media because social media has so many tools available. So many. Okay. The first one I can think about here is Hootsuite. Hootsuite is a great social media marketing tool to use. Okay, it's a freemium. Okay, you can set up a free trial here. You you basically a base account. And then uh, you can use Hootsuite to do a lot of things. Anything from setting up landing pages to actually publishing content to listening. Hootsuite, to me, is one of the most powerful social media marketing tools available. You got Buffer. Buffer is a paid version, but you can actually set up a low cost or free account actually on Buffer and then move to a paid account. Yeah, you got TweetDeck's been around a long time. That is actually free. And I would recommend TweetDeck. And we're going to take a look at that here in a couple minutes. Okay, and then you got Sprout Social. Sprout Social is another social marketing platform. Similar to Hootsuite. Do a lot of reporting, a lot of publishing. You can, a lot of listening. And so we're going to take a look at Sprout Social today as well. Before we do that, let's go over why these tools are important to us. From a social media perspective, 
you're pumping out a lot of content. So you need to be able to smartly, efficiently, you know, schedule and manage your post. Okay, so you're not just working likely with just one platform like Facebook, you're probably on a number of different platforms, depending on your business, depending on your bandwidth, depending on what you're selling, your products, etc. Your audience obviously has a lot to do with it. You know, it could be Instagram, Pinterest, you want to be able to consolidate all that and manage it in one place. And that's what social media marketing tools do. They allow you to manage everything in one place. So if you can manage everything in one place, then these social media marketing platforms need to be able to make it easy for you to add and manage different accounts. Okay, so a lot of them have the ability for you to add you know, not just one Twitter account, but multiple Twitter accounts and not just one social media platform, but multiple social media platforms and a good social media marketing tool worth its weight will help you monitor the results. So monitor social media posts that help drive leads and sales. In other words, you're going to have a lot of different metrics associated with each social media marketing platform. Okay. Which one is actually doing its job? Okay, so you want to be able to easily manage these platforms, applications, and websites very efficiently. Okay, so instead of having to log into each platform, you just log into one place, get a sense of what's been posted, what the engagement is, did they purchase, etc. And what you want to do is be able to individually customize every social media post across different platforms. So it just makes it a lot easier to do that in these social media marketing tools. Okay, you don't want to send out a blanket message across different platforms. You want to be able to go ahead and customize a post depending on what that post is, depending on what the product is, what time of day, what target market, what target audience. So customization is a lot easier using these social media marketing tools. You want to be able to engage with brand advocates. So listening is a good thing with social media marketing tools, using the listening functionality so you can actually see who is a brand advocate, who's not a brand advocate, who's an influencer, who's not an influencer. And then of course you want to analyze the behavior of your audience and optimize individual posts on real time data. So if, for example, you post something using one of these social media marketing platforms and you see it go viral, then you want to be able to react to that in real time. So you're going to be able to see that in real time on these social media marketing tools, these platforms like Sprout Social and Hootsuite. And then you're going to be able to react to that behavior. And then of course, monitoring website traffic and conversion rates, that's key. We always want to monitor conversions based on our KPIs, our business goals. So there are also a few important digital marketing tools that can help you in different ways. Okay, so without further ado, let's jump in and take a look at what's available in terms of social media marketing. So just a quick reminder, if you are running ads on Facebook or you're posting on Facebook as an example or any platform in general, that platform's going to have its own metrics, if you will. So for example, Facebook has something called Facebook Insights. So you'll be able to actually see, you know, what's been posted based on, you know, the last seven days in this example, how many page views you're getting, engagements, recent posts. So just to let you know, yes, you can go into any one of these platforms on its own and look at metrics. Just like you can do if you're running Facebook ads. Okay, you can go right into Facebook Ads Manager and view data there. Okay, so the whole point here though on using a social media tool is that you can measure all that in one place. So if we log into Sprout Social, I can set up these accounts right into Sprout Social. So I don't have to log in Twitter individually or Facebook individually. I can link them up all within Sprout Social. And then I can go to reports just like I can with Facebook Insights. And then once I'm in Facebook, excuse me, once I'm in Sprout Social reporting, then I can go ahead just like I can in Facebook Insights, except it's all right here for me. I can jump into, you know, Facebook and dig a little bit deeper as to what's going on with my account. So I don't have to log into Facebook directly. I can see, you know, the impressions, the engagement, the clicks over a period of time. I can see my audience growth. 
I can see my publishing behavior, how often am I publishing. I can see the top post individually. I can see impressions by day. You know, a lot of this same material, same information is already in Facebook Insights. So if it's available in Facebook Insights, you know, you're definitely going to have it available in a tool like Sprout Social. So you want to be able to just efficiently log in and jump from one platform to the other. So here, you know, I can go to Instagram, you know, and look at Instagram data, or I can look at Twitter information. So you want to be able to efficiently jump from one platform to the other using, in this example, Sprout Social. Now, as I mentioned, as part of one of the benefits of a social media tool is that you can publish content. You want to be able to publish content because you want to be able to organize and schedule accordingly. You don't want to be submitting and publishing content right after one another. Okay, you want to be able to spread it out efficiently and effectively. And so here, we could see, you know, we could publish and schedule content accordingly. So all we have to do is click compose, select a profile, write whatever we need to do. We could schedule it for tomorrow at a specific time. And there you go. Voila, scheduled. So this is on Twitter. Okay, so, you know, we could choose another platform here. It's just that easy to schedule. So you want to be able to schedule accordingly because, again, when you schedule something, then you want to be look at the behavior of it. So it's just as simple as going from publishing to reporting. And then based on when something got published, you could see the reaction of it and react to it. So another thing here that I like about it's about social Hootsuite. A lot of these other platforms do it really well. You got listening tools. So you can listen in on conversations that are being had. For example, uh, mail delivery. You know, if we do mail delivery on Twitter search, we'll be able to see what's been tweeted about mail deliveries. You know, if that's the business we're in, we can refine our search and choose a specific location, a radius to hone in if we're local. Okay, so this is Sprout Social's example of listening. Here, let's take a look at another example. I'm in later.com. So later, very similar to Sprout Social in that it does a lot of the same things. You can actually schedule content on a particular platform. And one thing I like about later here, you can actually see it visually. You can see a calendar and what's been scheduled. So I can see today I have scheduled something scheduled at 1.15 local time and again i have five profiles set up for this account so i can pick and choose the profile that i want to publish to so it just makes it that much easier and i can visually see it and that's important so here i can click on media library so the one thing about later.com is that you know you have a library of images that potentially you can reuse so if i click on this image here okay i can get a sense of when it was used and I can view it on a calendar, I can add a label for it. So that's another benefit to later is that they have this media library here. They have conversations. So I can actually connect to a platform and listen in on conversations that are being had, similar to the listening tool in Sprout Social. And they have analytics, so you can actually see right in later.com how your particular social media platform is performing. So I can see it here over seven days. I can see the number of followers have increased. I can see the growth rate. I can see the number of impressions that I've received. Okay, so I want to be able to see how my particular platform's performing over a period of time. So I can look at reach, the lot, profile views, website clicks. Okay, so I can get a lot of good insights here right in the analytics platform of later. You can look at specific post performance. So if we posted something, I could see basically how many likes it received, how many comments, impressions, the reach. And then if I wanted to, I can click on details and get more specific information on it. Engagement rate, okay, discovery, actions, comments, saves, etc. So later.com goes into some nice detail about post performance. They even have data on hashtags. So if you use a hashtag, you can actually see how many times the hashtag's been used or saved, how many impressions it's received. Okay, so they really go into some nice detail here about how your post and how your accounts are performing. And here's a tool I really like, I've been using for a long time, and that's TweetDeck. So what TweetDeck does is connect with your Twitter account. 
So you can see in a different visual, so to speak, of how your Twitter account looks in terms of your feed. Here I can see this is my feed here. Okay, I can see some notifications. I can see specific messages. Then on this column, I can see activity. Okay, so I can add different columns here if I wanted to. And basically by adding columns, you can see I can look for what's trending as an example. So I'm gonna add in a column that says trending. And so now I can go in and see, okay, these are all the different things that are trending on Twitter. Uh, so you can actually add a column and pay attention to something really specific. Okay, so for example, search. Okay, so right now I have men's health, but I could type in, let's just say World Cup. Okay, so I could see that you got the cricket World Cup, you got, you know, the soccer, football World Cup going on. So, you know, we could pick a, a particular topic to follow if we wanted to. So again, here I'm following men's health. So I can now see, you know, everything that's been posted on men's health. Now, if I click on, for example, one of these hashtags here that's trending, I can actually see who's tagging or using that hashtag Friday feeling in their tweets. And so the whole idea behind, you know, TweetDeck, it, it serves up a interesting overview, so to speak, of not only your account, but, you know, a specific topic or what's trending or, you know, other things that are being said. So if you really want to pay attention to your brand or something really specific like, you know, your competitors or a specific product, then you can just do a search on that. And so that's the great thing about TweetDeck. It allows you to kind of just look and listen in on everything going on in Twitter. Thanks, Rob. With that, we've come to the end of this complete social media marketing tutorial. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Do like and share it. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for more from Simply Learn.